Hello. And yes, the candle is back today. Hell yeah. Although, I was contemplating whether or not I wanted to trim the wick or not, and I probably should have, because it's, uh, it doesn't seem to be happy. Hmm. I feel like it might burn off. I don't know if I'm going to have to trim this or not. It provides a small amount of atmosphere. Ah, oh. hello, governor. How are you doing, Ro Robobuto? <laughs> Men don't trim wicks. Uh, so it's a wooden wick, so I kind of was hoping that it would just burn off if it's not exposed to the wax. But honestly, I'm okay with like the weird embery style flame that it has. So I think it actually kind of works. Good day, chat. Yeah, how are you doing? Matt, 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 is it Matt or Matt Fisher? <laughs> Thank you so much. Hello there, crazy fuzzer. Hell yeah. Uh, what's up? Not too much. We're just getting this kicked off. We've got a, a long stream ahead of us today, hopefully, because there is no, there's nothing I have to do today. Um, I got all of the work I wanted to get done earlier. I got up plenty early. I don't have raid tonight, so hopefully we're going to be in a good situation. Welcome to the monitor stream where we look at monitors. Yeah, that's pretty accurate. Wait, what? Why didn't I get a notification? I have no idea. I don't think there's anything I have to do on my end. I do everything the same every time. So if there is something, maybe I need to do it. Legit just said to myself, damn, I wish Gamoza were streaming right now. Well, wish come true. That's why we got the candle here, because we got a nice date night with Chad again. Um, I really need some wine. The wood sap heats up and makes them flicker. Ooh. I do love these candles. I think uh, that might be a common thing on this stream. Maybe, uh, maybe I'll rotate candles out each stream and have different scents. Um, holy shit! Starting off the stream with ten gifted subs from El Tuerto. El Tuer. God damn it! Why are names so hard? El El Tuertog. Thank you so much for the gifted subs. Hell yeah! I'm glad you enjoy the content. I'm really curious to see how these streams go uh, on weekdays. I don't know what days I streamed last week, but I think it was Saturday, Sunday, maybe a, a Thursday. But I've somehow been getting like 200, 300 people showing up to these streams, which for me is rare. Like, I will maybe pull in 100 or 110 people and I'll spend bike to 200 if maybe I get a, a big raid or something like that but I've been like organically finding my way to like 220 250 averages now with 300 spikes it's crazy thank you so much enjoy the screen warmth absolutely thank you so much for that and we got a bunch of good names in that uh in that random sub bucket so I'm really happy to see some of those people getting subs that's one thing I absolutely love about um, kind of how small this community is. When I see gifted subs like that go out to random people, a lot of times they're hitting a, a bunch of common chatters in, in here and, and people who show up to the streams regularly. So it's super cool to see that. Although I think, Twitch, I think it's not 100% random. I think Twitch does weight them to uh, viewers who are frequently here in chatters. So not 100% sure, but I wouldn't be surprised. I should come on stream sometime. Hell yeah. Well, you got 95 now? Yeah, it's crazy. I've been streaming for 12 minutes and already 100 people are here. But yes, you should come on stream sometime. I'm going to have to plan around that. Today's going to be a big dev day. Um, I just found this channel and already stoked. Hell yeah. I see you uh, posting the Doritos in chat. Who is that? Oh, that is, that's a, a global emote in... in uh, in Twitch. You know what? I don't think I have better Twitch TV. I feel like every time I go to check if I have BT TV, I don't have it, but I think I never got it back since I switched to Gentoo. Um, I'm going to switch to that quickly. I'm going to add better Twitch TV. 
and then I'm gonna need some better Twitch TV uh, emotes here in a second, uh, just to just to check that it's working. Add the Firefox. Add. Got it. And then I'm gonna F5 and lose lose all of chat. And here we go. All right. Now I should have better Twitch TV. I think I was wondering um, why I didn't have some uh, like buttons for like adminning stuff. Um, and hopefully, hopefully that works. I don't know if that actually took effect. Hmm. Hmm. It's installed. I don't know. Do we have any uh, better Twitch TV emotes in chat? Uh, we do have uh, some custom emotes in here. Nice. Okay, Monk has showed up. Perfect. Means everything's working. You only have Monkas? Is that the only thing I have enabled? Do I have to enable like a, a bunch of them? Those screens attract viewers like flies. Yeah. Okay, easy clap. Nice. That's working for me. All right. Okay. And then I think better Twitch TV had some like nice chat, like things next to chat so I could quickly ban all of the naughties in chat, but those aren't showing up. So I don't know how I had those enabled before. But anyways, um, yeah, how's everything looking today? Everything should be synced. I actually got a, a better tool for syncing things. So hopefully things synced out better. Honestly, I don't know why OBS doesn't have an auto syncing feature. Like imagine you could have something where you point your camera at a screen and you basically direct it to the audio source that you want to sync to. So you would say like drop down and select the microphone. And then you would just play something and it would audibly make a chirp and then flash the screen for one frame and then have OBS automatically figure out all of the delays based on when that flash hit registered on the camera and when the audible beep came through. Like, I feel like that would be so trivial to automatically synchronize everything to like a millisecond and even like a pre-broadcasting uh, thing. So I don't know why they wouldn't have that, but like... It just seems like such a good like feature to have. They have all of the delays. You can add delays to video. You can add delays to audio. So the mechanisms are there. They're all millisecond based. But you have to manually do the syncing, which is weird to me because it's so easy to sync all those things up. Um, especially like the, the, the tool that I use is just like a downloaded video that basically shows a different dot for each frame and then in the center frame or at the zero sync frame it plays like a one kilohertz audio wave for that frame um and it's so easy to sync with that but i still have to do it manually which is which is silly um i mean imagine seeing a, a stream thumbnail with eight monitors and it and not clicking on it exactly see we're here for the clickbait <laughs> Um, pull request welcome, Cafe HD. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I don't actually know, um, I mean, I guess OBS by default should have all of the things needed to make that work. Um, I don't know if you'd have to pull in another library dependency. I think all of the dependencies that OBS already has, you can build those primitives out of. Ultimately, you need something to detect a flicker on a screen. And if you use like a very specific like uh, flash or color or like QR code, like if you had a different QR code display on each frame, so every frame was a different QR code, then you could have the camera pick up on the QR codes, and then you could uh, sync that to an audible beep that's like maybe a different frequency for each frame or only plays every 60 frames or whatever. Like there, there's so many things that you can do really lossy, uh, like video quality and still get good synchronization. So um, I think that would be such a cool thing to have in mainline OBS, not as a plugin, but something built in. Um, a lot of people would really like that, I think. Um, awesome streaming. Uh, what do you think about CTFs in general? Um, I think they're great for learning. I do think at the high level, like super competitive play, like trying to be in the top 10, top 20 and make it to like DEF CON finals, uh, requires a specialization in CTFs that is not necessarily generally applicable skills. You, 
start having to use tools that are designed explicitly for CTFs, like rapid things where you know the bugs are shallow, you know the style of things, you have like libraries of all sorts of libcs such that you can use ROP gadgets from a plethora of, of libcs. There's a bunch of tricks that you kind of do in CTFs that um, basically the, the problems are similar enough that you can kind of build up this treasure chest of... Uh, previous tools and tricks that aren't the most applicable for real life bug finding. But if you're not getting hyper competitive and you're just doing CTF problems, I think it's a great way to learn. So um, I'm a big fan of CTFs. That being said, I don't have that much time or more specifically, um, I have like targets, like real targets that can make me money or could be put on my resume um, that I would rather use my CTF time that I would allot towards those problems. So, personally, I don't really do them anymore, but I think they're great for learning. Um, hey, my noob, what are all the monitors for? Uh, all the monitors over here are for my offline workstation. So, I have a six monitor computer and I have a three monitor computer. This is my gaming computer that I stream off of, and then that is my offline workstation where I do my research. Um, and I basically have them all for code. So I'll typically have a bunch of documentation open, but also a bunch of code open. So the more monitors, the more screen real estate I can have, the more code I can have open at one given time. And it's pretty frequent that I have multiple things I'm referencing and it makes it really convenient to have all of them open at the same time. Uh, what does Gentoo have over other distributions? Um, basically, for Gentoo, you build everything from source. And when you build everything from source, that means you can modify flags, you can try to make things go faster or slower. But for me personally, um, I use that feature because it, it allows everything to be built with source and have debug symbols installed because I explicitly tell it to not strip the packages. And that means that I have source line debugging for every single thing on my system with the exception of a couple like closed source tools that I use. Um, and that means that if I were to uh, fire up like GDB right now, right? If I were to make a um, uh, stream term, if I were to fire up uh, GDB on Python, right? And I'm going to run, get into this Python state. I'm going to control C. And we can see the entire call stack in here. Python, libc, doesn't matter. Everything in here has source line info. And then I can go and look at these uh, sources if I really want to. I can, um, in this other terminal, or we'll pop open another one. And now you can't see that one. Um, whoops. Um, I can go and open any of these files in uh, user, I guess I don't actually know 100% where those are relative, but uh, step. Um, anyways, I do have the source information there. It's all in user uh, source and all of the source for all of the things on my system are in here, uh, which as a hacker who often comes across bugs and wants to figure out why those bugs happened, uh, it's really nice to not have to go and rebuild things explicitly to add debugging or find some weird packages wet, which have the debug information, which can be spotty. Um, that's the main reason I run Gentoo. That's it. I don't really care. I'm not trying to fun roll loops or go fast. Um, I just like it because I get that debug info. Um, that's it. Okay. Um, is the hundred percent offline PC for exploits? Yeah. Yeah. So basically it's offline because there are a lot of things I do on there that are sensitive that I don't want to potentially leak to the internet. Um, and a lot of things, uh, end up leaking things out, right? Uh, you have telemetry that's going to report out crashes, crash dumpers that are going to report crashes in different ways. Windows does it, Chrome does it, Firefox does it, everything does it. Everything reports telemetry and information about crashes. And if your goal is to find crashes, um, and be able to report them to get bug bounties or sell the exploits or just out of curiosity, find bugs, uh, you typically don't want those things getting reported and fixed 
prior to you being able to sell them or use them or get a bug bounty credit for them. So um, also being offline just means I have full control. I have root domain. I can register google.com. I can use that. I can basically set up a really nice infrastructure. It means that I have 10 gigabit networking to my um, Gentoo uh, repository and my Wikipedia server. So everything that I do on the internet uh, has like 100 microsecond latency and everything's seamless and everything's on solid states. It's just such a nice experience to have that much control over a network. It's, it's really, really nice. That sounds pretty nice, actually. If shit's broken, you could just fix it. Yeah. Um, Gentoo has gone through a lot of the struggles of fixing broken build systems that don't correctly, um, you know, use a system CC flag and they will, uh, like, hard code things. And since Gentoo has gone through that process of making those patches, it makes it really easy for me to rebuild code with some modification if I really need to. Um, and I should set up keybinds for OBS. I'm going to try that. Hopefully this doesn't break anything. Um, I think everything still should be working. And, okay, let's see, scene, switch to scene. Um, let's see, numpad one, okay. Um, and then let's say numpad two, or I guess I typo that. Uh, let's see if this works, it should work. One, two. <laughs> Look at that. Now, now I'm a professional streamer. Woo! <laughs> I'm going to pop out chat so I can move it to the other window and monitor things in a more live way. Um, and that should uh, hopefully uh, give the best, the best possible experience here. But look at that. Whoop. Whoop. <laughs> Hacking. <laughs> All right. What broadcast software are you using? I'm just using OBS here. I have no complaints with it. It works fantastic. Oh yeah, and then uh, I put my pop filter back on my microphone. Um, I took it off because I didn't seem to notice a large difference. Obviously the microphone has a built-in little mesh pop filtery sort of thing. Um, but after reviewing yesterday's YouTube video, I noticed that when I would say like plethora of platypi, um, I would often uh, have pretty bad pops. So I tried this out, looked in Audacity, tried out just saying P a bunch of times, um, and I found that it did make a pretty significant difference. So hopefully uh, that is a quality improvement to the microphone. So yeah. Using a simple numpad instead of an over expensive stream deck. I would get a stream deck if it had good Linux integ integration, but it does not. Um, I know some people have some third-party integrations for Stream Deck. They're not great yet. I'm sure they will eventually get there, um, but I just didn't really, really want to mess around with that yet. Do you do private training sessions for companies? I do not. I just hang out and chill here. Um, since you're getting paid for it through subs, you're technically also a professional date night candle burner. Aww. Yeah, as it gets later, you'll be able to see the candle better. But we do have our romantic stream candle today. Today is, today's scent is coconut saffron. Honestly, pretty minor scent. Um, I would say compared to my standard uh, woodwick wood smoke flavor, uh, this is a slightly lower potency. Um, it gives a like sweet aroma, definitely some some good hints of sweetness in there. But I kind of like that pungent wood smoke, so not not the not the best candle. Um, we'll uh, we'll probably figure out some other candles here soon. I wonder if I just don't have good airflow in that area. It seemed to be brighter uh, when I was holding it. Um. <laughs> When you're building a program on Gentoo from sources, does it indicate in any way that you've made a modification? Um, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I haven't really paid attention. Like, if you were to modify it, um, I don't think so, but you would have to kind of go out of your way to do that. You have to basically, uh, do like a two-stage build where you run it up to the point where it starts building, like run it to where it extracts and um, applies patches and then make your modifications and then build it. So you kind of have to do it explicitly. Um, 
And I don't know if that persists. Like if you reinstall it, I think you would have to go through that process again or make a more official patch. There are things that will automatically apply patches that you specify to packages, um, but it's a pretty manual process where basically you run it in two stages. So, candle review, hell yeah. Mike does sound better now that you mention it. Yeah, I also have, oop, yeah. There we go. Um, I do also have, uh, I turned down the gain a little bit more. That is going to give us a little bit more of a dynamic range. So that means when I get super excited, I hopefully won't clip, but it will also be a lot louder than it typically is. So there's gonna be more of a range, um, but hopefully the audio levels are fine. They're still like relatively high, so you're not having to crank your audio. Like if you were to listen to YouTube on the side or you have music playing, uh, you likely uh, will find that my audio levels are just slightly under uh, like a fully processed video. So, hell yeah. Change category to candle review. Pineapple Kush. <laughs> um, when emerging it as a print, uh, that it uses uh, when it patches the package. Okay, yeah, cool, that does make sense. Uh, like George Hot said, uh, it's nice to have an, arson an arsenal of metaphorical rifles in your closet. That's your secret PC, exactly. It's, it's got all my fancy bugs on it. Um, uh, why not some BSD where you can also build from source? Because you literally nothing fucking works on like FreeBSD on a desktop. Your NVIDIA drivers are like really spotty. Most applications that are pre-built uh, don't work well on it. Basically, if it's not fully open source, you're going to have a rough time. And I use things like Microsoft Teams, which doesn't have a FreeBSD port. Um, I use, uh, I just got... Uh, Lightworks or something like that for video editing, which has a Linux port and a Mac port and a Windows port, but not a FreeBSD port. So I ran FreeBSD for about five years. I was a large uh, part of the FreeBSD community. Uh, it's all I ran for my desktop for a long time, but in that day and age, nothing supported Linux either. So effectively, Linux and FreeBSD were pretty comparable. But in this day and age, there are a large amount of closed source things that do work on Linux, and a lot of those things don't work on FreeBSD. Now, FreeBSD does have good Linux emulation modes, but sometimes it's just not good enough, especially for binary packages that expect really exotic uh, uh, environment setups, AKA, pretty much hard-coded Debian and uh, Ubuntu pads, maybe like a Fedora. So, yeah. Aha, so if you were to fix a bug in Python, you'd have to build Python separately. Um, and when you want to use that on your system, you have to specifically patch in Portage and Emerge somehow. So you can, you can make a patch file that you specify, or you can extract and apply patches and then make the modification and then continue the final part of the build process. Um, so, something like that. And there's there's probably multiple ways that you can do that. Blender for video editing. I've tried, uh, like, a couple of the open source things. I've tried Caden Live. Um, they have... It's just... I don't know why, but they're, they're missing, like, massive features. So, like, basically, just being able to view, like, audio along with the video in a good way and being able to like zoom in on certain like just basic ui things is pretty lacking on those um obviously for just moving clips around it's fine and doing basic edits it's fine but like i like to be able to zoom into like the frame and like i use that for my audio video sync where i basically zoom in all the way and that's why explicitly i got this video editor today um such that i could zoom in and each frame is delineated and you can switch between each of the frames by clicking on them pretty easily um and then i can look at the audio and see where that lines up and i can do measurements and um some of the tools that I tried that are open source, like, don't even let you zoom in that far. Where, like, you can't really see frame by frame. You, like, lose a lot of that information. And the waveforms that they displayed was kind of muddy quality. I'm sure I could go and modify the code, or maybe there is some deep setting. But those are things that I expect out of an editor by default. Um, so, yeah. I don't know. 
I'm a Java, a Java, Java. <laughs> I'm a Java developer and only uh, understand only 17% of what you're doing. That's very specific. Uh, but I like how cool it looks, like black magic. Absolutely, I love that aspect about it. Uh, video editing in DaVinci Resolve is super nice and free, but not open source software either. So I tried DaVinci today, um, and DaVinci, um, first of all, expected an old version of uh, libfuse that didn't work, so then I had to like manually extract it, and then once I ran it, I wasn't able to import files. Um, it just silently failed. I tried to import a file and it just wouldn't show up, and maybe I just did something really stupid, and I completely missed something, and I needed to like set something up before I could import a file, but I'd like get the file prompt where it would have me select files, and I'd hit open, and it would just do nothing. It would there would be no console log, no error log, no pop-up dialog, and the file wouldn't show up. What I expect is that there's probably some shared object that's missing, um, and it can't load some shared object that it uses to import, maybe like a specific version of uh, a, an image or video library, um, but it silently failed. Um, and I tried out uh, whatever I got today, a Lighthouse or what, whatever, whatever I actually settled with. Um, it was an RPM package, and on Gen 2, I was able to just RPM dash I to install it. It showed up in my path. Um, all the libraries went to their correct, correct locations, and when I actually went to run it, everything worked. Um, the only thing that didn't work was the automatic licensing, but they have an offline licensing licensing system where you just like upload a file and then uh, re-download a new like licensed version of that thing. It just worked, and um, that. That's what I'm going to settle for. Both of the tools are immensely more powerful than what I personally will ever be able to run into as a user. There's no way that I will bottle, like both of them will by far provide every feature that I would ever use in a video editor. Like there's no way that I would get into the nitty gritty details where I would really be able to tell a difference between the two. Um, they both have great Windows, Linux, Mac OS, Mac OS support, and the licensing works between all of them, which is important to me as a, someone who switches between Linux and Windows every once in a while. Um, so uh, it's just, I was just going to pick the one that worked best. Obviously, they probably all work out of the box on, Deb, uh, on Debian and Ubuntu and Fedora um, and Red Hat, uh, but on Gentoo, there were some issues with uh, using, whatchamacallit. Um, and they all work with uh, my graphics card. Both of them were able to detect my graphics card and everything was fine there. Uh, they can use my graphics card for rendering. They have all the libraries. Like everything seemed to work in those environments. So I don't, I'm just going to pick the one that worked out of the box. <laughs> DaVinci Resolve seems really good, uh, but I've read that in Linux the support is not that great. Okay, yeah. Isn't Lightworks expensive? It's like 25 bucks a month, uh, like 200 bucks a year, or $400 for just the indefinite license, although you don't get updates with the indefinite license. Um, that is well below the noise floor for a software budget for me. Uh, $400 for something that will just permanently work and be licensed to do video editing for me is... I'm pretty happy with that. Uh, the fact that I don't need to have a subscription model is really nice. Um, it also means I can kind of latch onto a specific version uh, that I know uh, has worked for me in the past. Um, so yeah, they're all pretty, like, video editing software is surprisingly cheap. I would expect it to be in the, like, $10,000 range for the professional quality stuff. Um, but I also recognize that they wouldn't be able to make really good video editing software if it were only in the, like, film industry price point. So they probably benefit a lot from having the, like, YouTuber-style people doing stuff. But yeah, I bought one month of Lightworks. Um, mainly because the, the trial like was missing so much stuff that I will just pay the $25 for this month and that will be the trial. Um, 
And if I don't like it, and I'll maybe try and get DaVinci up and running again, but I'm maybe gonna use it to edit some YouTube videos, make sure that it can export uh, YouTube well. Like, I like when things have nice presets where I don't have to go and figure out the bit rates and the encodings that work best with YouTube, and they just have presets that are just like, this is the best quality that YouTube will accept, and this is the best format that will prevent it from getting re-encoded a billion ways and, and losing information. So, yeah. Um... I just tried, and it seems like Blender does allow you to uh, do frame stepping and zooming. I just tried it, not urging you to switch. I understand that having a, a working tool set uh, you're used to is important. Yeah, I mean, I'm not used to any tool at this point, so I don't really care. I can try Blender. Um, I've tried Caden Live. I've, I've tried uh, this other editor, um, and both of them were kind of meh. Maybe I'll try Blender. Um, as long as it has really good... Uh, support for GPU so I can do GPU encode as long as I can do frame by frames and it doesn't have to like re go back to a keyframe and take forever to actually display the frame. I need it so that I can seamlessly go back and forth between frames. I want the video to have a good waveform where I can like zoom in and see every like squiggle of the waveform um, such that I can zoom in indefinitely and be able to do measurements and stuff. But Blender would probably be fine for what I do. I'm going to try out a couple things. I don't, I don't really care yet. GPU encoding? Nope. Ah, oh, damn. Yeah. Um, when I watch content created by Kaden Live, I feel like it's a meme. Yes! Like, I don't know how to describe that either. I went and I basically tried to look for, like, professional examples of the use of these tools. Like, not tutorials, but, like, a polished example of an expert using these tools. Dude, they all- they always look like your local public library's videos, right? The, the shitty tracking, the shitty overlays, the shitty transitions. And I don't know how much that is the tool versus the uh, effort that's put in by a user. Um, but the fact that I couldn't find a good example of a well-made video with these tools is concerning to me. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Anyone using Vegas Pro? I used that back when I was a kid. So, uh, I just installed VirtualBox for the first time in Kali. I'm looking forward to learn more here. I'm brand new. We don't do really anything that would warrant having Kali, um, but we do do hacking stuff here. Am I cute yet? Of course you're cute. Um, what kind of content are you going to put up on your YouTube? I mean, I'm not. I'm mainly using it just for AV synchronization, such that I can, like, zoom in and make sure all of the audio tracks and the video tracks are all synchronized. Um, and maybe I'll do some editing in the future. Uh, if I get a nice camera, I will have to justify the expense by making some nice, like, 4K 60 uh, videos. Maybe I'll do, like, vlogs where I literally go on a hike and point the camera to me. Uh, at me and do like rants and shit and then clip out dead space um, that could kind of be fun um, but I don't know how much of an audience there is for that um, for content creation the Mac is pretty sweet only uh, only that almost everything is proprietary I'm fine with that I don't give a shit about open source like open source the only nice thing about open source for software that I use is that when it crashes, I can get a backtrace and maybe fix it and maybe make a good bug report. But it turns out being able to get a good stack trace to make a good bug report and like submit that or even do a pull request often takes longer time than just contacting support of a thing you actually pay for. Like Ida, uh, the disassembler, when I find a crash or I come across a PDB or a file that doesn't load correctly, I will have a patch the next day. Like, I will give them a pretty vague thing of just, like, here is the file I'm trying to open, here's the version of Ida, here is the command that I'm running or the thing that I'm trying to do, and as long as it repros, which, if I'm writing a bug report, it will because I'm picky about that, it will be fixed and I'll have a patch the next day. You don't get that with open source software. Like, I don't even care whether or not I can fix the bug myself. I can often get a bug professionally fixed and, like, introduced into the official build with closed source software faster than I can with open source software. So, I don't give a shit. Open source is nice for debugging when I'm doing hacking things, but when I'm actually using software, I greatly prefer things that I pay for support. Um...
I was lucky enough to have the same in R2 next day patch. I mean, the downside with R2 is you just need to patch it every hour because every new command you run crashes. Um, <laughs> in an ideal world, you'd be able to pay for support on open software. Yeah, that would be nice. Um, that's not a vague description, though. I think it is. It, I don't have to, like, go and reverse anything out or get a call stack or, d like, talk through a potential patch or submit a patch or do a PR or test it. Like, being able to say, I tried to open this file and then I clicked these four buttons and it crashes, wah, and then I get a patch out of that? That's pretty fucking nice. Um... You have uh, your own li IDA license or from Microsoft? I have my own IDA license. Microsoft does have them, but they're like stupid um, floating licenses where they're kind of a pain in the ass to use. I just pay for my own. It's it's worth it for the extra support. Although mine's like currently expired. Basically, I rebuy IDA when I need a new version or I need a bug fixed. Um, but if I am not using it frequently enough or I'm not running into issues, I just let it lapse and I don't care. Um... Isn't that basically the open source but paid distributions model? Yeah, like the Red Hat model. Um, I think that's a pretty good model, to be honest. I, I like that. Um, I totally am down to pay for, for stuff like that. Hell yeah. Ever use Binary Ninja? Yeah, I've got Binary Ninja that I use locally. In fact, uh, I think the Binary Ninja graph view is better than Ida's. It just is a little smoother. Um, obviously, if we're talking about graph view, Ghidra is basically non-existent. It has a graph view, but it's so fucking bad that it's not even worth using. Um, Ida's graph view is very good, and then Binge's graph view is even better. It just has a, like, it can refresh at 144 hertz, which is this monitor, which is really nice. Um, Binja has better licensing for Windows, Linux, and OS X, so it floats better. It's a little bit cheaper than Ida. It's actually a lot cheaper than Ida. Um, so, and it opens files and processes them, processes them a lot faster. So I typically use Binja when I want to do like code coverage colorization, because if I'm doing code coverage, all I want to do is pop open a binary and color it and then, you know, kind of flip through the graph view. I'm not actually trying to reverse things. I'm not trying to name variables. I'm not trying to get pseudocode. I'm not trying to get C style output or ILs. I don't give a shit about any of that. I just want to view what code has been hit. And Binja has much faster opening times, um, much better graph view in my opinion, although sometimes its instruction support is not as good. Um, but like for analysis of Vi for visualizing information about a program, I found Binja to be better, and Binja, actually that, I also have expired. Um, sorry, Jordan. Um, basically, um, I kind of just like, honestly, I don't have much of a use for Ida anymore. Like, Binja, I use for basically analysis and graph view, and I can write a plugin for a processor if I need to support some weird architecture. And I think Ghidra is a better reverse engineering platform than Ida. I think Ida has fewer quirks and mistakes and works better out of the box. But if I'm reverse engineering something, if I'm about to invest months or years of time to thoroughly reverse something, I don't care if there are quirks. I don't care if the calling convention is sometimes wrong and arguments aren't missing because I am going to go through and manually fill all those things in and make structures and, and make those fields. Um, and Ghidra is getting support right now. So it's getting, it just had a release two days ago. So like it's only getting better with time. Um, Ida's in this weird state uh, kind of limbo where it has kind of better dis uh, decompilation in some scenarios, but Ghidra is typically, uh, gives you a lot more control. Like Ghidra, you can, you can make a calling convention where you pass an argument in a control register or a flag, and you can make a lot of arbitrary things that work really well if you're working especially with low-level code like BIOSes. Um, so I would say Ida is typically a faster workflow than Ghidra, but... Um, Ghidra kind of is better for, I would say, long-term serious reverse en engineering projects. When you are going to have, um, a lot of things renamed and you're going to manually go through and 
fix up a lot of things. And when you want to be able to diff and upgrade uh, between firmware uh, revisions, like if you're reversing a firmware and there's a new revision that comes out, being able to diff and apply those things across that delta is so nice. Um, yeah. Didn't Gidra 9.2 introduce a new graph system? Did it? I don't know. No, they added their first revisions of debuggers. Oh, interesting. I don't give a shit about debuggers in a in a reverse engineering platform. Um, I'm always going to use the native debuggers. GDB and Winbag just work better than anything that integrates into like existing systems. So I don't care too much about that. Um, the integration of those typically is a lot spottier than the tools themselves. Um, in theory, you can just get a KD shell and have that displaying, and that that works out okay. But um, huh, I thought I read something about it. I don't know. If that's the case, that would be amazing. I would love to have a proper graph view. If, if Ghidra gets a proper graph view, I kind of don't need anything else. Uh, it has, Ghidra doesn't have the best symbol support. Um, they just added a PDB parser that is, um, OS agnostic. So that's going to work better on Linux when you're doing reverse engineering of Windows on Linux. Um, but things are still pretty spotty with those. I, like, everything sucks at PDBs, but Ida does by far have the best dwarf and PDB support. Um, so we'll see those things kind of get improved over time. Graphing. A new graph service and implementation was created. The graph service provides basic graphing capabilities. So is that... Mm, this looks like the same old shit. Um, although, it maybe looks a bit better, although I don't know if that's what they're referring to. Um, unless they're talking about like API style graph. Let me see. Let me actually read it. Um, that graph looks the same as, as kind of what I'm familiar with before. Um, the graph service provides basic graphing capabilities. New graph service. Is that just an API? In addition to expert graph service that supports various formats, okay. And this is GP211. Oh, that's the internal code. Yeah, I don't know. I I think what it probably means is they added APIs that allows you to um, see more about graphs, maybe. Um, let's see here, graphing function. Yeah, like some of those animations are really annoying. Although this looks like relatively responsive. It's clearly uh, 60 frames a second and not 144. Um, you can just feel the jitteriness. Um, but I don't know if they fixed it. Ghidra dark theme. Every time someone has a dark theme, they always fucking suck. Like, I, I'm so every time there's like a second, a third party dark theme, they always suck. They always like some window is still in white. Like, this would be in white for some reason, but this is in black, and this is in black, and then these are still in white. Like, I don't even fucking bother anymore with trying to find dark view things. They just never fucking work. <laughs> They're always awful. Um, okay. See you around, Dev Angels. Thank you for stopping by. Check you on the flip side. I can see the dreariness on the 60 FPS. Yeah. 
Um, I don't know. I mean, maybe the dark theme works, but I mean, it looks good. I'm just really skeptical. Like, you always come across some color or something that just doesn't look right, and it stands out so bad uh, that it just is not is not the thing. So, um, all right. So we're going to get into it. I'm going to uh, grab a Pop-Tart, and I'll be right back, and then we'll start doing stuff. Love that view, hell yeah, I do too. Fantastic. Okay, so what we're gonna do today is basically continue where we were yesterday. Um, the goal of this stream is that we are going to uh, finish getting a, co a coherent snapshot of all physical memory. Um, now that we're using that virtual uh, memory and adding a page table entry to swap between um, the physical memory that, that is mapped in, um, hopefully, hopefully, uh, cross our fingers, uh, we'll be able to basically snapshot all of physical memory, basically everything that's mentioned as system RAM in IOMEM, including stuff that is beyond the uh, linear map that is typically mapped into the kernel. Um, we're going to polish up our code, make sure it's well commented and documented. Uh, probably going to split th some things into libraries, uh, such as our like page table walking stuff, so we can use it both in our exploit on the device and natively on the host. So we're gonna go through and kind of fix up a couple things like that. Um, but mainly we're gonna do that polish to uh, start off, make sure that we're dumping everything. And then from that point, uh, we'll hopefully just be loading it into QMU uh, to resume execution in an emulator. Um, so that's kind of what I have scheduled. Uh, I'll chat with chat for a little bit while I eat these delicious Pop-Tarts. Um, and uh, yeah. And we'll be starting probably in like five minutes whenever I finish these Pop-Tarts. So if chat wants to have ask any questions or talk about anything, uh, we can talk about that now. What is, what is the monitor you're working on? It's like a 26 or 27 inch uh, 1080p uh, 1440 hertz monitor. Where are you currently living? I'm living in Seattle. The view is nice, but do you ever get creeped out at night? No. Bro, he has bears? We do have bears here. I've had bears, like, right next to my deck, like, standing up. What brand? Uh, Acer. What do we do about hardware initialization? Do you not need to do that in an emulator? We're not going to emulate hardware at all. So, basically, if hardware is accessed... Um, if hardware is accessed, that's the end of emulation. So, luckily, hardware is rarely accessed. It, it's very rare that hardware is actually touched. Um, so, I'm expecting that we probably won't have many problems there. Are those the 250-ohm DT990s? Uh, yes, they are. 
Did you try to look bigger in front of the bear? No, I just watched it from inside the safety and comfort of my own home. I stared it down. I'm like, yeah, I'm inside this safe box. God warrior, uh, or God wor warrior, warrior, <laughs> one, thank you so much for the tier one sub. Hell yeah, I'm glad you're enjoying the content. Or donating to content that you hate. Either way, glad you're here. Um, eating stream, hell yeah. Thoughts on pony nominations? I honestly think the ponies this year, not sure what they're going to do, but last year, the person that they uh, awarded most innovative research to, super cute. Super fucking cute. Big fan of that. <laughs> um, it's hard to predict the, the nominations. Man, I wish that Crockpots uh, could make food... Oh, uh, shit. Um, I wish that Crockpots could make food like, uh, food that looked a bit more appetizing. Oh, yeah. Everything just looks like a, a mushy, shitty stew. But often they taste delicious. Um. But it does make some nice soft stews, for sure. Could it be that the colonel may have swapped out some memory and will try to page it in during emulation? We can just basically turn off swapping for all the processes we care about. The kernel on Linux uh, basically will never touch swapped out memory. So as long as we're just fuzzing the kernel, it's not really going to be swapping anything in and out. <laughs> I worry, God, the God worrier. Yeah, man, some of the coolest stuff I've come across in a long time. Hell yeah. Yeah, I'm glad we can uh, show kind of really low-level um, security research here. It's it's rare to come across. Um, can you rate the fuzzer that me and a PhD student at my school have been, school have been working on? It's called Zarf on GitHub. Um, I could at a later point, we could do uh, maybe a review on it. I'm I'm typically not the the friendliest to a lot of fuzzers, so I don't want to be an ass. I've got a pair. Got a pair of what? Headphones, bugs, Ode, bearproof windows. Um. Best stream on Twitch for sure? Hell yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad so many people think this weird-ass content is entertaining somehow. <laughs> Are you going to do a paper review? I probably would. We need the harsh criticism. Feel free to go ham on it. Maybe. It's hard to say. Like, my schedule's just kind of whatever I randomly feel like doing. So... Um... 2.18 in the afternoon on Monday. Um, what? I remember uh, when it was exciting, uh, when you'd, oh, 2.18 in the afternoon on Monday. Oh, viewers, I remember when it was exciting when you'd break 100. I wonder if your viewer count will drop after the pandemic. No, it's just going to just gonna get better. <laughs> We're on the up and up. <laughs> We're, we're growing a lot here on this channel. I have no idea why. I don't know why you fucks are so interested in this content, but you keep showing up, so thank you. Um, where are you from? I'm from Wisconsin, middle of the Midwest. What flavor are your Pop-Tarts? These are brown sugar cinnamon, um, which I did not toast, which I regret because they're much better toasted, but they're still acceptable. I just needed some blood sugar. We love the content. More monitors is more viewers. Shit, I just got to fill everything up with monitors. <laughs> um, DT990, I've got a pair. Oh, yeah. Hell, yeah. They're so good. I wish I had a pair of bugs. Yeah, you, you need to pair your bugs. You need one info leak and then one, um, one RCE. And then you're good. That's a good pair of bugs. Um... Uh, what do you do as your main job at Microsoft? OS security or what? Yeah, I do OS security mainly, kind of. I kind of just work on random projects that need auditing. Um, 
Right now, my biggest work is um, not concrete at all. My biggest work is basically um, convincing people to use Rust and not in an evangelical way, but basically like do audits to demonstrate that their, their C code is full of flaws and it would take a lot of effort to maintain and be comfortable that that code is, is good quality. Um, but also the non-C route of things, which is just like, or not the security route of things, but just like, wouldn't it be nice if you didn't have to manually free everything and you wouldn't have to manually basically make a go-to cleanup in every function where you handle every partial initialization in an error? Like, there's a lot of reasons to use Rust that aren't just fuck you security. Um, and I think bringing those things to light and getting people comfortable with how Rust looks at a binary level and how to use it in low memory environments and weird environments, um, is important. And I kind of do a mix of everything right now. Largely security reviews of things where I find bugs and I write fuzzers. Um, like a year or two ago, I wrote a uh, fuzzing infrastructure that allows for deterministic uh, snapshot fuzzing of Windows as well as Hyper-V that can scale over the network and can run in Azure and it's deterministic. So if you ever observe a crash, even if it's an obscure race condition, it will reproduce, which makes it easier to uh, do that triage on. So I wrote that tool, and that is kind of what we use at Microsoft largely internally for um, a large amount of our OS-level fuzzing. Um, so I kind of do a bunch of random things. Uh, a couple years ago, I did Intel CPU research, and I found a couple uh, CPU bugs. And I basically wrote all of the proof-of-concept exploits for all of the CPU bugs that came out. I triaged the bugs. I looked at a little bit deeper than just triage to see if there was anything that was adjacent or nearby. I wrote fake operating, not fake operating systems, but tiny, tiny operating systems that you could boot and would give like pass fails. So if you boot this operating system off a of floppy in Hyper-V, it'll give you a pass fail of whether or not the mitigation uh, was successful or the uh, amount that the mitigation blocked. Um, so I did, I do a lot of random things. Um, yeah. Basically a paid rush shill. <laughs> Shout out to Oxide.computer. Hell yeah. Good old Oxide. <laughs> um, I learned more from your stream than university. I'm glad, but I'm also sad. <laughs> I'm also sad about that. Good old Scani, hell yeah. That's why I got that neutral ass accent. Um, looking back, what would you change about your Fuzzle Week series? Um, I'd probably stick to more of a curriculum, but I also didn't intend to follow a curriculum during Fuzzle Week. It was meant to be kind of fluid. So, put some big 82 inch screens at your balcony so you could stretch. Your eyes while you code. <laughs> oh man, this this man is serious about his monitor setup. Hell yeah, I am. How long do you think before Rust becomes mainstream? Seven years. Seven years. I think it will become mainstream. Mainstream for. Um, Companies that are small enough or new enough or don't have enough legacy dependencies or companies that are large enough to make large changes, I think we'll see that more in the next couple years. Like in the next couple years, we'll probably see official integration of Rust into like multiple Linux distributions and uh, Windows will probably see like better integration into their IDEs and IntelliSense. Um, we'll see it in like internal build systems. Um, and then, like, five years out, I think we'll see some of the first, like, code coming from companies that maybe don't have those luxuries in Rust. And then I think seven years, I think it's reasonable that, like, maybe uh, there's a good RTOS written in Rust or a safe language. I don't care if it's Rust or a safe language, um, but a language like Rust. Uh, once we get, like, a good RTOS and a good IoT sort of OS written in these languages... And not a fucking hobby kernel, not the shit you see on GitHub, not Redox. Something that is professionally backed and tested and integrates well into many environments and is a seamless integration to a lot of people's traditional 
development workflows um, and can offer training courses and offer uh, good uh, C and Rust kind of co uh, co compatibility guides and stuff like that. Not And having an open source project that exists on GitHub that you can build and you get a kernel out of is one-tenth of the fucking process of getting a standard, average, systems-level programmer being able to be effective in using Rust. Um, so uh, it's a lot of politics, right? A lot of politics, documentation, and training. Um, yeah, do the same thing, breaking stuff in unfixable ways and make them do Rust. Yeah, sounds fantastic. Um, feel like Rust would be enjoying, uh, uh, enjoying a lot more widespread adoption if it wasn't associated with Mozilla. Really? I don't think Mozilla actually is a negative light. I think it's actually only a positive light um, to it. Um, there will be no more bugs to exploit. Oh, there's going to be C for a long time. A lot of people aren't going to want to train their uh, engineers. Um, just starting with Rust? Hell yeah. That's awesome, Dao EU. Um, glad you're enjoying that. Wow, you are cool. Hell yeah, Catatonia67, is that a reference to Catatonia the band? One of my favorite bands, absolutely love their stuff. I actually haven't paid attention to it, um, but I think uh, Catatonia is a fantastic band, but I think also uh, that might just be a real word too, um, <laughs> so it might have nothing to do with the band, but super, super, super good band. Um... um what is that, side channel attacks or other processor bugs? Um, like for the spectrum mitigations. I found, a, I found a CPU bug that allowed you to arbitrarily disclose loads that happened on the system. So you could basically monitor any memory access that happened. Um, yeah. Um, I guess Crab Rave, Crab Rave is the official Rust theme song, yeah. In seven years, I might not suck at Rust, so that's good. Yeah, that's exactly kind of what I expect. Um, people need to get adoption and get that growth and stuff, which I think is uh, important here. Uh, webcam view. Hell yeah, undefined behavior. Good to see you back here. We've been doing webcam the last couple streams. Um, in like two to five years due to WebAssembly, I'm curious if that'll catch on. 20 years till universities add it to their curriculum. Yeah. Universities in 2050 will be teaching Node.js, and then in 2070, they'll start teaching Rust. <laughs> oh, man. Good IoT. Those don't belong going together. Yeah, I agree with that. You like Swift or Zig? Eh. I'm kind of impartial. I don't understand them well enough. I think Swift is okay. Um, but I think Swift feels kind of like an outdated language. Um, it, it feels like uh, they didn't change too much, which is good. Um, but also, I, I want to see like more innovation. I think Rust made some pretty radical changes, like switching to traits. Obviously, that concept has existed in other languages. Um, but just the explicitness of types, the fact that like castings are explicit... Um, the way that traits are intuitive, uh, the way that you understand what code is executing, you don't have like random uh, garbage collector threads that are scheduled, you don't have uh, async calls causing threads to get created unless you explicitly do that. Um, stuff like that I think is really important to me. As someone who pretty much vowed to never use anything but ANSI C, um, I was blown away by Rust, uh, largely because I understand what it's doing. Like, I ported my OS to Rust in the first week of learning Rust. It was that intuitive to me. It just made sense. I know how memory was being stored. I know the layout of things. I know the calling conventions being used. I, I understand what code is executing. I know what works in a pre-boot environment, what things do and don't allocate. Like, all of those things are very explicit. Um, you know which ways things are dropped and freed and released and how locks are used. It, it just... It makes sense. It really does. It's super clear. Um, um, are those screens or something or mostly for playing around? They are screens. Bunch of monitors there. 
Thank the Unix graybeards who do not want to stop using C for feeding security researchers' families <laughs> and sending their kids to college. Yeah. I don't know. I think, um, yep, it's about the band. I love old stuff like Brave Murder Day. Absolutely. Um, I, I don't know. I, I found Catatonia in 2010. Um, I've seen them live in concert, which was really fun. Um, I liked a lot of their, like, I guess I, I like some of their old stuff, but I don't know too much of it. Like, I've listened to all of their stuff. I've listened to their entire discography. Um, but mainly it's, like, their most recent uh, uh, two albums that I've been listening to. And I, I'm blanking on what they are. Like, uh, uh, I'd have to look them up. I can picture the album art cover in my head. Um <laughs> But I, I just really love the progressive feel. I didn't like the uh, aggressive vocals and some of the older stuff. Um, so, and I think the rumor was the vocalist basically lost his ability to do the the screams and switch to a more like melodic uh, style. And I love that. I'm a big fan of like Cynic. Um, Cynic is like one of my favorite bands as well. So that like really progressive style. Um, if there are screams, they're very tasteful. I like that a lot. Um, Swift can't compare booleans? What? What? Isn't the Go runtime where pointers are two 64-bit words? Um, so you can get into weird race conditions where only half a pointer is updated? I'm not sure about that. I can't speak to that. Um, on x86, you can do atomic 16-byte operations, so 128-bit operations, but a lot of other architectures you can't. Um... Fortran is going to become a legacy vanity language once all the satellites from the 80s reach end of life. Isn't it already? <laughs> legacy? Don't disrespect Fortran. The four, uh, the HPC people will get you. Yeah. Rust error messages are a breath of fresh, fresh air for the most part, uh, too. Yeah. And it wasn't even until Clang came along that C got good errors. Like, C and C++'s errors are absolute shit. And before Clang, before, like, 2010, they were even worse. They were so bad. It was like, here's the line in the number. Uh, or here's the file in the line. And that's why you'll see me often not reading warnings and errors. It's like a, a thing that I naturally am used to just like, well, I got a warning. Let me go to the line and figure out what happened. Um, even though the warnings and errors just typically tell you what the error is nowadays. Um, uh, this is, uh, probably the blog about inspecting the loads. Yeah, absolutely. Sushi roll. Um. <laughs> Catatonia with a K is the name of the band. You should listen to the contortionist. Oh, that sounds very metal. Thoughts on Go? I think it's a great language, but I think Rust is better. I think Go makes more sense for m for most people. Um, but I think Rust is a better language and gives you more control and has uh, what I would consider to be a better syntax. Um, but it's a lot more work. Yeah. If it has a garbage collector, my thoughts are, it's probably good for the masses, but I'm not a huge fan. Like, pretty much generically. I don't like garbage collectors. I hate them. I think they're a stupid concept. Um, Rust is just so different um, from many other languages. Uh, while learning of Rust, I feel like my past experience didn't help much. Oh, that sucks, man. Um, I feel like my switch from C to Rust was pretty natural, but I don't know what languages you knew. It, it felt pretty natural for me. Rust Analyzer for Rust is amazing. I haven't tried it. Um, but yeah, apparently it's really good. Uh... That'd probably help me with, like, unsafe code. Yeah, especially with templates and macros uh, involved. Things have really improved. Yeah. Um, I really like the change they did to Rust errors recently where they don't show the full path of a type uh, if it's unambiguous. Yeah, they did that recently. It was, like, two versions ago. Um, they've been doing a lot of, like, cleanup of kind of their errors and warnings uh, for macros and templates, and uh, especially when you have, like, Weird indirection, which I, I found really nice. Um, oh, unless you're talking about Clang. 
uh, where Clang doesn't show the full path. Um, I don't know if that's changed, but I do know that, like, you would get errors that are a full terminal of literally, basically square brackets and colons. <laughs> Thoughts on IDEs versus Vim? Um, I think IDEs are... I don't like them. I think you lose a lot of control, and you have typically much higher keyboard latency. You have, like, pop-ups that will hijack your, like, cursor, or they'll hijack your arrow keys or your enter key while that is displayed, or maybe hijack your tab. Like, typically, you lose, like, when you get an autocomplete pop-up, you either lose, like, a tab, an enter, uh, a space, or, like, arrow keys. It's so annoying to me. Stop! I don't like that. Um, I'm really not a fan. I think IDEs often allow people to write really unreadable code because they use their IDE as a crutch for navigating their code base. So they don't think about separating things between files and making reasonable names for functions and paths. They just XRAF everything, so they don't really care. You could have the whole project in one, one million line of code file, and the way you navigate it, it doesn't really matter if it makes sense where you put things. So personally, I like the control of uh, Vim. Obviously, you can use an IDE responsibly, um, but I'm not a huge fan. They're typically super laggy, super bloated. It takes way too long to load files. They typically fail at large files. Um, the startup time is ridiculous. They're typically optimized for single monitor. So if you want to do multi-monitor things, it's fucking useless. Uh, they integrate typically with like a console or something that often never works correctly. They typically push or are forced like hidden files to get dropped in the, in the current directory. And they have like config things. It's just... They do a lot of things I don't like. Um, still pretty huge memory usage because um, it indexes all your dependencies on startup. Yeah. Like, ctags is instant. Like, on the Linux kernel, on the Windows kernel, on the entire Windows kernel plus user land, ctags is like 5 milliseconds latency. It takes like... 15 seconds to do an XREF in VS Code on that same size code base. It's fucking stupid. I hate it. All right. Done with my Pop-Tart. Who needs, who needs anything apart from Emacs? Sane people. Sane people need things apart from Emacs. <laughs> um... Let's see. Imagine writing Java without an IDE. God, that would be awful. But the language is also awful. Just just doing Java in general is awful. Like, do you have a local NT kernel source copy? Yup. Coding in a notebook in my phone. I think if I were in high schools and they allowed for you to be on phones, I think they do in modern high schools. I would literally just be typing code in, like, a Python interpreter on my phone and writing shit. Because that's what I did on calculators. I just programmed my TI calculator on the calculator. Not externally, but in class, I would sit and type out basic on that keyboard. And I got pretty good at it. I probably could do, like, 20 words a minute on that piece of shit. Um, I wrote some pretty cool software on that. And you can only see, like, 50 characters on the screen, so you have to, like, keep a lot of the code in your head. Really fun. Does the NT Git checkout really take a few hours? Oh, more than that. It's a pain in the ass. I like your beard. Very cute. Hell yeah. I love be I love bears, huh? <laughs> hey, what's up? <laughs> How you doing, girl? <laughs> I mean, Danny. <laughs> I know you're. I know you're a dude. I just say, how's it going? You know. <laughs> um. I mean, I don't know. I don't actually know. <laughs> to be honest, I see Daniel. Uh, Daniel the Beast. Hell yeah, I love bears. See, I, I've, I've always pictured myself to not be a bear, but that has changed as I've aged. But I'm, I'm just small framed and tiny. Um, 
TI-83 for life, hell yeah. I had a, a TI-82 was my first Kelk. Then I had a TI-84 plus silver edition. And then I got an HP 50G, and now I use uh, Swiss Micro's uh, DM42s, which are amazing. These calculators, they're so nice. They're so nice. They're thin, titanium backing, the buttons feel good. Not as good as I hoped. And the screen, the screen, the resolution on the screen is so good. It's insane. Huh. It's, ah, uh, they're beautiful, beautiful things. Um, TA-89 was great, did my integrals, yeah, the HP-50Gs and these, uh, DM-40Ts can do those. I really like the HP-50G, mainly because RPN is just correct. <laughs> like, RPN is just so good. Um, so. Alright. Hell yeah. Uh, the calculator we were forced to use at school had an ABCD keyword, what? Um, I think that's pretty common for calculators. If you mean they're like all in a row. I do Java at my job, but I work on uh, the VM, so it's mostly C++. My condolences. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I bought a TI-82 uh, or a TI-92 last year for nostalgia's sake. Um, nost uh, nostalgia for the calculator I didn't have. Aww. Uh, wait, what do you need a calculator for if you have a computer in front of you? Better uh, keyboard entry and uh, reference when I'm basically don't want to open up a new window or clutter something on the screen. Uh, better precision of, of digits, uh, ability to do integrations and uh, graphing, just like so many things. So many things are better on a physical uh, calculator than on a computer. Um, like, if you do RPN uh, and you do like fast entry where you can like add up some numbers really quick, um, physical calculators are, are mandatory. Um, <laughs> which Linux distro do you use? I'm on Gen 2 right now. Well, from Alpha is pretty good. Yeah, but it's slow as shit. Calc.exe versus real calc? Real calc any day. Um, unless I'm trying to exploit. <laughs> um... Uh, legit, why use a graphing calculator when Androids can plot functions do integrals as well? Because you don't have tactile feedback, right? I can literally type something in behind my head, right? I can, like, do math behind my head, right? And I can do, like, serious data entry, and I do that all the time. I will literally be, like, playing a game where I'm, like, playing World of Warcraft, and I've got my calculator in front of me, and I'm, like, typing without looking at my calculator. I'm typing in, like, the damage numbers I'm doing to figure out, like, the average damage. Or I'm doing some math about, like, something I, I'm typing up uh, in my code, and I'm able to, like, type on the keyboard or use the mouse while typing something up, and then I can get the result at the end. It's super nice for uh, parallelization there. Um, on a desktop, it is required... Typically, unless you use a, an extremely exotic setup, you can only have one window focused at a time. So if you want to have a calculator open, um, you have to switch focus to that. Uh, and on a phone, you don't have tactile feedback. Touch screens just suck. Like, touch screens are just absolute garbage. If I could buy a nice phone with a physical keyboard, I would do it in a heartbeat. I don't care about the thickness of a phone. Um... Uh, which desktop do you use? I use DWM. Hell yeah. Hopefully I w haven't warded off too many people with this long introduction and we haven't gotten to the coding yet. Um, anything notable about your Vim setup? No, it's pretty much fully default except for like some uh, tab indentation and uh, the color column and numbers. It's pretty much bone stock. Um... So the automation software bots to buy limited items go for $7,000? Are these ripoffs? I feel like you're... Wait, what? Um, I feel like you're just a genius, though. To buy limit, Like, to make a... To make a bot that, like... Like, if you're trying to scalp your GTX 3090s? Or are you talking for something else? Um, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if they're that expensive. That, that would totally make sense. I would totally expect those to be expensive. You're, you're probably paying for people to physically do CAPTCHAs somewhere in the world. Like, there's a, you're probably, like, getting a service there. 
those bots are 100% a ripoff? Yeah, they probably are, but they, they, they're not a ripoff if you are incapable of writing code. <laughs> right? If you don't know how to write code, um, yeah, as long as, if you buy a $7,000 tool, as long as you can scalp like 20 GPUs, you've made money. And you know how much money you would have made if you didn't write the if you didn't buy the seven thousand dollars scalping tool? You would make zero dollars because you wouldn't buy anything. <laughs> Two captcha, seventy five cents a captcha. Yeah. Um. Uh, we should petition on the metal podcast to invite uh, Gamosa. Is that um, um. Oxide, that's the Oxide one, right? Daniel the Beast, thank you so much for your Twitch Prime. Glad you're hanging out here, having fun. Lol, I like you, yeah. Yeah, I think one thing that's pretty common here is we often talk about, like, how things work. I don't condone stelp, st scalping or CAPTCHA solving or bypassing those things. Uh, but I'm also very comfortable having the conversation about how those things work and the, the economics and the reality, right? We, we can have conversations here about how things are without getting too critical about whether or not they're right or wrong, but we can discuss what people are doing. Um, and I, I like that. Capture solving is super cheap. Yeah. Yeah, it's oxides. Yep. Idiots buy overpriced par cards. I mean, I'm tempted to spend three grand on a GTX 3090. Although I, they're they've come down in price, but like, I'd love to get my hands on them. It's not a massive markup. Um, did you get your new capture card? Yeah, I did. I think they're like 2,300 to 2,800 now, uh, depending on the model that you get. Um, and I think stock they're like 1,500. So you're paying you're paying like a 50% premium to get access to it three months earlier. Like, that's pretty reasonable. In that case, how do you feel about hacking voting systems? I mean, I'd expect every country should be trying to do it. I'm not saying it's right, but why the fuck wouldn't you? Like, why would you, why would you miss out on such a great opportunity to increase your power and influence over the world? It's a no-brainer. Like, obviously, everyone is trying to do it. It just makes sense. <laughs> it doesn't mean people are succeeding and that it's happening, but people are trying, for sure. Um, turns out you can just uh, sway the voters by convincing them of bullshit anyways, so there's kind of no reason to go through that effort. But, yeah. What capture card did you go with? I got a 4 HDMI um, Majewell uh, PCI Express 2.0 X4. Um, Basically, it has four different inputs, and uh, it's got 64 scan lines of latency. It can do uh, 1080p at um, 80 frames a second, and it can do um, like smaller resolutions up to 144 uh, frames a second. Basically, it's it's bottlenecking on on bandwidth. Um, so I got the uh, four port 1080p one rather than the uh, rather than the 4K one, because I'm not going to stream in 4K. Um, and the 4K one only had two inputs, and it was twice the price. So this was four times more cost-effective. I've got twice as many ports, and it was half the cost. Um, and if I do, like, streaming stuff, and I, like, make really nice views where I, like, switch camera views and stuff, um, I could totally see having four cameras set up at different angles, especially if I do some, uh, like, double E stuff where I have my oscilloscope and a multimeter and, like, a couple things uh, pointing to instruments on a bench or things under test. Um, so I think having the four ports is nice. Um, I don't think I ever need to capture 4K. Like, if... If I'm doing 4K, I'm probably recording it and post-processing it, and thus it doesn't matter. Oh, you can see the clouds outside. Isn't that cool? You can see a cloud forming in the valley. Here, I can focus that. <laughs> Isn't that neat? Got a cloud forming. I love watching that shit. I know you can't hear me well from this distance. All right, now I have to use my focusing flute. 
and uh, make sure I'm in frame, and uh, hopefully this will focus me. Do you like my focusing flute? <laughs> I just needed a long pointy object. <laughs> um, where do you live? That's really nice. I live in uh, Seattle. Um, 2K euros now and available now. Oh, that's not too bad. Um, I love watching that shit too. Cool spot. Yeah. Like those are literally clouds forming right now. It's just so cool, man. I'm in Portland. Hell yeah. Y'all can petition Oxide to invite Gamozo. Just do it tastefully. Just as long as you don't spam. Um, I'm, I'm fine with that. Just do it tastefully. Don't annoy them. Don't frustrate them. Uh, they, they're busy. They have their, the things that they want to do on stream and, and who they want on. So, um, I think someone brought it up a couple months ago and, uh, um, fuck, what's his name? I need to know his name. Um, I'm not going to be able to think about it now that I'm thinking about it. Anyways, um, D Trace, dude. Why am I blanking on it? I don't know. Anyways, uh, yeah, B Brian Kentrell. Yeah. Um, basically, uh, someone brought up that I should be on the, the podcast like a, a couple months ago, maybe half a year ago. And then he followed me on Twitter. So, like, he knows I exist. Um, so. Just don't be too spammy because he, he knows I exist. Like if he really wanted me on, he it probably would have happened. So just be just be careful. Um long pointy object, an expensive Yamaha flute. No, this is a cheap $80 flute. It's it's pretty bad. Um, but mainly, uh maybe $150. But basically I wanted uh I wanted to get a flute. Um, I actually got like a trumpet and a clarinet and a saxophone. So I, I play saxophone um, and I wanted to get a couple of instruments that I've never played before. Uh, clarinet, I actually have found I love the clarinet. I almost like the clarinet more than a saxophone. Um, that might just be because it's a little quieter and the, the, the downtime of like assembling is a little bit lower. Uh, the flute's really fun too, but I can't get good sounds out of it. I just... I don't know if it's just a cheap flute with a bad mouthpiece, or I just haven't figured out the mouthing yet, uh, but the fingerings I'm, I'm decent at. It's basically the same as other woodwinds in, in terms of the, the core, um, like, C major scale uh, fingerings. Can you play a bit for us? No. <laughs> um, what do you use the six monitors for? For uh, writing a lot of code. Um... Let's see. Uh, talking about cost effectiveness, doesn't Ryzen and AMD have a GPU that make uh, an AMD a GPU makes more sense? Um, but you have to go the AMD SVM route. Yeah, so I don't really care for my desktop whether or not it's AMD or Intel. It doesn't matter to me, so I'm not too picky there. Um, flute aperture is difficult to get right at first and requires a lot of air. Yeah, I'm probably just under airing it. Um, that's probably what I'm doing. Um, what would be a good? Oh, yeah, there's a previous thing. <laughs> I was like, what would be a good? I don't know. I don't know. What would be a good? What would be a good uh, malware analysis project to have on your resume to find an internship uh, in the reverse engineering world, I have no idea. I don't do any malware analysis. I can't speak to that. Um, I don't know. I, I genuinely don't know. I think uh, it's important to note, and this can be frustrating to hear, but a lot of interviews, um, they'll just never look at your resume, right? Like an HR person who doesn't know what any of the things say might look for a couple buzzwords to figure out whether or not they should pass it on. Um, but often, like, very specific things uh, don't come up that much in an interview. Um, that being said, sometimes they do. Sometimes someone will say, oh, you talk about doing this on your resume. Can you expand on that? And sometimes they can be a good conversation starter. Um, but in a decent amount of interviews, the company has a specific set of pre-made questions that everyone asks, and... 
you don't really go off that beaten path. Now, that's not a good thing. I think it's a bad interview process, but um, there's often a lot of standardization that causes stuff like that. So, um, interviews are borked. Yes, they are. Uh, just thought of a neat eye tracker project. Track how far down uh, chat you've read and keep an unri unread line there so you know where to start reading from next time. That'd be kind of cool. That would actually be kind of neat. Um, hey, you, that is one really nice setup uh, you got there. Also, do you ever try um, or plan to do embedded slash firmware dev like AVR or ESP? I have um, some things I want to write Rust on, right? Well, that looks fancy, uh, but like one of these, right? It's just ARM. Uh, it's a Nucleo 32. It's an 80 megahertz Cortex M4 processor, 256 kilobytes of flash, and 64 kilobytes of SRAM. Um, I'm looking to make a uh, Rust RTOS for that as a proof of concept of what can be done. Um, so this is basically the, the lightest weight, cheapest thing I could get. Um, like, not that I care about cost for purchasing and doing the development, but it's basically the hardest platform to fit what you need um, in memory. So it's, uh, it's going to really challenge the ability to, to make a small operating system. So, yeah, I do have plans for that. Would that be fun to do on stream? Would people want to do an embedded RTOS? Um, what's an RTOS? R-T-O-S. It is a real-time operating system. It's what's used on many cheap embedded devices. Um, and it's typically just a really cheap, um, low power, low memory usage, deterministic environment that basically is just super lightweight for devices that could not handle running something like Linux. Um, I could maybe do that through December, um, cause I might take all of December off. The problem is if the RTOS works, then it's just, it's just work <laughs> again. So I didn't take time off. So I don't, I don't know. <laughs> um, let's see here. Um, and OS like uh, RTOS uh, in Rust would be nice. Yeah, there are a couple RTOS projects in Rust. They do exist. And I've never done an RTOS. Now, a lot of my kernels are similar to an RTOS style, um, but I've never really done an RTOS. Um, so I would probably make something that is not the standard. It wouldn't resemble exactly like a um, standard RTOS environment. Um, but I think it'd be kind of fun to just try it and see where we go and, and how we do with these memory constraints and stuff, which would be really fun. Um, God, I've got the, the songs to sing in the shower playlist on right now, and I just want to sing everything. Turn this into a karaoke stream. <laughs> Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, I think that'd be super fun. Jason Condition, thank you for uh, saying you're glad that you caught my stream. Absolutely. I'm glad that you're here to enjoy it. Um, heck yeah, sounds like a real fun stream. Yeah, that would be super fun. Uh, we would basically have to not use a lot of stuff in libcore and Rust. Uh, like, we would have to avoid a decent amount of things um, that would basically cause too much memory to get used. Um, so we would probably have to do some like interesting allocator tricks and designs, um, but that sounds super fun to me. Um, absolutely. Why can't you be my computer science teacher? Because I don't live there and I don't have any degrees. <laughs> um, RTOS is an OS implemented fully by firmware? Kind of. Uh, so RTOS typically refers to the fact that tasks um, run indefinitely. Now, RTOSs can be preemptible, but typically it means that an RTOS, you like you boot up the RTOS and then it fires off your um your socket listener thread. And then that runs and it checks with the device to see if it got any packets. It did not. And then that thread voluntarily gives up execution by saying, okay, I'm done for now. Let the next thing run. And then it will go to your uh, temperature sensor monitor. And then that will yield execution. And that will go to something else. Uh, so it's pretty common in an RTOS configuration to have multiple different models. Um, but a standard, like... Uh, the simplest RTOS that you can get, which is also not super common, is a timerless uh, RTOS. Basically, 
an operating system that has no interrupts, no timers. It will boot up and just run stuff. And then it basically is down to the tasks to switch between each other by yielding their time. Um, the next stage, which is the most common for an RTOS, is a timer-based RTOS. Typically, it's an RTOS where the threads yield their execution, but timers can also preempt and cause some certain interval or high priority tasks to run in that timer interrupt or get preempted or brought up to the front of the schedule. Um, but an RTOS basically just looks like a register state and a stack manager. It basically makes a stack for each of your tasks and has a register state for each of your tasks, and that's it. It's kind of hands off from there. Um, it just kind of allows you to have isolated stack and register states and switch between them. That's that's really it. It typically will provide like um, allocation services, and the allocation services typically are line linear allocations. There's often not a heap. There's often not an alloc and a free. It's just an alloc. You you get memory. If you want to reuse the memory or free the memory, then allocate a little bit more and then manage the pool yourself. That's a pretty common design for an RTOS. Um, it's common they have no heap at all. They just have like linear allocations um, in globals where things make things in globals that they need. Maybe they can increment just a, a linear allocator that's all of RAM and just get a slice of that and save that. Um, but there's typically no way to free things on, on a lot of those RTOSs. Um, so there's some really cool designs there that I've never gotten to play around with, but I'm pretty sure um, I, could, I could make a pretty good RTOS. Um, Real-time real task scheduling is scary. Oh, absolutely. I wrote an embedded Rust future scheduler recently, uh, but it sucked because I couldn't figure out how to configure the timers properly. Oh, damn. Gamozo Serenade. Are you talking about the candle? <laughs> oh. There you go. Now you can see the candle. <laughs> um, so cooperative, not preemptive. Yes, exactly. You inspire me. I'm glad. Cool. I'm also inspired now. I'm so glad. Programming is really fun. There's so many cool things to do out there. Um... So is it possible to get one of those big tech corps like Fang uh, uh, to get with one of them uh, without a resume just based off your portfolio? A lot of those companies don't give a shit about your resume, right? Um, the big Fang companies have such standardized bureaucratic processes for hiring that your resume is probably not going to come up. Once again, it might be used for a filter, um, but it's very likely they are required to ask certain questions because they fill it, they have like predefined forms. It's very, very generic and it's a shitty way to hire, um, but it's also um, a good way to make sure that you can have new engineers who maybe don't have the best social skills um, capable of still hiring people and committing things to that hiring process because uh, obviously engineers d need to do interviews. So... A lot of that stuff is important. Did you try some of the real-time patches for Linux? No, I have no need for that. Um, I don't actually have a need for an RTOS myself. Um, I would like to design one. Um, that's interesting. Uh, would think that long-running processes might run into a problem where they allocate for their peak uh, consumption and then hold on to memory even though they don't need it. You just don't design software like that on an RTOS. Basically, when you... When you write a like task for an RTOS, you will pre-allocate everything you need and you will never allocate again. Like dynamic allocations on an RTOS are very rare. Your like a nit or like main will allocate the like 64k that you need for random shit and then you will use that for random shit and you'll repurpose it if you need to change it. Um, it's not common for uh, RTOS like thread or task uh, developers to dynamically allocate something. Like, you wouldn't receive a packet and allocate something. You would pre-allocate a buffer to hold that information. Um, and it means you do a lot of copyless things. You do a lot of things on the stack. You use a lot of temporaries. You reprocess things rather than caching results. Um, but typically, that is what is required um, uh, for those sorts of things. 
So how is security handled in RTOS? It's not at all. Um, typically, you have no memory manager because the chips are so cheap and so small and so low power that you cannot have memory protections. So there are a couple different levels of memory protections. Um, there is none, which is one. There is an MPU, which is a memory protection unit. And that's typically like... Uh, a range of like one to eight registers or regions of memory that you can apply permissions to. You can say like this region of this meg of memory is read only and this next three megs is read writable and this next one meg is executable. And that's a memory protection unit. Um, and then you have MMU, a memory management unit, which allows for like full paging and virtual memory and like page granularity dynamically changed permissions. Um, most embedded devices uh, will either have no memory management at all, or they'll have an MPU where they can protect different regions, and a lot of embedded devices will not use them. So all memory will be read-writable, executable. All of the execution is typically deterministic, so the stacks are at the same location, or the stacks are hard-coded where the stacks are. Uh, the globals, there's never ASLR. Like, you can theoretically do it, but no one is going to. Um, basically, everything's typically a one-to-one -one mapping between physical memory in read-writable, executable mode and uh, virtual memory or that addresses you access. So uh, typically, security is, is basically non-existent, or at least mitigations. Um, security then comes down to basically the quality of the code that you develop. Um, speaking of RTOS, have you seen SEL4? I have seen it, but I'm not familiar with it. Um, have you heard of QNX? I have. Um... So, yeah. Also, what brand of headphones uh, looks really comfy? Yeah, these are DT990s by Bear Dynamics. Um, they're relatively cheap. They're open ears, so I can hear everything in the room. It doesn't feel like I'm muffled. My ears get a decent amount of airflow, uh, which means my ears don't get too hot. Um, and they are very, very light headphones. Um, I have some other headphones that are super nice that weigh like a pound, and these are basically the lightest ones you can get. So, hell yeah. Um, okay. Um, I think I've caught up with chat. I have to buy a wood smoke candle. You're an influencer. I, I you sell feelings of the, uh, uh, to the product. Yeah, I need to make my Amazon, uh, um, what is it called? Uh, where I have a uh, referral link. <laughs> but it's just candles. It's candles and then like $6,000 like UPSs and servers. <laughs> it's for those romantic server nights. Pretty monitors, hell yeah. I love my monitors. I love my setup here. All right, let's uh, let's get to some code. I know we said we were gonna get to that, but uh, uh, <laughs> we haven't uh, we haven't gotten there. <laughs> hell yeah. Okay. It's kind of nice because today I have no raid, which means I don't feel like I need to get into things. If we're having a good chat, we can have a good chat. <laughs> Some coding almost two hours into the stream. Yep. I think the dragon is docking with the IS in about four hours. Have they just been whizzing around Earth? Or sorry, have they just been whizzing a flat Earth? Um, above, above Earth, you know, like going like this above Earth waiting to dock. They're just chilling there. I wonder what kind of food they got. They probably have the best dried food. <laughs> um, couldn't oxymoron power outages, but high speed internet. I have a lot of power outages here. I need to try open ear airflow. So one bad thing about open ears, first you can hear um, outside things, but further, your headphones can be heard outside as well. So if you listen to music very loud, like people will be able to hear that. So I don't recommend it in an office environment unless you have uh, enough space around where you are. Um, okay. You like the cloud? Oh, it just moved out of, moved out of focus. But we've got clouds kind of flowing through here. 
So here we've got uh, the clouds coming in. It looks like today is going to be about 50 degrees and cloudy. We've got some clouds forming up here in the valley. We can see as the heat uh, convects out of this valley, these clouds are slowly going to raise up and, and get out of here and form actual clouds. Um, there's my meteorologist uh, uh, pretending. <laughs> they have dehydrated Taco Bell. Oh, no. Um, came here uh, from... Uh, a friend's mention of your monitors and I'm speechless. What monitors? I don't see any monitors here. <laughs> Fuzzy cloud. Gamozo fuzzing clouds. The noise bleed isn't too bad with the DT990s. Yeah, I'm not sure. I I bought these when I moved into this house, so I haven't had anyone I have to worry with. So, all right. Thanks, chat, for all these good conversations. We are going to move on to the content of this stream, which is going to be using our fancy a Android exploits uh, to hopefully get um, a... Basically, uh, dump out all a physical memory of this device. So we basically got there yesterday. We got all the pieces in place such that we can start trying to build this thing. Um, but the code kind of got a little messy yesterday. There are a couple things that we should put into libraries and clean up and make better. So, um, we'll definitely, uh, go into that. So here we go. Boop. Wait, wait. That key. Look at, look at that. Look at that quality. Look at that. You would think right now that you're on Ninja's stream, but no, you're on Gamozo's stream right now. <laughs> okay, um, so basically we are at a point where we are trying to read all of the physical memory from this device and uh, we ran into an issue yesterday where we were unable to read certain areas of physical memory because they weren't actively mapped into the kernel um, and thus uh, what we did is we made modifications to the ARM page tables such that we could create a new mapping for physical memory that we wanted to read. So we haven't 100% figured that out yet. I don't think we finished it. Uh, we got it working, but we didn't polish it and we didn't do anything with it. Um, but we're going to basically... Uh, keep swapping out uh, our virtual memory mapping with a new physical address each time we want to get a new window into physical memory. And that is going to allow us to hopefully dump all the physical memory this time and be confident that we're actually dumping that physical memory because we are addressing it with uh, the virtual memory um, with the page tables. So, uh, to do that, yesterday we had to go through the ARM uh, manual, the ARM ARM, um, which I'm going to pull up now. Um, and basically, the ARM ARM, uh, home pleb, and we'll look at, uh, where do we put it? I think in Android, yeah. So, we went through the ARM architecture reference manual, the ARM ARM, and we basically went in and found... Uh, basically how they do their virtual memory. And we wrote a tool that could walk all of physical memory, or more specifically, walk all of virtual memory. Um, so what we're going to do is be, we're going to load that into our exploit that we're running in the kernel on Android. And I'm going to explain through uh, how that's going once I uh, read some things in chat. Are you a day trader? I am, but not in the way that you're probably thinking. Um... That's not what the monitors are for. Uh, what's the point of dumping all of the memory? So we want to basically get a snapshot. We want to atomically snapshot the device. So basically disable all interrupts, freeze the system such that nothing is running except for us, and then save all of memory and all of register state. And from that point, we should be able to load that memory and register state into an emulator and then resume execution and that will allow us to debug, to fuzz, to get introspection, to basically do some very deep monitoring of a, a real device that we don't have those debugging capabilities on. So we're basically uh, pulling it into an emulator such that we can do further analysis on it. So, hell yeah. I'm confused. I just use them for programming and, and, and random documentation stuff. 
Um, I don't have any computer macros. So we have uh, two different computers here. Uh, one which is offline for, for research, and then one which is my gaming computer, which has these three monitors, which you only see two of, but there's actually one more. Um, but yeah. They really called it the arm arm. Yes, they did. Um, sweet. All right, so we're going to go and uh, talk through basically what we're doing right now. So we have this function is going to execute in the kernel. So we are going to be running in the kernel when this code executes. And what we did on the phone, uh, which is attached, adb shell, uh, we can go into proc and cat iomem. And iomem is going to be a listing of all of the physical memory mappings of the device. So we can see that uh, these ranges hold system RAM, like the actual uh, RAM, general purpose RAM of the device. Um, we have a couple devices in here, like the display is mapped in here. That's probably the, the like buffer that holds the thing that determines what pixels show up on the phone. Um, we have a serial port, which is probably some IO ports for transmitting things over serial. We have uh, Tegra things, which are GPU. These are EHCI, so this is going to be USB, um, a USB controller. There's SDHCI, which is SD card uh, controllers, um, keyboard stuff. Like basically, all of the devices are in here, um, but also the RAM is in here. So we can see that RAM has been split up into a couple regions, and that can be done for for various different reasons. Uh, reasons. Um, they could have a, a chip inside of this phone where basically the onboard chip has 128 megs of RAM. I'm just making up numbers. Um, it could have 128 megs of RAM and that wasn't sufficient for their use case so they supplemented it by adding some extra chips to the board and then wiring those to the processor. So there's a couple reasons why you can get split up ranges like that but we don't really care. All we know is that when we dump all of physical memory, we can't just dump a big block of memory. We have to handle these disjoint ranges because this goes from zero to 14 or 140 million, but then uh, 200 million is the next start. So there's a gap in there. And to handle those gaps, um, uh, there's actually no gap here, which is interesting, but these are probably different chips or something like that. And that's why they're showing up um, as separate, which is kind of interesting. So ultimately, we want to uh, snapshot all of the memory in these ranges. And to do that, uh, we need to be able to read physical memory. So what we wrote the other day was uh, this function, which is called a uh, phys reader. And this is going to allow us to read physical memory. So once again, we are running in the kernel on this device, and we used an exploit to get kernel execution. So we're not in a module. We're not supposed to be running in this environment, um, but we are. Like, we are basically forcibly running code in this kernel when, it, when we're not supposed to be, and we use an exploit to do that, and we talked about that a bit before. Do you have a git of your vimrc? It's just stock vimrc, except for uh, cc is 80, uh, set number, and tab stop and stuff is 4, and soft tab. Um, but it's pretty pretty much stock. Um, uh, did all these commands get removed? Yeah, the computer command, I accidentally misclicked, and I just haven't added it back. Um, but yeah, I have two Xeon servers with 96 cores each. 96 cores and 768 gigs of RAM, and that's about it, yeah. So I've got like 192 cores, 384 threads, and like 1.5 terabytes of RAM. <laughs> but these aren't these computers. Uh -huh. Great to see you in the mood. Hell yeah, mate. Good day, mate. Is that a is that a British mate or is that a is that an Australian mate? How much did those monstrosities set me back? I think they're like fifteen grand each. Um, I missed the exploit explanation a uh, bit. Can you run over it quickly? Sadly, sadly I cannot. Um, we we did uh, summaries on that in the past like two or three days now, and today, unfortunately. We just kind of have to move on. Um, basically, we found a bug that in a device driver that allowed us to provide the kernel with an arbitrary address that gets incremented. We use that to increment a function pointer in the kernel that is 
previously unused and is null, and we increment it to be a pointer into user space code, and then we invoke that function pointer by doing a, a syscall into the kernel on, a, on the correct device, and that allows us to have this code, which is in technically in user space, get executed in the kernel. That is the high level thing. Um, but I'm not going to go into details. If you want to, you can uh, look at some previous streams for that. Sorry. Um, you can find stuff on, on YouTube for that. Um, only 15 grand. Aren't 58 core Xeons like 10 grand each? Um, if you're like, it depends how you design them. Depends if you get the, the like, there are, there are a lot of ways to configure computers, and basically the the denser you get, the more exponentially expensive it is. Uh, so for me, I didn't get super dense servers. Um, damn, did that really not switch? Um, I didn't get super dense servers, um, and thus I got the most uh, cost-effective servers. We actually wrote a program that would randomly build servers. We basically made a list of motherboards and chassis and RAM and CPUs, and we randomly built servers. We simulated building like billions of servers and simulated uh, the performance of those servers, and we basically found the most cost-effective servers we could buy. Um, and yeah, we basically got like 30% uh, more compute for our money than if you were to kind of just go out and blindly buy computers, which is about two times more cost-effective than getting the biggest, beefiest processors. So yeah. Um... How are you liking having your own time source? It is fantastic. Oh my god, I actually have a clock on my offline network. It's amazing. Um, so nice. <laughs> what do you do for a living? I work at Microsoft doing computer security. Does it run to crisis on just the CPU? I'm sure it would do fine. Um, yes, everything turned compete complete can run crisis even a 6502 and a c64 can run it yeah that's fair i feel like i've seen something like that where someone made a old processor and they swapped out the memory uh for um something that kind of was like dynamically updated by the other side which allowed the memory to be like changed out um and I think they're, they, they like, basically were able to page the memory by using a, like, virtual paging device where, like, if you write a, a number to zero, uh, to address zero, that's, like, the, that indexes the bank. Like, I know devices often have banking. I know that's a real thing in hardware. But this was, like, a software thing where, basically, like, a computer was just seeing the memory and data requests and filling them in, filling them in from literally out of nowhere. Um, oh, nice Microsoft. They're working dev div. Awesome. Hell yeah. Yeah, currently working really hard right now. <laughs> um, completely unrelated YouTube deal got uh, reinstated. Oh, interesting. Huh. Pair of bag fuzzing PC part uh, picker. Yeah, that's effectively what I did. Um, sounds like the special C64 ROMs that are actually just Raspberry Pis. Oh, yeah, maybe. I don't know. They made a Buntu work on an 8 bit CPU. Oh, cool. Yeah, I, I remember reading that. <laughs> okay, so we have our kernel execution, and what we want to do is be able to read all of physical memory. Now, to do this, we have to basically figure out how to map in virtual memory, and to do that, we use these page tables, which if you're not familiar with page tables, it they basically take parts of the virtual address. So the address that you actually use to read memory gets split up into pieces. And those pieces are indexes into tables. Um, and basically, there's a root level table on the processor that says the table is here in physical memory. And then it will take the top 12 bits of the address and use that as an index into that table. And then that will have an entry, which will be a, the physical address of the next level table. And it will use the next parts of the address to go to that. Um, and that's effectively what we're dealing with here. Now, in our case, um, it is possible on ARM 32-bit uh, to have a one-level page table, and that is you have one megabyte page table entries. So the, um, the root-level page table on ARM v7, it is configurable, but typically in standard usage, 
it is 4,096 entries. And since it's 4,096 entries, and there are 4,096 megabytes in uh, 4 gigabytes, and 4 gigabytes is the maximum addressable thing with a 32-bit value, that means that if you were to map in a 1 megabyte region of physical memory, in each of those 4,096 slots, you can map in all of RAM. So that's actually what we're abusing here, and the only reason we're using that is because it's simpler. If we wanted to do a smaller page size than one meg, then we would have to create a table, which means we'd have to allocate something, figure out the physical address of it, make sure it's 4K aligned, and those can, those things can kind of be annoying and frustrating. So what we're doing is uh, we're just going into that root level page table, finding an unused entry, and then filling it in with a um, then we're filling it in with a uh, an entry that maps in the one meg that we want to observe. Um, and so that's what we're doing here. And what we're going to do is probably rewrite a lot of this code that we have up right now because I think there's a lot of quality improvements that we can make. So yeah. Um, there's this thing which emulates R ARM uh, on an AVR. Ooh, that might have been it. Takes two hours to boot into a shell. Hey, at least it does. <laughs> it beats... Uh, it beats... Um, Damn it, the joke completely failed because I didn't have the name on the tip of my tongue because I was looking for the init system that most Linux distros use now that's slow as fuck and I was going to say it beats that and then the joke didn't work because I didn't know the name of it. System D, yeah. Yeah, so if we if we rewind, it's basically like, haha, that's pretty good. Ha, uh, that's about the same speed it takes for System D to boot too. Ha, 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 ha,
is that there are some bits in here that can be set to hold different meanings. They, some things define caching and, and different information about the table. What we care about is the physical address of the translation table base address. And to do that, um, we need to figure out the bits uh, that were stored in that register for bits 31 through X. And if we look, the X is defined somewhere. They talk about it, but X is defined by, um, I think it's like 32 minus N or something like that. Um, uh, oh, X is 14 minus TTBCRN. And TTBCR, we checked was zero, and thus it is 14 minus zero, and thus it is 14. So that means the bits here that are set are bits 31 through 14, which are the top some bits, what, whatever. I don't know how many bits that is. Um, Python, if we do uh, one shift by 32 minus one, so that is basically all 32 bits. And then we mask off one shift by 14 minus one um, and invert that uh, and hex that, something like that, um, and actually put parens in the right spots, then we'll be able to see the mask that we need to use. And we might need to and it again because it's Python. But anyways, this is the mask to extract uh, that information from the address. And it's the same as not this, right? If we were to um, also do that, if we were to print not, uh, in this case, mask off the bottom bits, um, not this, uh, tilde, and 341234, we can see that it is the same value. So that's the way that I wrote it. Basically, um, we mask off the bottom 14 bits here. Um, and basically set them to zero, which then means that the TT, uh, the table, now contains the physical address of the translation table. We then pick a virtual address that we want to uh, use to remap physical memory. But what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to dynamically go and find that. So we're going to um, map in this table. And to map in this table, we need to... Uh, mm, Let's do this. Table is equal to unsafe uh, core slice from raw parts of table um, plus these, this config page offset. So we basically convert the physical address of the table into a virtual address, um, which looks kind of strange. Um, but on, uh, on this device, sum of physical memory is mapped in linearly into that config uh, page offset. So we basically compute the address, and then we're going to mark this as a, we'll say this is a mutable reference to U32s, and the size of it is um, 4,096 times um, size of a U32. So basically it contains, um, oh, it just has 4,096 because it's Rust. We can just do that. So now this will give us a Rust slice, so basically an array which references that table's memory and for all of the entries in it. So what we can do is go and find, uh, I'm going to return none from this right now, and we're going to go and make a fizz reader and just print that out. So we'll do fizz reader, um, fizz reader dot, um, oh, fizz mem, sorry. Uh, Fizz reader is the trait, so we'll say fizzmem.read fizz u32. We're going to read a u32 from memory, and we're going to read uh, this physical address, which that's a virtual address, but now it's a physical address, just due to that. Uh, basically, the config uh, page offset was a C followed by a bunch of zeros, so that's why we got rid of the C at the top. Unwrap or leet leet. That will indicate a failure if we fail to, and now we should be able to make run to run this on the device if we uh, get a lot of stuff fixed here. Fizz adder here. That is going to read that address, 449. Um, table is a fizz adder, so dot zero, and then cast that. And we've got a bunch of things we got to fix up here. Uh, not zero. Hmm. Hmm, 469. I'm just going to comment the rest of this out, and we'll add it back in when we figure out what we're supposed to do. Oh, um, this is supposed to, yeah, okay. Yeah, 
TTBCR, TTBCR. No, what? Yeah, TTBCR, TTBCR. We had some typos there. Okay, cool. Uh, not that it really matters. Wait. Oh, we basically, I, we like left this code basically completely unworking. <laughs> All right. So now, um, this should print leet. Uh, or reboot the device. I think we're still allocating a bunch of memory. Yeah, it rebooted. I don't know why it does that sometimes. Um, get root. Hmm. Maybe it's the uh, side effect because some things get written to memory uh, in the file operations, but whatever. We don't care about it too much. What's up with the huge viewer count today? This is just normal now. <laughs> this is this is what it what it's like normally. <laughs> um, is it fog or smoke in the background? It is fog or clouds forming. All right, webcam equals pog views. Yup. Yeah, and we're even going to the point of the night where we start losing viewers just due to time zones. We're getting to the quiet part of the night. Um. We popular, hell yeah. What are you making here? We're writing some code right now that's going to save all of physical memory from this kernel. So we're gonna go and read all of physical memory and save all of physical memory. Okay, so it returned delete, which is good. That means we failed. Um, and so this is gonna get an address to the table. And what I'm gonna do is, um, We'll just do uh, let mute free entry is none. So this is find a free entry in the table. So we're going to go through and walk this page table. And we're going to look for the first entry, which is unused. And we're going to determine if an entry is unused by looking at these bottom two bits. So if the bottom two bits are 0 and 0, um, then we know that that page table entry is currently not in use. So we're going to go and find the first entry not in use. So for, um, let's see, for ii um, entry in table.iter.enumerate. So go through each entry in the table. And then we're going to say if um, entry and three, which is getting the bottom three bits, if the bo or bottom two bits, if the bottom two bits are equal to zero, then free entry is equal to sum ii, and then break. Uh, and I probably can do that with an iterator better. EU gang all the way? Yeah, EU's just starting to probably wake up. So basically, this is the ne these next like four hours are the worst for viewership for me. Um, which kind of sucks because sometimes I, it can be demotivational to see the viewership go down because I like to be concerned that I'm doing something wrong. But in a lot of situations, it's literally just more of the world is asleep. Um, so, you gang, I should be sleeping. Yeah. Um, normal people go to sleep now at 2 a.m. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Okay. Get the address of the table and get a uh, slice to it. Then find a free entry in the table. How do I want to do this? Can I do this in a better way? Um, with an iterator? Can I do this with like a one line uh, cleaner way of doing this? Where I don't like assign the none? I do this property a lot uh, when I write Rust, but I'm pretty sure there's probably a better way for me to do that. I basically can iterate through the table and enumerate, and then I can, um, I guess, um, what do I want to do? I basically want to get the first occurrence of a sum, so I could do a map and then find dot map. A uh, find will filter. I'm guessing. Um, heh. I try to improve my coding sometimes, so I look at stuff like this. Because uh, I know there's... I typically have a hunch for when there's a better way. So there's a predicate. Searches for a thing, and then just returns the item. Can't I just do find? 
I can just do find. I don't need to do anything else. That's it. That will just work. Um, and then map if I want to get only the index out of it. So uh, table.iterate.enumerate dot find, find something where the value uh, and three is equal to zero. And I'm going to put this in parens because I like explicit um, parens on stuff like that. So that will give me um, a tuple. Uh, well, an option tuple. Oh, yeah. And then this will be if x dot one. And I can destructure that. I can do i, i. Uh, I can do index and entry here. Put some curly boys in here. And basically find the first thing. I need to remember this pattern. And that's why I like to practice stuff like this. Because um, these are really good things to uh, learn and get better at. Um, entry. And I might need to put a little refy boy on that or deref it. We'll just deref it here. So if the bottom two bits are equal to zero, then that entry is free. That is going to give us a tuple, which is an index and an entry. I'm not going to map it. We don't need to. Uh, Simul Simulius, thank you so much for the raid. Hell yeah. How is your stream? How are your people doing? Thank you so much for joining here. We're doing some low-level programming. We are using an Android exploit, so we wrote an exploit. We found an ex uh, we found a bug in the kernel, more specifically in a device driver. We then wrote an exploit for it. We've used that exploit to get arbitrary kernel execution that allows us to uh, get code running in the kernel, and we're using that code running in the kernel to... Um, we're using that code running in the kernel such that we can read all the physical memory and save a copy of the state of everything. So right now, what we're doing is making a mapper that allows us to map in uh, physical memory. So we're basically, right now, this code right here, uh, we got the root level page table, and then we um, get a slice to that, and then we find the first free entry in the virtual address space. So we're looking for an address which is unused, such that we can map in something there temporarily. We're going to delete this mapping um, at the end, because right now we're, we have interrupts disabled, we have kind of the system frozen, and we want to save the state of everything um, in that frozen state. Um, and... We can't just in grab all of physical memory by reading virtual memory. We have to map things in. And since we don't want to affect system state, uh, since we froze the system when we got execution, we want to know everything that happened. That's why we're not doing a function call into the kernel to use the mapping routines that the kernel traditionally has, uh, because we want to make sure that we understand all of the side effects that our code that's doing the snapshotting has such that we can undo them and then get the snapshot back to the actual state of the snapshot. Um, because our code, of course, is modifying stacks and affecting things, and we're going to want to restore those things back to how they were. So yeah, that's what we're doing. Um, maybe filter map. Ooh, there's a find map, IIRC. There is a find map. Uh, applies a function to the elements of the iterator and returns the first non-nun result. Oh. Oh. That's pretty cool. So I can do a find map and I can say, um, it's going to look a little different, but if the entry is uh, zero, then I can say some index um, else um, none, right? So that's going to find the first non-none entry, and we're going to return that index out, and that should now work, right? Nice. 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 <laughs> that looks pretty cool. Hell yeah. Oh, whoa. <laughs> I <laughs> literally moved my mouse and then clicked while moving the mouse <laughs> and then moved the screen. Sorry about that. Um... Hell yeah, what are the tabs uh, at the top of the Vim window? Oh, like these things? These, uh, that's my window manager. Yeah, DWM here. All right. Successfully pwned. Lol. Yep. Um, what font is this? This is some default font. Yeah, pro probably Terminus and without any aliasing on it. So it looks a little ugly, but I like ugly fonts. I think ugly fonts, or I like non-aliased fonts. Um, I like that each pixel is like its own unit and they don't like spill out into um, 
uh, like blurry areas around it. I don't know. I, I like how alias fonts look, but when I'm actually doing things and, and reading things quickly, I like the crisp uh, definition. No, aliasing is way better, don't at me. On a 4K, it's really nice. Aliasing on a 4K is just, you know, so good. Um, but this is a 1080p. Has a kind of retro feel to it, yeah. What a boomer. <laughs> Bitmap bombs are the best. Yeah, see? See? I love how there's actually a divide here. I don't know if that's stable yet, but you might be able to do boolean.then. What? What? We are on nightly. Um, thank you so much for that. Bool then. Whoa! That is seriously cool! I'm not gonna pull in a feature for that, but, um, yes, please? Dude, that's so cool! Um, ooh, boy, it's been... It's been staging for a while. Um... So... Ooh! What's going on here? Propo uh, final proposal... That sum, yep, using an and then there. Um... Ten days ago... They're less clear than an if statement, and they don't really save much typing. I, th I, I mean, I think it saves a decent amount of white space. It might, this might not make it. Um, um, hmm. We've agreed with the uh, the libs team today to stabilize uh, just then for now. Okay, so then is is gonna go in. Nice. Um, this feature is pretty dope. Yeah, like a spe like I understand what they're saying. It doesn't save much over an if. In terms of if you're just doing one if, but if you're chaining iterators and you're doing something deep, it's a huge reduction because that would end up being. Um, uh, I guess it's kind of weird here. Entry and three is equal to zero, then index, right? And I think that's really cool. Um, I don't like one-liner if statements, but in this case, I think it makes sense. It helps with fluent chaining. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah, you don't need to split blocks and, and do stuff like that, for sure. Um, you can now graduate to having a little cord on your glasses. Ooh, because I'm a boomer? You know, like the thing behind so my glasses don't fall off? Deep iterators are we doing AI? Uh, yeah, effectively. Speaking of chaining, have you seen postfix macros? I have not. Um, all right, so go through the table, find the first thing in the table that is unused, right? So that's gonna free index, we'll say free index, so it's clear what that is. Free index, and then we'll question mark that because this function returns an option, and thus, it's actually a free index. So it would return out uh, with a failure. So then, uh, we know the address, or virtual address, uh, compute the virtual address of the, um, compute the virtual address of the um, mapping we're going to create, and this is going to be the index shift by, Whatever the shift amount is, I think it's uh, 20. So we're gonna go to our arm arm. We're gonna look at what a an entry looks like for a section. It is 20, so we're gonna shift over um, that those bits by 20. And now that has created a virtual address, which we'll just say vert address um, index shift 20. And I think that's a, a free index. Okay. And, yep, that needs to be a U32. So now we have a virtual address. Oh, not interpreted as a shift. I think that's one of the few places where I need to explicitly paren and not mess up my parens there. Whoops. So now we get a virtual address. This is going to determine which address 
we use to access this entry in the table. Um, and now what we can do is map that in. So to map that in, um, actually, we're just going to go into our reader code now. Uh, we don't care about the alignment of any of this stuff. Um, we don't care about that. And we want to save off the old entry. So save off the old uh, table entry. Um, it's probably zero, but there's a chance that it's a clear entry where the bottom two bits are clear, but there's also some other stuff in use there. Uh, so we're just going to say um, let old entry is equal to um, table free index. So we're saving off the original value before we go and overwrite it. Um, and then here, we're just going to say uh, table free index is equal to meg or 3 shift 10 uh, or ob10. So what this is going to do is map in the physical address that was requested. So a user wants to read this physical address. Um, and since the user uh, wants to read that physical address, we determine the one megabyte alignment of that by masking off the bottom uh, bits there, the bottom 20 bits. And then we use that uh, as the physical address for this mapping. We then, um, or in 3 shift 10, which is going to map it as read writable. And then it's executable because we don't set the bit that says don't allow execution. Um, and then this makes it a section um, as a one megabyte section uh, with Arduix permissions, right? So now what we've done is we've mapped in the physical address that was requested here. And we're going through, the API here is you pass in a physical address that you want to read and then a buffer that will receive the data at that location. And this could read a gig of memory for all we know. So basically what we do is while there is memory to be read, so while there is data to be read, uh, we determine the uh, one meg aligned entry for that because these pages are one meg in size, so we have to align it to the nearest one meg page. We're basically finding the one meg page that contains the physical address that we want to read. We then map that entry in, and then we flush the TLBs. Uh, flush TLBs, we made a small little function... Um, somewhere, and this is uh, flush um, all TLBs on the device, right? So that's going to flush the translation um, uh, look-aside buffers, which are a cache of the virtual to physical mappings. And since we changed the mapping, we have to flush those TLBs. Now, technically in this case, since we are adding a mapping, I'm pretty sure we don't have to flush TLBs, but we're just doing it to be explicit. Then we get a slice. This is a, a one meg mapping of that section. We get the offset that the address specifies in that one meg region. We determine the number of bytes that remain in that region. We determine the number of bytes we want to read from that region, which is either the, the smaller of the two, the number of the bytes remaining in that region, or the buffer length, whichever is smallest. And then we actually read that memory from that section. Um, we advance the buffer pointer, and then we advance the um, and then we advance the um, uh, address pointer, and then we need to restore the old mapping, and we don't have to do that in the loop, so we'll move it outside of the loop, and now uh, we will restore the entry back, and I don't think I need to do volatiles here. Um, uh, I'm always pretty bad about knowing when volatiles are needed, but since we have the inline assembly, I think that has to occur prior, um, and the compiler is not able to optimize out that write to memory. So uh, we should be fine doing that, because um, this uh, that assembly is going to act as a compiler barrier. Um, so then we restore the entry back to what it was before, and then we flush the TLBs again, and we return out. And now this gives us a mechanism, um, once we do dot zero here, uh, to basically uh, map address. Oh, yes, this is now at virtual address. So find the first free entry in the table, compute the virtual address to that thing, uh, change the mapping of it to point to the physical memory we want to read, uh, get a slice into that section such that we can read the data, um, and then uh, compute the offsets, read the memory from there, 
and then advance these pointers. Um, nice, and then restore the old mapping at the end and flush the TLB. So this function is just going to go through and read physical memory, 481. This should be a dot zero. Okay, now flush TLB is an unsafe function. Um, I don't think this needs to be unsafe. There's nothing here that is unsafe. I don't think flushing TLBs uh, should be unsafe, so we'll make that a safe function. 476, um, from raw parts, mute, because we want this table to be mutable, and there we go. So now we have read the physical memory, so now we can use our APIs to read physical memory, and this should read uh, E59535C, and we did. Uh, I'm pretty confident that we did that correctly. So, yeah. Um, oh, like option unwrap or bang? No, I've never seen that. What does that do? Um, I wish I understood this. It seems really interesting. What, what do you not understand? We can try and get people up to speed. Um, obviously, there's a lot of low-level knowledge that's needed to do a, a lot of this stuff. But hey, if we, can, if we can get some of it explained, that's awesome. What kind of APIs are available to make all these reads and writes in memory? Um, we're, um, uh, usually the kernel or whatever doesn't allow unrestricted memory access. Oh, it does. The kernel definitely does. Um, yeah, we don't have any restrictions because we're running as kernel. Yep. Yeah, we can just read and write whatever we want in this state. Okay. I almost want to add something to my vimrc to highlight trailing spaces. Um, I don't know if there's a good uh, command for that. Okay, so now we can map in this memory. The only thing, the only thing that we require that we can access through the uh, config page offset is the TTBR. So we basically um, assume that we are able to read this uh, page offset um, for the page table, that the page table exists um, in the uh, memory here, and we should be able to do that. That looks good. Um, technically, we could like bounds check that, but we don't actually concretely know the bounds of what memory is linearly mapped into the kernel. So it's kind of weird. TLB, yeah, translation, look aside buffer. Um, is a function unsafe uh, only if it returns an unsafe result? No, uh, it's unsafe if it does something that could uh, basically, if it does... If it does undefined, well, not undefined behavior. If it, something is unsafe if um, it can produce undefined behavior or behave incorrectly depending on the inputs to it. So in this case, this function's not really unsafe because it's not modifying anything. It's flushing those tables, but nothing in here is gonna modify registers or memory uh, or access something it's not supposed to or deref something directly. Um, set list chars to set, uh, uh, okay, let me see that, uh, set list chars, um, highlight unwanted spaces, highlighting with the search, yep, uh, list chars, um, so what is this? that for each tab and that for each EOL. Does it just by default have that configuration? Um, hmm, looks like I have to set some things there. Um, can be used to customize it. The default display is that for each tab and dollar for each EOL. So trailing white space can be seen. Um, hmm. Yeah, what's, uh, what am I missing here? Shows how to use list chars. 
Do I need to set list? There we go. Okay. Um, I see. So that basically puts a dollar at the end of the line. Um, let's, let's try, let's try exactly what Desu is saying. If I can paste. Yikes. Come on. There we go. Um, What's the arrow? Is it this? What's the arrow supposed to be? Oh, um, that. Okay. So basically, um, it works for tabs, it works for spaces. That seems pretty simple. Basically, uh, tab, List characters tab to the end of the line. That looks pretty good. Like, I, I think I'm, I'm fine with this, where it's just tildes at the end. Okay. Yeah, so like there I can see uh, dead white space, right? Um, I love how a lot of people actually have this. So the first pass is going to take some time to clean it out. Um, I mean, technically we can just go, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> percent as uh, one or more white space to new line replace with nothing. Yeah. Okay. All right. Nice. Can you set the background color? There there probably is a way. That would actually be nice if it's like red, highlighted in red or something like that. Um, so how does that work on white spaces? I don't know like how it works on white spaces when I only see it saying tab, right? And let's see. I've done this too many times on my day job, too many times. Tab is literal tab character, okay. But it works for white space. Is it this space? So like, I, I'm just curious what the syntax means. I'm trying to interpret this. Like, comma trail, this is like another argument which is basically setting that trail. Highlight white spaces with a red background. Uh, okay, okay. Where'd that open? Here. Oh, yeah, mm, no, mm, mm too much, too much. If I can't memorize it, it's not gonna work. Um, <laughs> if I can't memorize it and type it in one line, it's not worth it, in my opinion. What music do you listen to? Pretty much everything. Uh, typically, like, I like punk pop is probably my my most common type of music. All right, oh, all right. So now we have a way to read physical memory, and this is um, a kernel, a uh, kern, a uh, kernel level physical memory reader, which um, allows for uh, reading, um, which uh, maps an unused one megabyte region in a virtual address space um, to read the physical memory in chunks. Okay. Um, so that's the trait. Snapshot device. And now we can just make this stuff work, I think. So this looks good. All of this code looks clean. Um, we're pretty good on unsafe. I think we're, we're careful with the unsafe that we use. Can you explain how this is working? Uh, do you have a root kit or root access? We have an exploit. Um, oh, H list chars. Uh, okay. So what did we do? Tab colon 
Um, an arrow to a slash with a space. I don't know if that space is required. Um, um, yeah, this might be too complex for me to figure out. Character to show for trailing spaces. When emitted, trailing spaces are blank. Overrides the space setting, okay. Um, oh, nice. Do they literally tell you? This. Right there. This is what I like, because this is default. It literally just is, it's already there. And this, it won't do tildes, but it'll have the same effect, and that I can easily set up on a machine without internet access or without access to my VimRC, because it's obviously just right there. So, um, I'm gonna use that because it's default, um, and that's important to me. <laughs> if that makes any sense. Um, but yes, uh, uh, Gilak, yes, we have, uh, we have an exploit that we use on an Android phone that gets us arbitrary kernel execution. Um, and then that arbitrary kernel execution allows us to do whatever we want in the kernel. Um, okay, determine the total size of physical memory. Um, validate all ranges are 4K aligned. Memory size. Um, so this is what's actually doing the snapshot. So we go through all of the regions of memory. Uh, and now we can do everything. Now we can actually, now we can map in all of memory. Um, so let's cat uh, ADB shell. The phone's rebooting right now because it crashed. I'll try and put it in a place that hopefully you can see it. Um, actually, like maybe up here. Just so you can see if the screen, if the screen goes blank um, and basically you can probably see if we end up panicking the phone so you can see uh, when that happens. So we're going to ADB shell, uh, cat proc, IOMEM, and all we care about are these RAM regions. So 0 through 13F. 20 through 29 F and 2A through 3 F. Um, that looks good. And so we're gonna go through and determine the length of, or the size of memory in bytes. Um, uh, in bytes. Validate all of the ranges are four kilobyte aligned. And to do this, we're gonna do an end saturating sub plus one. We're gonna uh, make sure that it starts on a 4K aligned address and that the size is, um, uh, non-zero, and that the size is also 4K aligned. So everything's 4K aligned, and it the page is, or the region actually has data in it. Determine the total number of pages. That will evenly divide. We know that because everything will sum up to be page aligned. We then map in the page skip bitmap, which we allocate from user space. Um, so the page skip bitmap is something that we map in in user space and then pass to this um, to kind of let it know uh, basically, let it know um, the state of everything there. Um, and then here, make sure we have enough bits in the page skip bitmap to hold the bitmap. So um, make sure that there's a, there are enough bits to indicate which pages are and are not in the snapshot. And that basically has to exceed the length of the bitmap in bytes times 8, which is in bits. Um, if it exceeds that, then we return an error. Then we go through all of the physical memory. Okay, so this should only be used in like one place now, which is here. Um, basically, any other place we use this, we want to use read fizz. So um, that's going to slice the page. And what we'll do is we will, um, I guess we can just read fizz that. Um. Whatever works better, uh, probably miss. Uh, is it safe to call this function from user space? Will it sig trap? Uh, which function? This one? Um, I, th this function's unsafe. Um, oh yeah, this one. This one's not very safe to call from user space. Um, it would. It this one would definitely fail. Um, but I'm not really gonna mark that unsafe. So I'm. I'm fine with that being safe. Um, let's see here. Snapshot device. Uh, determine if we can skip this. Oh, uh, we need to go up here. Go through each region, convert it to a, uh, this is, 
um, read the page. Let me page uh, OU8-4096. Hopefully, I have 4K of stack space. Um, I might not. Fizzmem.readfizz. Um, and then a fizz adder, which is the page. Um, so go through each page in this region, read that page into, oh, we uh, aliased um, data. Okay. Then check if the page is equal to our fill pattern. And if it is, then update the bitmap to indicate um, whether or not that bit or uh, that page will be skipped and then increment the page ID counter. Okay. Uh, make just making sure this builds it will not uh, 551 um, this is an as u32 um, expected a slice and this is a uh, data okay so that's going to read that memory and then we'll put a question mark on that um, I really wish rust had an unwrap or return I really do like, that would be so nice to have. Um, and unfortunately, there's not a good way to do that. And here I thought I was good at programming, and then I see this, and we're just chilling, we're having fun. Everyone, like, everyone's coding looks impressive uh, uh, when they're, like, in a groove. And we're in a groove right now, so... This isn't how it always is for me, for sure. <coughs> okay. So, <laughs> damn. Um, that's what postfix macros are for? Ooh. I see. It's not there yet. Okay. Yeah, because this is really annoying. Um, if... This is none. Uh, return bang zero, right? So if we failed to read that memory, then return not zero. Okay. Then get the pmem buffer. So that's getting the buffer to all of the storage that we have. Uh, pmem buff pages. That should be in pages. Yep. So we cast that. We get a mutable reference to that. Um... We make a pointer, and then this is where we serialize out all of memory. So we determine whether or not we're going to skip the page, and then uh, we just need to read the memory here. So read the page here. Make sure we have room for this. So we'll uh, basically uh, read this page. This is page address. So if uh, we're going to read that page into data, so all 4K, and then PMM pointer, we're gonna see if we have room for that data in the output. And I think here we can just say page. Um, so read the page into here, uh, get room in our serialization buffer, um, and then serialize out the page address and then the contents of the page, and then advance the serialization pointer, uh, and at that point, we know that that cannot panic. Then here, uh, do the same thing. If we skip the page, just indicate that that page has been skipped by setting the bottom bit, serialize that out, and then advance the serialization pointer, update the page ID, and then from this function, we are going to return the uh, basically the number of bytes that were serialized. So return number of bytes serialized. Okay. So this should only be used in that one spot now. Okay. And that means we're going through our helper to read physical memory when we need to. And then we can go and um, mlock all uh, buff pages. So this is going to allocate those pages. In this case, we're going to allocate uh, 512 megs. That's probably good enough. Yeah, allocate 512 megs in that buffer. Fill it in with our fill pattern. Store the pointer to this buffer in a global. Um, create the page skip bitmap. 
by storing that in a global, and then we just leak that one out. That's just, we're allocating stuff for the kernel there. Um, this is invoke the uh, snapshot uh, kernel routine, and then we get the kret, and then we're going to panic, um, and that's just going to kret, oh, uh, 593, I knew that was coming. Um, um, okay, make run, so hopefully it doesn't panic the phone. We're going to install our implant, there we go. Um, then we're going to get our, it's going to take a while to allocate that memory. I could maybe add some more prints here. Let's do that. Um, let's add some more prints. And I'm going to get rid of our translate, because we're not translating any addresses here anymore. So we'll say, um, print, uh, print, uh, got root. We're going to assert that, um, unsafe get uid is equal to zero, uh, failed to get root, right? So, um, failed to get root, got root, uh, print, uh, locked, uh, all current and future memory into RAM. So that's going to make sure that the memory is going to get, uh, forced into physical memory. Um, and we'll say uh, failed to mlock all uh, memory. So we got root, we print that in, uh, print um, allocated uh, user pmem buff. And then here we can say uh, filled, filled this uh, with the fill pattern. Um, and we'll just put this after here. I'm fine with this in this spot. Um, create the page skip bitmap. Sorry, chat. I'll, I'll catch up with y'all in a minute. Um, print created a page skip bitmap. Um, and then this is um, executed snapshots. Uh, kernel returned this. And then uh, get the register state, which was saved in the trampoline data. And we basically cast that and read that. Uh, print the registers, we don't need to do that. Get a slice to the serialized bytes. So we'll take the data as pointer as a, a const u8, and we will slice that up. Um, and then write out the serialized bytes to snapshot.faultcore, write out all the registers as a little Indian first, and then the pmem serialized data. Here we go. Um, 417, that doesn't have to be mute. Okay, so filled out with the fill pattern, created the skip bitmap, and now it's actually doing the snapshot. Kernel returned this. So the kernel snapshotted um, 337 megs or so. Uh, of stuff, and then uh, it's saving that out to a file. So basically, this takes a long time due to uh, saving that out to a file. But yeah, that looks pretty good. Uh, I'm going to hit the head and refill my water. Uh, actually, I'm going to ADB pull this down. So I'm going to wait for this to finish, and then I'll pull down the, the snapshot. OK. And then I'll catch up on chat. I just have to, come on. This file system is so slow, or the, whatever it is, Flash, or, um, I don't even know what they use on this. Maybe I could throw in an SD card, and I would get some, uh, faster write speeds. I don't know. But yeah, so that snapshot should now work. Does that make sense? Um, I actually really like this. I think this is a clean snapshot, and now we have all of physical memory in here, which is fantastic. Fantastic. Um, ADB pull, uh, data local temp, a snapshot dot fault core to here. Okay, I'll be right back.
All right. You know, that candle is in a dangerous spot where it's right where I typically keep my water, and it it looks pretty delicious. <laughs> I might take a gulp of that wax. Um, all right, let me catch up on chat here. That's still pulling down. Damn. Um, obviously, I don't have the skills due to the lack of monitors in my setup. Oh, man. <laughs> See? Uh, it's Rust. Yeah, this is Rust here. Okay. The humbleness is pretty great. I, I'm not amazing at it. I try. I try my best. Get it? Get it? Get it? <laughs> um, you should make an Amazon affiliate referral link to your monitors. You'll make bank. Um, let's see here. Looks like Klingon to me. All right, you have angered the crab. I don't know what sound crabs make. I don't know what that sound was. <laughs> I have no idea what sound I just made there. Um, okay. I'm so confused. What is the goal to basically um, uh, to maximize prints? Um, the goal is that we can uh, take a snapshot of all of the memory and register state on this device. And we just did it. Chat. Chat? I don't know if you realize, but we just did it. That may have been the goal, but the goal has been mission accomplished. Okay. Um, and before Gamosa kills the flash on his phone due to too many rights, I think I read that earlier, but yes. Yes, I could see that happen. Um, right now, the goal is uh, to snapshot the device and get it into QMU, right? Yeah, pretty much. Um, uh, to find more Android, uh, to find more bugs in Android. To do this, we want to snapshot the physical memory of the phone. Yeah. Let's see here. We already have root. Are we going for a remote root next? Nah, there's no reason. Um. I love watching hacking streams like this. So detailed and so technical. I would love doing this, but I don't have the brains. So the the brains aren't required. It's experience and practice and enjoying it. Um, and I think a lot more people are capable of doing this than, than already do this. Um, definitely a lot of practice. Intuition plays a huge role. Yeah, but intuition comes from practice. Oh, people already said this shit in chat. People already have responded to the things that I'm responding to in the same way I'm responding to them. I'm glad we've got a good little echo chamber going here. <laughs> what sounds do crabs make? How the fuck is that already that far up in chat? You guys are so active today. I love it. I love it. I thought the candle was tea when you first brought it on stream. <laughs> it's a self-warming tea. They actually make those like little things you can put a tea on. I guess that's what a tea light candle is. <laughs> Sometimes I say the dumbest shit. <laughs> Oh my god. Um <laughs> Um I was waiting for that crab rave. Oh hell yeah. Oh wait, is this the crab rave video? Is that is that what you actually just sent me? I don't know what I don't know what browser window it popped open in. But it, it popped open somewhere. Uh, someone clipped that? Oh, the crab dance. <laughs> oh, yeah, so, um, by the way, chat, chat, I am looking for, uh, potentially people who are willing or interested in submitting clips, making clips, editing clips together, rating and sorting clips and doing all of that stuff so we could make, like, a highlight channel or... Something along that sorts. I can I can go get a cloud node and I can put the raw footage that I record at my local recording quality. I can put those up. I don't like I don't care about distribution of this stuff. I'm not trying to make money off this. So I'm totally fine to put that content up in a place where you can get the raw footage and edit it down and clip it and do all sorts of things. Um so if that's a thing that interests people, um, there's kind of tears to that, right? We, we need people who are watching either the whole things or parts of things or enough people watching that we can have 
a good use of clips um, and a good selection of clips to pick from. And then editing them together, it's probably as simple as just splicing them together. Obviously, it would be amazing uh, if I could find an editor who would like do the YouTube Twitch clip sort of things or like they'll zoom in on a face or like do dramatic timing things. Um, but I recognize that takes a lot of work. Um, but I'm also willing to pay for stuff like that. Um, I don't know what cost I can really afford uh, since I don't really make money from this. Um, but I probably could find a, a fair, fair wage for editing stuff like this. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, goal is to get stuff. Duff. My wife, my wife gets um, the same at garage sales. Oh, interesting. I didn't see uh, the start of that conversation. Um, you could have Rick rolled us, but you did good. Yeah, see, the mods here are good and well-behaved. Because um, you're so sexy being excited. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. <laughs> um, I'll leave hack into the pros. I still prefer my RF brain weight. See, RF stuff is fucking hard, man. Makes you wonder what percentage of programmers uh, who'd redirect people uh, to Google after any type of question. Um, most? <laughs> Many? Uh, let's see. Force the Android kernel to run your code by tormenting it with bad puns until it submits. Yeah, I don't, we don't, we, we don't do bad puns here. We just do puns, right? Right? Um, I wish more people found you. I know I wish I did sooner. Well, we didn't have this production quality and I didn't have the same chat interaction. Honestly, um... I, I really like these viewership numbers, not because they're bigger than I'm, I traditionally have, um, but because in the 200 viewer ballpark, there is typically a conversation happening in chat. In the like 50 to 100 that I'm used to, it's pretty easy to go 15 minutes without a single thing said in chat. And if nothing's said in chat, I can't engage chat. And if I don't engage with chat, then it's not as pleasant of a viewing experience. And then... It, it just kind of snowballs from there. So I, I seriously think we're, we're on a, a pretty good track to just grow and expand and do a bunch of stuff here. So, um, yeah, it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. Uh, I need to know what coffee this guy drinks. I don't drink coffee. I don't do any caffeine. I don't do sodas. I don't do tea. I don't do coffee. I don't do monster energy drinks. Um, not my cup of tea. <laughs> um, paying monitors, we know you have a closet full of them. Well, these three monitors, so basically I'm planning to get another six monitor set up for here. Um, I just wish I had a better setup here. So, um, I don't like that these monitors are just kind of random sizes and different elevations and it makes it kind of confusing. This is a 4K that I have set to 1080p because 4K just sucks and nothing works on it. Um, so the resolution looks shitty and it's like blurry. Um, so I plan to just replace all these monitors. I'm going to do probably 1080p 144s, maybe 1200 or 1440p. I don't really care. The main issue is I don't want to have uh, scaling problems. I don't want the uh, font to be alleged in... Unreadable. <laughs> um, I don't want the font to be unreadable. Um, basically, when I when I have everything at normal scaling, so it's called in. It's called the zone. You're so motivated and calm while coding. How is that possible? I just love it. I love it. He's in the matrix. We're all in the matrix. <laughs> um, actually, writing a ch Twitch chat slash clip bot in rust actually sounds like a cool project to learn rust i might do that yeah i think like you could probably do some pretty basic ai like teal like pull things down that already exist to basically sense excitement through like voice like if you were to process this video you could probably sense like 
when my voice peaks, when I'm excited, when I'm sad, when I'm ranting, when I'm engaging with chat. Obviously, the frequency of chat talking, I think, would be pretty cool. So, like, I don't know if that's the way you were going with that when you said uh, chat slash clip bot, but I'm pretty sure you could automate, like, a, a large amount of the initial rough granularity filtering of that. Um... I want what this guy has. This is your brain on programming. Correction, 4K sucks on Linux. It, suck, it sucks everywhere. It sucks on Windows. It's, it's best on OS X, but I'm not going to run OS X because I don't hate myself. 4K is for people under 30. I am under 30. Damn it. You fucks. Damn it, Chet. Why are you so mean? <laughs> I like 25-inch 1440 with 1080 scaling. Yeah, so I'm, I, I really like these monitors. These are 1200Ps. Now, here's the problem. If I don't have 1080p monitors here, streaming sucks. Because 1080p, if you, if you have Twitch, if you have 4K, if you have 1440, if you have 1200, and you watch a 1080p stream, you can have it perfectly one-to-one -one. it you're gonna have a little bit of letterboxing just a, a tiny amount on 4k you can get scaling you can get uh, uh perfect scaling but if i have 1200p here and i stream 1200p and you watch on a 1080p it's going to be blurry now obviously most people here are probably not watching full screen but i like that when i full screen my videos on youtube on a 1080p monitor the pixels are pixel perfect right they're crisp there's no blurriness there's no interpolation uh, it looks really clean so i'm tempted to just use only 1080p's on machines that i plan to stream from so um <laughs> yeah kind of weird or emotes used in a short window of time. Or people could just clip things more. But, you know, you lazy shits. <laughs> uh, more screens than mission control. Hell yeah. Uh, use the microphone to key log. Yep. Yep. Get all the passwords that I don't type on this machine because I only use it for streaming. Um, <laughs> everything on this is a throwaway random password. Um... OS X is so cool, you can um, remove it and install Linux. Yeah. Yes, you can. <laughs> uh, what OS are you running, mate? Uh, I'm running Gentoo here. Um, has anyone found a way to connect two monitors with different DPIs on a Linux desktop and have broke? <laughs> Look at this guy. He thinks he can get multi-monitor different DPI scaling support on Linux. <laughs> ah, no. No. WoW password, you typed it yesterday? I didn't. My WoW auto logs in. Um... Don't blame me for no clips. Mobile is a pain in the ass to clip. Oh, damn. Did he add pen to overlay? I don't know what pen to is, but no. Um, I wonder if it's actually viable to get passwords from key sounds. Absolutely, yes. It's done. It's been proven multiple times. There are papers. There are examples of it. There's code that does it. it yes, 100%. That's why I don't type passwords on this keyboard. <laughs> like... When I stream, I make sure that everything is auto login. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, like you know the sound every key makes. Well, that you can pretty easily correlate. But yeah, now with the quality of audio that's coming through stream, it's gonna be not as good. But the YouTube video I upload is probably close enough. Uh, it's probably good enough. Um, ever thought about being a stand-up comedian? I, I haven't. People have said that multiple days in a row now. Uh, what? What? Why? I didn't think I was that convincing with my shitty delivery. But, but somehow it works. People like me. It's weird. 
I don't know where I'm gonna go rant about fucking programming languages. I'm sure I could find some weird underground bunker by, uh, in, in Seattle by Microsoft or Amazon where a bunch of nerds hang out and get that nerd audience. Um, it's a popular thing for a streamer to have a background in? Really? Shit, I didn't know that. Yeah, world is insane. Um, or, 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 we have the other perspective, which is that it might have not been a compliment by the number one contender. It could have been an insult of, dude, holy shit, can you do some stand-up so you can get some fucking comedic timing and skills? And that, that could be the negative way of viewing that comment. So you know what? Could, could be dangerous there. Stand-up comedians for nerds, please. <laughs> Jokes for nerds. Oh, man. Um, I would say that's why I use my fingerprint, uh, but that's as un unsecure as anything. Yeah. Yeah, I think, like, facial recognition right now is probably the best biometric. Obviously, multi-factor. But, yeah. Uh, palm readers are pretty good, too. It's pretty easy to get a fingerprint off a phone. It's pretty hard to get a palm print off anywhere. Like, where would you have a palm print except for, like, on your bed frame? You know, where, you know, Titanic style. Um, I think that, that, was that a bed frame or a wall? I don't fucking remember. Um, pen to overlay is for pen testers. Yeah, I don't want that. I'm not, I'm not a pen tester. <laughs> Rosie Palmer, your mouse. Yeah, I, I don't, I mean, my mouse is matte. And, like, it's just covered in gamer gunk anyways. Like, you could lift, like, Doritos off of it and, like, make a Dorito. Um, but that's about it. I'm kidding, I actually don't eat Doritos. I don't actually eat junk food, except for Pop-Tarts. Um, well, you have such a long lifeline on your palm. Uh, is that good or bad? Does that mean I will live long, or does it mean that that the 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 line is going to kill me? Um, I've actually like meme read people's poems. It's kind of funny. <laughs> what are we gonna do with the ram snatch, na snapshot feed it in the cumu? Are you trying to get me to disengage with talking with chat? Gamer gun kill <laughs> uh, We need to have a a pun print authentication. That's that's only going to work for dads and people over 40. Like, and that's the inverse of the audience on computers. So I don't think that's a good thing. What's your name? Brandon Falk. The Falk. Do you upload your code somewhere? Yeah, on, uh, I have a GitHub where I have some stuff. Um, you can also get some of, the, some of the danker code on my OnlyFans. Um, that's you. <laughs> I take offense to that. <laughs> Only fans fuck. <laughs> Only fans. <laughs> Are you Brazilian? X64, 65? No. Who does the case? Is that Brazil? Fuck. Uh, Korean? Shit, you found me? Really? <laughs> Gamozo bath water when? I'd have to take a bath. Yeah, Brazil does. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I'm Brazilian. Hell yeah. Uh, I don't... I, I, basically, every time someone tells me they're from Brazil, I ask if they play tibia. It's a little racist, but also, typically people are familiar with tibia, and it's a way that I can bond with people because no one in the U.S. plays tibia. <laughs> it's, it's Polish people, Brazilians, sometimes some Scandinavians. You, <laughs> you, you, you. <laughs> Uh, way to propagate stereotypes on nerd hygiene. I mean, is it a stereotype if it's accurate? <laughs> it, 
If it's a requirement to getting a job, is it a stereotype? I've never heard about Tibia before you showed it on stream. Yeah, exactly, right? But in its peak, it had like 100,000 concurrent players. Um, but yeah, uh, really popular in uh, Poland, Brazil, and Mexico. So most conversations in Tibia start off with BR question mark or MX question mark or PL question mark. Maybe you get the occasional SWE question mark, SWE. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it was actually great. Um, I was learning Spanish at the time. So uh, communicating in uh, Spanish with a lot of people was really, really useful, especially for picking up on slang. Um... There used to be a decent amount of Canadians when it first came out, but I never played it for very long. Interesting. In Poland, we got a meme with Tibia because uh, some kiddo beat his mom with a chair because she disconnected his PC. <laughs> yeah. Isn't Tibia a bone? Yes, it is. Um, Tibia seems like it would be a Korean, Poland, Ukraine, Russia game. Honestly, I don't know if I've ever met a Russian or other, like... Eastern, um, I guess, is Poland Eastern Europe? Techn like, I, I think I would consider it as that, but I don't know what, what the nomenclature is there. Um, but yeah, Sipsoft, yeah, they're a German company. It started in Germany. Um, okay, it's OST block. Interesting. I also don't think I've any, ever seen, uh, like, Asians in Tibia either. I've, I've never seen Chinese, Korean, um, like, Japanese. Never seen it. Do you have a, uh, a large Brazilian audience? Yes, I do, actually. There's a decent amount of Brazilians that stop by. Um, I think computer security is really popular in Brazil. I have a few uh, Brazilian coworkers who, like, basically moved here to do security research. It's... I don't know why, but it seems to be popular in Brazil to an interesting, uh, to a, to a larger degree than the standard distribution of Brazilians in the U.S. I encounter them in security. Um, so it just seems, it seems to be popular for some reason. I don't know why. Uh, yeah, we love it. Absolutely. It's awesome. Um, on an unrelated note, what's your keyboard? It's a DOS keyboard, uh, with extra gamer gunk. Um, there's also that hacker family in Brazil, forgot, forgot their surname, interesting. We love problems, yeah. Got the same with Argentinians, huh. Meanwhile in Portugal, we don't care about security. Honestly, Portugal is, huh, what's the population of Portugal? I feel like, uh, I don't see much, like, Portuguese or just people who are from Portugal, in, in like, in general. Um, <laughs> fuck dink is good on only fans. Yeah, see, that's a great clip. Perfect. Hell yeah, thank you, Red Warhammer. Um, <laughs> I thought Tibia was a very niche musical instrument uh, for the last five minutes. Oh, no, it's a, it's a video game. Yeah, it's a, a 2D uh, uh, RPG, MMORPG. Turkey, what is security? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Portugal is honorary Eastern Europe at this point? Really? Really? I've never heard that comparison. Who's, what is, um, what's like the election process like there? I know Spain always has some weird shit going on with elections. I mean, not that the U.S. is any better. <laughs> Woo! Um. <laughs> In Portugal, all we care about uh, is voting people than blaming the government. Ooh. Yeah. I mean, isn't that just the, the democratic way? <laughs> is always just complain about uh, the government that you elected? Because, like, everyone's too afraid for radical change, but they're also, like, too comfortable with, with, um, like, everyone wants a little bit of change, but not too much. Just a, just a, 
just the right amount. <laughs> um, it's a joke, I think. Every time stat maps come up. Oh, interesting. It's in a line with the Eastern European countries. I'm still waiting on an answer to my issue on Tibia 11 beta. What's the, what's the, what's the question? I didn't see it. Sorry. We've got a pretty active chat going. Um, <laughs> in Spain, there's no democracy. Is that like a meme of like our democratic system sucks in Spain? Or is that like literally there's not a democracy? Because I'm pretty sure there's a democracy, right? Blank keycaps? Hell yeah. Plus 1,000 hacker cred. You know why I have blank keycaps? We'll let, we'll let chat think about that while I refill my water because I just chugged that. Blank keycaps so there's no meta key on Linux. Blank keycaps to test real computer users. You know what the actual answer is? The non-blank keycap keyboard was out of stock when I purchased it. So I just bought the blank one. That's it. But I have been very surprised how many people cannot use a fucking keyboard. When I've had people over and they're like driving on the keyboard... And there are so many people who can't use a keyboard without looking at it. It's crazy. It's crazy to me. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, blank keycap so you can secret secretly switch to Dvorak and no one would notice. I used Dvorak back in the day, back in uh, high school. That's what I used. And then I switched away from it because it just was a pain in the ass to set up every single time. I wanted to use a, a computer or like reinstall a VM. It was just, it was just annoying. Um, I actually bought that exact same keyboard just so no one would use my computer. Interesting. DAS keyboard uh, doesn't use the Windows logo. It does. It does. But you can get alternative keycaps to it. At least the DAS keyboard that I have over here has a Windows key on it. And that was like an original, uh, like Mark 1 one. I don't know if they changed it. Um... The only thing making me stay on Windows is I hate gaming on Linux. Bad experience with NVIDIA drivers. It's gotten a lot better, uh, but yeah, it's still not perfect, for sure. Um, let's see. Blank keycaps because of excessive game gunk. Oh, man. Let's see. I have an exam on MIPS assembly tomorrow. I'm scared. Why are you scared? What don't you understand about MIPS assembly? What what are what are you getting quizzed on? Mechanical keyboard buying experiences in a nutshell. I bought this because it was in stock. Yeah. 
There are some really nice mechanical keyboards out now, but back when I got this keyboard back in like 2010, maybe 2009, it was really hard to find mechanical keyboards. Like now you can go and buy a billion different mechanical keyboards. But back when uh, back when I bought this, there weren't that many options for mechanical keyboards. Um, so, personally, I would like a keyboard where it doesn't have, um, like, basically where the keys are floating above, like, the baseline. Because this just is a crumb tray, right? This builds up a lot of debris. Uh, so having the keys, like, where you can get to under them or, like, basically flip the keyboard on its side and things just slide out. Uh, would make it a lot easier to clean. So, um, hell yeah. The recent NVIDIA drivers from a month ago really helped my Linux gaming, though I still have uh, to lock clock speed to avoid a crash. Interesting. Yeah, I haven't had any problems on, on Linux. I play WoW on it. Um, I do some Xenotic. I uh, play a couple games like randomly off Steam that have Linux support. Uh, I've had no problems. Converting C code into MIPS, then into binary and hex. It's not too bad. I just don't have much experience with it. Yeah, interesting. Do you get a cheat sheet or something to go with that? What switch on the keyboard? Cherry MX Blues. You should check out the George Foreman key. It's a, it's a grill. That's a grill. I'm just going to burn myself. What are, what are you trying to do to me, Private Orange? Private assassin, more like. Jeez, dude. <laughs> I'll check it out. <laughs> I'm assuming they actually exist. I don't think you're trolling me. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. I wish Leopold had a USB-C connection. Oh, we're still in stock. I haven't heard of that brand yet. My OCD won't allow for crumbs. Yeah, that's one of the reasons I want to get monitor stands for all these, because it's very hard to clean this desk, because the stands are just so clunky. Having a monitor stand and kind of elevating everything off the table makes it so you can kind of easily clean everything. Easy cleaning grill keyboard. Um, I need to... Uh, I need to get used to other keyboard layouts. The German one is so annoying for coding. Interesting. Is it just like layouts of special characters? Leopolds are like giga high quality pre-builds. Ooh. Huh. What's your favorite keyboard layout? QWERTY, of course. <laughs> it's, it's the natural keyboard. It's what everything defaults to, so it's the best one. Back in uni, we had to uh, hex dump an assembly listing with random blanks. and We had to fill it in with an exam. What? That's crazy. I'm kind of surprised. That That's an interesting class. The German Quartz layout is shite. Huh. Not QWERTY, my dude. The locale, I think. Um, Like, different languages have uh, different uh, layouts. Yeah, there's like Azurdy, QWERTY, Quartz. Dvor well, Dvorak is not uh, in the QWERTY thing. Most languages have an option for QWERTY. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of the de facto standard. German is quartz only, stupid. The Germans are just too afraid to change, man. Too afraid. All right. Um so what did we do? We oh, we did it. We 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 successed. I think I think we literally did it. Um, so what are we currently doing? So this tool allows us to uh, translate. So this allows us to translate a virtual address. And what we have is a quick little trick here where we get the TTBR0 and the TTBCR and we do a translation of every 4K address that possibly can exist. We could walk the page table, but as we mentioned the other day, it's a 32-bit address space. We can just walk through it so fast like this that there's no reason for us to really uh, implement that correctly. And then, um, here we go. So this is going to basically print the mappings. Uh, we can get rid of that print. And we just have that now. And this is going to print the virtual memory to physical memory layout uh, for this device. So this is going to show uh, what every virtual address maps to. And this now is a complete map. This will have everything. We have all of physical memory dumped, unless they somehow use MMIO as part of a page table. Um, this has everything in it, which is really cool. So 
<laughs> the German key keyboard layout has an extra key, an extra layer key for keys you rarely use, like curly brace, <laughs> curly braces and square brackets. Aha, yes, rare. Uh, killed some Google Drive presentations uh, without internet that way. Uh, oh, the German ad key on uh, Windows quits the app on Mac? Oh, Alt GR plus Q. Ugh. It's so fucking stupid. You Germans, what are you doing? Don't you know how to engineer things? Isn't that the meme that you know how to engineer stuff? What are you doing over there? <sighs> Get your shit in order. <laughs> um, all right. Let me just break my fingers twice for every a blocker. Oh, show me the codes. Yeah, I wasn't, didn't have that. <laughs> Sorry. See, that's what we get when we're trying to learn production value, but we still suck at it. Um, but anyways, basically, it works okay, because we didn't really do anything. We just hit up arrow. But we have this where it goes through each 4K page in all of the 32-bit adder space, calls the translate routine, which will then use the TTBR0 as the root table, the TTBCR as the control register, and then the virtual address as the virtual address. That will return a physical address, and then we just print out the virtual to physical mapping. And now, that will go through and just print out all of the mappings. Why did we do that? Honestly, uh, no reason. Like, there's honestly not a huge reason for us to do that. Um, <laughs> so, but we did it. Um, actually, we used it yesterday to debug some of our mappings and what was used in the tables. Uh, but, uh, we have the information we need now. So, now we are able to basically see the layout of all virtual memory. So this includes user space and kernel space and all of these things. And if I were to write a tool that, um, uh, if I were to write something that let me map in, hmm. I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think if there's something quick and and quirky and, and silly that I could do here. Um, so we can see everything that's mapped in here, which is really cool. Um, and here is the mapping that we make, right? This is the first address, so that is the mapping that we created. Obviously, we see ourselves in that mapping. We've got user space mapped in here. We've got our, uh, our application here. So if we were to go look at this physical memory, um, we would find that this page contains uh, the code that's actually running in, uh, that we ship out to the device, right? If we were to object dump the, um, what do we have here? The thrower, object dump dash D, I don't know why I did dash O, vim dash. Um, this code would be loaded at that location. So we would be able to see our user space code. So obviously, since we have the entire uh, physical memory snapshotted, we can go and take a look at literally anything. We can look at all virtual addresses and all physical addresses. We could enumerate what page tables exist. We could find symbols. We could walk process lists. We can do anything. But since we have all of this memory, what we can do is put it into QMU. Now, I don't necessarily know how I want to do that. Um, so the first thing that we're going to do is go and grab QEMU. Um, and I have it. Sweet. So, since I have QMU, we're going to go into Android, and we're going to go and get the latest QMU, which we have basically the latest installed, uh, but we're going to get an even more uh, recent copy just out of GitHub, mainly because we want to be building it ourselves, because uh, we're going to be making modifications to QEMU. So, we're just going to search for uh, QEMU GitHub, and I'm going to go clone that down. Um get clone into QMU, and we just need ARM support for this, and so we're just going to build this right quick. Shouldn't be too hard. Uh, I wonder what's, I uh, wonder what the layout of the pages used for snapshotting. Um, should they mi be missing from the snapshot? They are missing from the snapshot. Um, but we know what is in them. <laughs> Look at me, I'm Portuguese. I totally need to use this fucking accent. <laughs> we don't even use this since the fucking Stone Age. Oh, man. 
Yeah, people have some weird keyboard layouts. Well, luckily I live in the best country where we speak the best language and we get that first party support. Uh, we're gonna configure help uh, and we're gonna figure out what we need to build here for support. We want to do uh, target list and uh, arm-soft MMU. Yeah, arm-soft MMU. And that's it. Right? Is there anything else that I need? I don't think so. That should, oh, wait, wait. So, this is gonna be a little confusing because I haven't had time to explain why we're gonna do this. Um, but, QMU uses a JIT by default. And that JIT is going to translate the target instructions into the host instructions. Um, the downside to that is it means it's very hard to work with. Um, working with the JIT, if we want to add instrumentation to detract like what memory has been accessed, add taint flow, add byte level permissions, it's very hard to do that unless we write a bunch of code for the JITs. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna bypass that entire thing and we're gonna switch QMU, which requires a compile time flag, or used to four years ago, the last time I did this. So hopefully it still exists but we're going to have it use TCI, um, which is the tiny code interpreter, enable TCG interpreter. So this is enable TCG with bytecode interpreter. So instead of having the JITs, um, I don't know if it's instead of, it might just be additionally, but this allows for a small little C program, or it's like a thousand line of code file, to run everything. And that means that we can easily hook memory accesses, we can easily hook register accesses, and we can understand better what's actually happening. So we're gonna turn that on. God, country, and Trump. Yep, that's America right there. Get out. <laughs> if, if you ain't been here for long enough and you don't talk like this, get out. <laughs> don't actually, we love our foreigners here. Please, please put up with our bullshit for a while. We're going through, we're going through some changes. Oh, they, use, they switched to Ninja? Are you fucking serious? Can I just run make? Yes. Oh, they use ni Ninja to generate this. Actually, big upgrade, Kimu. This is new. This is new. I don't know when QMU put this in place, but it's, uh, this is new to me. This is very nice. I like this. This is soothing. This is comforting. It's Mason now. I don't know what that is. Another build system. But it looks nice. It looks super nice. Um... I like having the status printout so we know how close it is to being done. When did they switch to this? This must have been relatively recently. I'm pretty sure I built Kimi like six months ago and they didn't have this. Just doing my little build dance, this is the compiler dance. Just waiting, waiting for my code to build so I can do some hacking. I'm doing some hacking. Got all that stuff. Building tests? Why, why, why is it building tests? <laughs> you and I both know we're not going to be doing tests today. <laughs> Woo! There we go. All right. Lib capstone. And then there's arm translate and... <gasps> okay. It looks like we're done. So we should in... Um, Soft MMU have an arm. Uh, actually, uh, we should have an arm. Where the? Did they change the layout that they do this now? Soft MMU arm. What? Where the fuck did they put that? Uh, RG QMU arm. Uh, find. Uh, find. Find star grep. Jeez. Struggling. Uh oh, build? Woo! Damn, they don't build it in place. Okay, there, arm soft MMU. Yeah, Kimu system arm. All right.
All right. Um, machine help. Let's see what listed machines we have. Wow, we got a lot of stuff. Um, so we're probably going to just do none. Um, but I need to figure out exactly how I want to do this. Um, this is the hardest part of Kimu, is we're going to try and hack this shit in as fast as we can. Um, oh, and let's also see... Um, let's see where the um, TCI is. Grep I inter... Interpreter, uh, TCI, int. Okay. Um, so, historically, uh, what I would do when I do Kimu mods um, would be I'd go into Android Kimu, RG none. Uh, so basically, if we go into soft MMU, um, actually, what do I want? Arc. <sighs> it's gonna take a while for my uh, my memory to come back from all of this stuff. It's been a long time. Uh, find star grep arm grep uh, none. Uh, really? Really? Uh, wither spoon. Okay, we're just gonna search for wither spoon. Okay, we're just gonna search for wither spoon. Um. Okay, so that's at speed. Where it registers that. So a uh, hardware, arm, um, and then we should have a nun in here or something. Probably just an arm. Uh, hmm. I've got a lot of fancy stuff in here. Where is like the base thing? Is it boot? That's the kernel loader. Okay, so that loads a Linux kernel. Hmm. Um. We'll just uh, RG for none in here. Okay, so it's not in there. All right. Um, I thought there used to be like a none.c, but whatever. So basically, if we do, um, we'll just say machine none, and then we'll do uh, no graphic. Okay, um, regs, print regs, <sighs> god, what the fuck is it? Help, help, I told you it's gonna take a while for this to come in, uh, does it need full info registers? Ah, it does, okay, so, um, alright, so, Machine, um, we can try like versatile PB. And okay. Uh, no graphic. I want um, monitor. Standard. St standard. Standard IO. Um, hmm. Okay. Let's see here. Oh, switch between console and monitor. Yeah, we'll have to fix that. Adding instrumentation into the JIT isn't uh, too bad. TCG is okay for what it is. Yeah, but it's still a lot easier to do TCI. It's so much easier. It's so much better. I like... I don't know if I believe you. <laughs> I like literally I am going to be able to add byte level permissions in TCI in about 15 minutes. And I don't think that can be said about the JIT. Um uh oops. I want to try AC help info registers. Okay. So we have all the registers working there. Um, we might need to save the PSR and some other stuff, um, but that looks pretty good. So, um, we're going to try none. And, oh, well, so basically there's no CPU available, and I think that's because I need to specify a CPU. So we're going to specify a, um... This is an ARM v7, so I'm just going to search for uh, Cortex 
ARM V7A. So it's an ARM V7A core, and I think that's a Cortex. Oh, A5, A7, A8, A9, everything is. Okay. So, um, ADB shell, cat proc CPU info. Let's see if we can find more information. Revision 71. I don't know if that means anything for us. Um, VFP implemented this architecture variant. I think we might just start with an A... Oh, well, I was going to say A5, but we'll start with an A7. Um, and when did the A7 come out? Oh, ARM part number. A C07. We have a C09, which is a Cortex A9. Look at that. Look at that. So uh, I guess you can't see this, but this table is basically saying there is a uh, VFP V3... Um, optional, and then uh, it's a C09 part number, and that seems to line up with a C09 part number here. So I'm going to hazard and say we're in a car, uh, a Cortex A9, right? Yeah. Isn't that cool? Bam. So info registers. We should have our register state now. That looks good. We're going to probably need to save more and more information. Obviously, execution has not started. Nothing has worked yet, uh, and we're going to have to figure that out. I'm going to hit the head. I'll be right back. Okay, um, this guy's on cocaine, hell yeah! <laughs> um, where's Twitch TV Gamozo 2 for the second monitor? That'd be kind of fun. But yeah, so we have a, a, a Cortex A9. Now, here's what we want to do to figure out how we want to handle these, like, memory accesses and everything that's going on. Um, so, basically, all we need to do is we need to set the registers, and then we need to set the, um, we need to set the registers, and we need to, uh, set up memory. Now, setting up memory is tough, because, um, in QEMU, if we take a look at memory right now, uh, we have nothing mapped in, right? Machine none. Uh, and if we look at, um, uh, help x... Um, I don't know if this is always physical memory. Um, let's see. There, I, there might be a different thing for physical. That's virtual memory. Okay, it, it's just XP. Sweet. Um, so XP at zero, right? Um, cannot access memory. Okay. Let's see here. Unless they change this, but back. Yeah, okay. Um, so basically, QEMU has this weird thing where sometimes it will just let you access memory that doesn't exist, especially when you're in the physical domain, um, and that has made me completely not trust the entire memory stack in QEMU. So, um, I am probably going to just rewrite the, uh, memory implementation in QEMU, 
uh, to go and access the things that I want it to. <laughs> um, is probably going to be what we're going to do here. So we'll see. What Motorola phone is this? This is a Motorola Electrify. Um, I consider myself a nerd, but damn, he's on another level. Hell yeah. Um, I don't think you see yourself from the outside when talking about something you really like doing. Yeah, it's, it's weird. It's definitely strange. Um, I don't know. Okay. Um, so... So like here is interesting because we can read these instructions. Um, we can we can read the memory as instructions, but we can't read it as um, data, which is which is strange, uh, which is kind of what I'm used to with QMU. But uh, R15 is at C. Um, it's hard to say if that is uh, failing to access that or not. C. So it's not not sledding. So okay. We'll see here. Okay. And we can say uh, no graphic um, info registers. So machine none, no graphic, that just drops into the monitor, info uh, registers. And then how am I going to set these registers? So I think I just might make a CPU. Um, or I might hack up none. Uh, C tags are dot. Um, vim cpu dot c. Okay, and then I have to switch these windows around in a weird way. There we go. Um, let's see where it starts the CPU. Um, CPU exec, so where is it? Um... Find star grep uh, CPU exec. There we go. Let's take a look at this. Um, so this is going to have like the entry point for the um, CPU. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure it does. Uh, CPU loop exec TV. Um, so uh, basically execute uh, translation block, CPU exec right here, main execution loop. Um, and this is kind of what I care about. So this is where we're going to go in and actually have things execute. I'm going to do an I here, stream term, just so I can get another terminal uh, for building. So we're going to have one for building, one for running. Uh, so let's just do make here. OK, that was relatively fast. Print uh, f cpu exec, and we're just going to immediately start hacking in code here, rather than trying to do things externally because it's going to suck if we try to do try to do things externally. So we'll go into uh, build arm soft mmu, and here we go. Nice, and we get the cpu exec print multiple times because uh, this will get re-executed uh, based on some set jumps and long jumps. So let's find where that is. Is it? Is it going to? Um, it might. <laughs> it might. We'll see. QMU is just a complete fucking mess. Um, and you'll find that it kind of just goes all over the place. It, it sucks, man. QMU is absolute garbage code. Uh, it does awesome things, so I can't can't, I can't complain about that. Uh, CPU loop, let's go and find it for ARM. And the CPU loop is just going to basically wrap everything in a set jump, long jump. But this is actually where we want it to be anyways. Uh, that's a Linux user. Um, maybe it's not in there. Um, is this going to be, let's see, CPU all, so that's Linux user, but that's not what I want, um, TCG CPUs, is it just this? Okay, it seems like they've uh, changed the formatting of this a bit, um, this, it's going to get nice and cramped in here. 
Okay. Uh, CPU exec starts. And this memory barrier um, atomic set set as running. Unless we have multiple processors running. But I don't think that's the case. Um, TCG CPUs. This is called... I'm looking for the main loop. Here we go. Here we go. Single threaded TCG. Um, huh, it looks like they might have, okay, so we have three things. Here's a thread function. In the multi-threaded case, okay, they've definitely changed this code since the last time I've been in here. Um, so I have to basically clean slate my brain, because a lot of the stuff that I thought I knew is probably no longer the case. Um, shit. <laughs> shit. <laughs> All right. Um, kickstart timer. So think single threaded. Each vCPU is uh, simulated in turn, and then it should be only one CPU by default uh, for sure. So hopefully we only have one print here. Print f uh, starting, and mainly I'm just trying to find where the first location is where uh, basically we have a CPU and it's about to run it and we have one print, and um, make, let's see. How long did it take you to get good with assembly? I have no idea, I don't know. I, I did it when I was so young that I don't know. Um, okay, so we're not hitting that. All right. So are we multi-threaded TCG? Let's try this. 415 users in Discord. Holy shit. Damn, that's a lot. <laughs> Starting. There we go. Okay, so we're multi-threaded. Um, CPU, uh, C, uh, help grep CPU. SMP, um, one. Okay, um, so it's just going to use uh, multiple threads, I think, by default. Uh, grep I thread. A single and multi-threaded TCG. So do, do I really care? Um, if we only have one CPU, each vCPU has its own thread. I feel like that almost makes more sense to me. So we're going to do the multi-CPU. It's default. Uh, the more default we can do it, the better. Um, so starting, we only have one print of that. Uh, register thread. Um, get a thread ID. Current CPU is CPU and then process any pending work, and then basically do while, while the CPU can run, run. And then at the end, handle exalt, uh, handle halted, handle debug things, um, and that's it. While the CPU is not unplugged and it can run, do this. So this is, this is the loop. This is where QMU spends all of its CPU time, right, between these two things. So if we were to put in like a, a starting, um, starting uh, CPU, and then let's go figure out the type on the thread ID. Um, looks like an int, int 64. Is that always an int 64 or does that vary? I'm not 100% sure. So we're just gonna print an LU and we'll print the CPU can, uh, the CPU thread ID. I guess that's the CPU's thread ID. There's probably more information I can get that's better. CPU state, um, thread ID, but is there a, um, is there like a CPU, CPU index? Okay, that looks better. Um, CPU index, TCG, CPU D, TCG, okay. So that is the actual CPU, uh, number. That's what we want. Um, here we go. So we're going to print starting CPU, CPU index, and then stopping CPU, CPU index. There's no early returns in here. Uh, return, no. So we have to return through this point. So this is uh, stopping CPU, CPU index. Okay. And it looks like it wants a, it's just an int. Actually, I think we saw that when we were in there. We should have taken note of that when we were in there. Um, good to see that that sort of thing is causing an, a build error. Um, okay, starting CPU zero, and then 
Um, help. Stop. Yeah, we're we're probably just not even gonna see the the exit message because there's probably like no great way to take that offline. Okay, so that means we now have this CPU, and we should be able to go find the register state in here. So CPU state, um, CPU address space, cool. Let's find some fun stuff here. Hmm. Um, you'll have to cap the users at 420. <laughs> we'll get there eventually, but do you know where you can go if you're feeling lonely and haven't heard from Gamoza in a couple days? My Twitter. My Twitter. Look at that. My Twitter. You could follow me on my Twitter. You could subscribe to my YouTube. You could follow me here. You could even subscribe here. There's so many ways that you can f support your favorite content creator here on Twitch. That's me. <laughs> sell out sell out 3155 thank you so much for the twitch prime hell yeah um all right where's that where's the register space i'm basically trying to figure out where the register state is wow they actually added a lot of comments maybe cumu code has gotten a lot better Um, hmm, see, undefined behavior, gift in two subs, thank you so much for that. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I read that twice, it got split up in a weird way. Wait, paying for it, you're, pa okay, thank you so much, undefined behavior for the gifted sub, hell yeah, don't, <laughs> don't subscribe. Sorry, I, I read that wrong, I saw multiple prints and I got super excited. Monitor giveaway at 31337. How many followers do I have? That's risky. That's coming up soon. I don't know. I, I'm not the hugest fan of uh, uh, giveaways. Okay, how the fuck do I read registers again? Um, printf, starting CPU, stopping CPU. Hmm, I forgot. Where is the OnlyFans? Uh, man, what would be awesome if, if you had a zoom animation after switching to your face? Yes! Yes, I was thinking about doing that. I was thinking about doing that. I really want to do that. <laughs> so, only monitors. I'd simp for those juicy exploits. There's, there's a lot of simping that would need to be done. That would need to be done for that to be a reality. All right, Kimu, where can I find registers? Where can I find registers? Handle interrupt. CPU class, CPU handle halt. Let's go and find where that happens. Oh, there's the set jump. There's the set jump. Get the translation block, which is basically the uh, the the code that it interprets in the processor. And then here we're gonna loop exec the uh, blocks here. Um, if the icon is uh, assert, the icon is enabled. Uh, if not defined, user only. Okay. And then execute any remaining instructions in the block. We're gonna go into here. That's gonna generate the code. Um, which is not always going to happen, I don't think. Um, let's just make sure we're running TCI, so TB exec. Um, set PC. I'm just basically trying to figure out uh, where the loop happens. So that's gen code, TB exec. I think that's only for TCG. I don't know if TCI will go through that. Um, maybe it will, because it will still have to create that. Um, blah, 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 synchronize from TB, set that. Ah, so CC is the CPU class. TB exec, code gen prologue. 
Hell yeah. The extreme zoom on your face. I know that's like the perfect thing for like the face, the face uh, flip sort of, sort of style. Um, so I could totally do that. Uh, I'm trying to figure out if this is uh, stopped execution in TB chain. So the other thing is we're gonna want to disable chaining uh, because I want to be able to see every instruction. But uh, TCI, uh, uh, so T -C TCI. Where is it? Interpreter. Um, fine star, grab TCI. Okay. Uh, TCG TCI dot C. Okay. And this is the interpreter. Yeah, 1,200 lines of code, right? 1,200 lines of code, this handles all of the execution. So all of the architectures get lifted into this TC, uh, TCG, and then all of the actual execution occurs here. So first, let's see if we're hitting this. Hopefully that gets built. Oh, Jesus. Um, that's causing a lot of code to get rebuilt. All right. Well, we could change things in a couple places, so we don't know if it is this one or another one. You should also get a cricket sound on a soundboard for your perfectly delivered jokes. That'd actually be pretty good. I unlocked the Loch Ness Monster. Awesome. Yeah, maybe we want to do this on a beefier machine because these build times are going to be annoying. If it, if it really is going to take this long each time we build this. Um, okay, so we're not hitting that. So it's hard to say if it's executing anything. Um, grep inter mm, TCG, TCI, TCG. Um, supported accelerators, default TCG. Uh, Vim dash. So KVM, Zen, Hacks. HVP, uh, HVF, Windows Hypervisor Platform, Extensions. So let's do Excel, um, Excel as help. Um, right? We bought it with TCI. Or we built it with TCI. Yeah, it's using uh, TCI. Hmm. I, I guess maybe it hasn't made it to this point. Maybe it hasn't run anything. Um, just because we have, like, no memory or anything in there. So I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> it's hard to say. <laughs> Nessie sound effect. How would I do that? <laughs> BPM machine, I only have eight cores with hyper threading. Hey, that's still good. Quad core, not bad. At least it's not a dual core. Shout out to all my dual core friends in chat. Living the living the tough life. The laptop I just replaced was a dual core, and that was an absolute struggle. Um, can't comprehend what he's doing. We're going through uh, QMU right now and trying to figure out basically where execution occurs. Because we want to get full control of uh, memory accesses and register state. So... We're basically trying to figure that out. Um, and I think no code has executed yet, maybe? I don't know. I don't know what has happened, to be honest. Um, I mean, unless I want to do this with QMU user instead of QMU system, I think I want to use QMU system. We'll probably end up doing uh, some fancy stuff in here. So. Basically, we want to load in physical memory, which we can do. Um, let's see what happens here. So QMU allows you on the command line to uh, just load in physical memory. Um, so to do that, um, it's a pain. I, I always forget how you do this. Um, where is it? Which option? Which of the many options is it? Um, uh, 
Oh, man, it's been a while. So, hmm. I was using my i7-920 until roughly a year ago. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't switch out my uh, first-gen i7 for a, a long time. I used it for 10 years. Where is it? We might just be able to do everything without modifying QMU, which would be kind of cool. Um, although, depending on the permissions that we want to do, uh, we might have to do some fancy stuff. Where is this shit? Drive, block dev. Hmm. Provide a backing storage for guest RAM. I don't think it's that. Um. Oh yeah, let's add some uh, dash M, 32 megs. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, basically we had no RAM in it. Um, so now we added 32 megs of RAM. Um, and then we're getting ass diffs because this is printing, right? We're, we're executing these, uh, TBs, these, uh, uh, thread blocks. Okay. So, uh, we have a CPU arc state, which is the architectural state for the processor. And that's going to be, uh, we can look at it for, uh, arm here, CPU arm state, and it's just regs. So that's fucking awesome. Now, I don't know why PC is separate here, but we'll probably want to go in and fill in most of these things. Um, but we'll have translation tables, TT, yep, TTB0, um, for the different ELs. Yeah, okay. Cool. Cool. So this, uh, this is mainly what we care about, and we can close this. Um, so this will basically... Uh, we'll be able to print PC here. Uh, we'll print LX, LX, and we'll do env, uh, actually just XX, and we'll do um, env regs six, uh, 15 and env uh, PC. And we're going to print both um, the program counter in the register bank. Okay, so these are LXs. I was wondering about that. Uh, let's see what we have here. Wait. Wait, that one is X. Okay, the regs are 32-bit. Um, the PC is 64-bit. So what we'll see is the instructions that are getting executed. And we'll see that we're just uh, jumping through a shit ton of memory at a time. That's going to be basically the size of a TCG block. So what we're going to do is disable um, the, the block. So we'll do a single step. Um, H grep single. So we want to do single step. Um, and now we are running every instruction. So what you'll find, log.txt, control C, vim log.txt, you'll see that we start execution at zero. Um, and then we're just stepping through because every all of memory is filled with zeros. So we just are basically not sledding through memory. We can obviously see that the PC register is not being used, but we can see uh, we're now single stepping. So effectively what single step does in QMU, um, is it enables the single step mode, which prevents, it basically prevents multiple instructions from running in the same TCG block. I might actually have to set the TCG block max. If I remember correctly, there are two things I have to set here, um, but it looks like it's single stepping just fine, especially uh, with these knobs, which will get optimized easily. So there we go on executing everything, right? And can I just do one mega RAM? Okay, so what you'll find, oops, um, come on, oh, I lost my history, shit, oh, um, reset, my terminal just got hijacked, um, no graphic, uh, log.txt, and we're probably gonna wrap modulo the one meg boundary, so let's see what happens. Um, unless we never make it to a meg. And no, we definitely do. Oh, and I got rid of single step, didn't I? No? What? Oh, TCG blocks are getting cached. Um, 
Unless something weird happens at the end here, but I don't think so. So we run through, uh, I think there is one other variable I have to change. Um, block, TB size, the block size. Do I have to set that? Um, Excel, and then property TB size equal to one. Let's try that. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, that's what I've what I need to do. Uh, TB size is one. Uh, Excel is equal to moose comma this. That's probably gonna get mad at me, which is good. I want it to. Um, moose invalid option. So we'll say use TC TCG with a TB size of one. Is that not correct? Um, Excel is equal to that comma prop. TCG translation block cache size. Um, oh. Is this? Here we go. So let's try moose. Hopefully this fails. Nice. No accelerator. Okay. TCG. Um, now, there we go. So it was two options. I remember you have to do single step and you have to do something else. Um, we might not need single step anymore. I'm not sure. Oh, we do. Okay. Single step basically um, means we do one TCG block at a time, I think. And then the TB size one. What if we do zero? Um, basically sets the uh, thread or the translation block size to one instruction. So we're basically capping that. And now um, we'll see if we go to log.txt. We'll never see, it'll always be single stepping one instruction at a time. And uh, now that means we can get code coverage, right? So now we have code coverage. If we just log PC here, we have code coverage. Congratulations, we did it. Um, but what we need to do is get memory added in, uh, like, um, I need to figure out how the, um, so that's PC right there, right? Um, uh, get status, get reset hard, um, history C, and we'll grab this, make sure we don't lose this magical command, make that, rebuild everything, and then this is going to be our command. Looks good. Done. Okay. Okay. Um, so that is just running info registers, right? If we look through info registers, R15, um, I don't know if there's a way to do that, but we'll see that R15 will just kind of be a, a random value depending on when we stop execution, which is really cool. Um, all right. So... Now I want to figure out how I want to um, kind of get everything, like, I need to figure out how I want to map in memory. And basically, uh, I need to figure out if I want to use QMU's um, translation layers. And if I do, then I just want to add physical memory. And to do that is relatively easy. Help uh, Vim Dash. I just have to find the magical option. Um, Um, uh, device, is it device? It might be device. Uh, basically I want to load in files. Um, and then I'll also want to set registers and stuff too. I don't know if there's a good way for me to set the register state, to be honest. Um, so we might have to find a good way to do that too. Uh, there's the debug, which will allow us to debug stuff. Um, that gets us like an execution trace and we can get like the instructions each time they're executed, which is nice. Um, can someone explain to me how Gamoza can emulate the system without the relevant hardware to back it? Because we're not actually gonna be uh, touching devices. Um, we're just going to be running directly out of RAM. Everything that we need 
well, most of the things that we need should be in RAM. God, where is the thing? FD to set, boot. Where is it? Um, it might just be a device. Um, I always forget this. I probably made notes of this somewhere and I'm kind of sad. Um, we'll do device help. So there might just be like memory or something. Storage. SD card, mm, I don't want to do that. I want to uh, basically load memory, but I don't remember how. Maximum MCD block, hmm. Um, let me just Google it. Uh, QMU, um, load, uh, RAM state. What is it? Command line. I forget what the command line is for it. There we go. Uh, device. It is device. Yeah. Um, device, loader, address, zero, data, ASDF, um, um, Oh, that loads a single address. Loading files. Um, loader, um, file equals moose, um, address is equal to zero. Okay, DDIF is um, dev u random to um, uh, moose, whoops, BS is one, Meg counts as one. So now we have one meg of random memory, and that should be what's filled in. So X, uh, X10, XI0. Yeah, there we go. Um, so we've, we now can load up random shit into memory. So effectively, we just need to make those regions of memory. Um, it should be, should be good. Force rows on, treats it to be, treats it as a raw image can be used to load executable formats as if they are raw. Might as well do that. Uh, force raw is um, on. Okay, so this is what we're gonna use um, to load up uh, physical memory with what we need. So the question is, does is TCI, are TCI loads in stores, right? So there are these uh, loads, right? Um, load or read. I forget what they call it. Set conditional. Uh, here we go. Loads and stores. So are these loads and stores in TCG, um, are they in physical or virtual memory? And I'm not 100% sure. I, they, they have to be in physical. They have to be in physical. Uh, read S32. Um, T1 plus T2. I think so. Um, let's see. Oh yeah, hard reset. Ooh, 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 ooh. DD the driver store. Hell yeah. <laughs> I remember I accident when I accidentally fucked my Yuffie partition uh, when I misused DD. Yep. 
<laughs> Wait, what do you mean, pin ls? Exec error invalid format. <laughs> Luckily, I only overwrote the root partition on a PC I was just uh, about to throw away. Oh, that works fine. Is it hard to write good code? It's exceptionally hard to write good code. Very, very, very difficult. Okay, so... So basically, this loads an 8-byte unsigned, right? Is that reading from memory? Oh! Oh no, I accidentally hit the lens with my finger. Shit. Now it's all smudged. <laughs> Let me go get a cloth beer back. Lens cleaning ASMR. I also grabbed some food because I'm hungry. I don't know how hungry I am, but I'm hungry. Hell yeah. Okay. Hopefully the eating is not too loud and annoying. Um, too bad if it is. Okay, so I'm trying to figure out how loads work. It says load and store operations. 32-bit. Um, so, load. 32 and 64-bit. Okay. So is this the actual load here? Um, load 8 unsigned. This is going to write this value to the register. So T0 is the register, I guess, and read this. So get the register, get the base, and then this is getting an offset, and then the base plus offset, and reading that. Okay, so that's actually reading the memory. I'm also hungry, but it's 4 a.m., damn. See you around. Thank you for stopping by, Net Kronos. Hell yeah. So, 
I guess I'm I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. I know I'm going to care about these loads eventually, but right now I don't. Right now. I want to get my memory in this system. That's what I want to do. Um, so what we're going to do is uh, take our PMEM analysis tool, and we're going to dump out all of physical memory into a contiguous blob. Um... And let's see, this will return, hmm. I don't know if there's a way that we can add a hole in uh, QMU's memory. So what I'm going to try to do um, is in QMU, so we run this, right? And if we look at zero, that memory exists, of course. So what if I do megs zero no ram cannot load specified image ah because it has no place to load it so the problem is i want to have sparse physical memory um and i don't know how um we can just ignore the zero regions or the, the regions between. So basically, here's what I want to do. We have these physical memory regions. And what I want to do um, is not that. I have to, like, set up this padding. Um, we have these physical memory regions, but there are gaps between them. And since there are gaps between them, I would prefer for them to be filled with dead space that would cause a fault if we were to access them. But, I don't know if we're going to get that. El Hazard? El Hazred? El, El Hazred? <laughs> Thank you so much for the raid. Hell yeah, how was your stream? What were you up to? Thank you so much. Look at those cute little emotes. Oh my god. Love it. Hey there, raiders. Yeah, how's it going? The extremely technical explanation interrupted by him biting into a sandwich is funnier to me than it should be. <laughs> oh my god, I love that emote. It's so cute. Dinner time? Yeah, we're, we're making it work, kind of. Hello. Sandwich ASMR, yeah. So, for all the people who just joined, we have an Android device, which is a Motorola Electrify from like 2011. We found a bug in a driver that allowed us to increment an arbitrary value in the kernel. We use that to install a function pointer that jumped to our own code, and we use that to get root and arbitrary kernel execution. With the arbitrary kernel execution, uh, we go through and basically map in all of physical memory, one meg at a time, and then dump it all um, to disk. More specifically, we copy memory to memory, and then we dump it later. So we disable interrupts, we save all the register state, and then we go through and save all of the memory. And the goal of this is that we save the entire state of the processor and of memory. And now we're working on transplanting that into QMU such that we can continue execution of our phone in an emulator such that we can instrument it and fuzz it and analyze it. So yeah, that is what we are looking to do right now. Um, we're just going through the fact that there are multiple of these physical memory ranges. And thus, um, we have to kind of deal with the fact that 
some of this memory can be kind of sparse, which is annoying. I'm trying to find the best way I want to tile this. I'm going to do this. Um, but yeah, that's what we're currently up to. How's chat doing? How's it going? We're also eating food right now. We'll be done eating food in like probably 10 minutes. So <laughs> things will hopefully get quieter. Um... Okay, so we dumped out the entire state. We've already done that with our exploit, and we've dumped that out to this Falk core file. And what I'm gonna do is pull in these ranges, and we're gonna go in. We're gonna go through all physical memory. Um, and we're just gonna dump all of that out. So for physical address in zero to four, one two three, one two three four. Um go through all RAM, uh, including dead space, 4K at a time, page is equal to 0, U8, uh, 4096, and then we're going to do uh, fc.readfizz, uh, fizz adder patter, um, and then we'll read into page, and that can fail, but it will fail in a lot of situations, it will default to 0, and then... Um, let mute um, fd is, uh, we'll call this uh, pmem, linear uh, pmem, so linear physical memory is equal to file new um, uh, snapshot.pmem. Try that. Uh, linear pmem.write page ref question mark. All right, I think we need to pull in um, write and file. Uh, and that's supposed to be create, but let's do a uh, buff writer and write. And we'll do uh, write all. Um, and we'll do buff writer new so we're gonna have a buffered writer here instead and then file create and ah okay so this should have made a file in this case it's one gig in size right it's exactly one gig um and that contains all of physical memory so if we were to xxd on snapshot.pmem and head um and 1000 Mm, 100,000, vim dash. This is basically the contents of all of physical memory. Now, most of it's going to be zeroed out because we allocated a bunch of stuff in there, but some of it won't be. And I think the kernel, like if we were to go, so these are basically all the physical addresses. I can even do, we'll do a couple more lines. We'll do a million lines just because I think that's when it will start to get slow. Um... And we can go to like this printf here, which is at bafd0, uh, bafd0, and here we go. Here's printf. So this is the uh, code there, but this is in physical memory, um, and that's all we care about right now. So now what we can do is load that snapshot um, into Q QEMU. So we're going to say we want... Uh, 1,024 bytes. I'm going to try 1,000 first. I want to see whether or not this fails. Um, oops. Uh, snapshot.pmem. Uh, snapshot.pmem. I want this to fail. Okay. And then I want 1024 to not fail. And this will load up all of that physical memory, and it failed. Shit. Why? Mm. Oh, probably the tilde. It's probably the tilde. There we go. So, now we can look at um, X10i. Um, we can look at the address here, BAFD0. Um, BAFD0. And there are the instructions, right? Load 5C, compare with 0 load uh, register branch equal, and we have all of this stuff that we need here. 
So ultimately, we've got all physical memory loaded. So now all we need to do is load up um, register state. All right. We had 420 users in the Discord earlier. Yeah. Everything is 10,000 miles above my head. Complete noob here. No problem with that. No problem. Always here to have noobs here. Um, could you specify a device multiple times with different offsets for the regions you care about? Yes, but I can't set uh, memory. Like, when I do dash M, I would have to do dash M 1024, and Kimu would by default zero out that memory. So I don't have a way to, like, punch a hole in that. Now, technically, if I make a correct device implementation, I can just make multiple memory mappings. Um, or I could maybe try and use this as flash instead of as memory. Uh, but we're just starting off with this, and we'll uh, we'll restrict it more later. But yeah, I don't know if in the command line there's a good way to do that. Dragon is meters away from the ISS. Awesome. Doing that good old docking. Um, um, El Hazard? Is it El Hazard? AI Hazard? Uh, was doing a beginner intro to Windows buffer overflows, and suddenly we're in Android kernel exploit stream. But this is cool, and that setup is dank. Yeah. We're trying to get an Android phone running in QMU. And we're pretty close, to be honest. We're pretty close. Um, so right now, if we do an XP to dump physical, um, we get the same thing. But what we want to do is we want virtual memory to get set up. So to do that, we want to set the... Um, we want to set TTBR0... Uh, there also might be some other registers that enable paging. I'm not sure. Um, I actually don't know how you enable paging in ARM, so we have to go figure that out, too. Um, how do you enable it? Modified virtual addresses. Oh, yeah, I need to know their, um, their syntax here. I don't know what they mean by these. Virtual address, obvious. Modified virtual address... The FCSE takes a VA and transforms it. Fast contact switch, okay. And then an IPA, which is an intermediate physical address. Um, if there's two stages of address translation, it's the address after the stage one. Okay, yeah, don't care. Cool. All right, so, um, enabling MMUs. It is done with the scuttler. Okay. Hmm. So basically, I need to figure out how I want to load the register state into QMU. Um, we're going to need to save the scuttler, um, and include that in our snapshot, but, hmm, so on startup and reset, it is zero, and then that will get loaded up, so if we save this and then load this, We just need to load the registers. The Dragon UI is written with Electron and React. Ugh! Gamoza is one QMU patch away from docking the memory jump into QMU. Yeah. So basically, this is how that guy did the jailbreak for iPhones back then. I mean, we already did that, right? We already exploited the phone. Um, 
we're setting up a, a research environment such that we can fuzz it and analyze it. Um, don't spacecrafts run like formally verified kernels or something wacky? No. I mean, I'm sure some do. But, uh, it's typically just code that has been proven. Con code that's been around a long time and kind of, like, proven to work. Known good code. It just kind of varies. Um, it's not like there are legal requirements, right? Some companies who are doing it on a budget will probably cut corners, and others won't. <laughs> it can get really fucky. Alright. Um. Hmm. So where do I want to set the register state? Um, I'm just going to leave the build window hidden by me because you don't need to see the build window. It doesn't matter. <clears throat> so basically, I want to figure out where I want to um, set the register state. And it's probably where this is created. So let's go and figure out where the first occurrence of CPU arm state is um, in the code. Um, I'm just xrefing right now. Uh, hardware arm boots. Okay, so this is likely the uh, start of an execution. Yeah, CPU do reset right here. Right here. You can't get better than that. Okay. Um, so, if there's info, if it's Linux, um, then set some of the Scuttler stuff in set PC. We want to make sure we call set PC because it might clear some caches or do something there. Um, otherwise, if there's EL3, this other shit... Um, address space, stuff like this, set kernel args, uh, rebuild H flags. Um, we might have to do that. That's gonna, basically, they probably, like, they, <laughs> when you're dealing with emulators, you, you deal with the fact that a lot of times the registers are cached and, like, bits are extracted from, like, a, a control register that controls, like, the CPU mode. Those CPU mode bits might be extracted and put in, like, an enum field in the state machine. Um, and that means that you can't just set that register value or set that control register value to what you need it to be. You need to know how to inform the emulator that that value has changed. And that can be a pain in the ass. Um, but we're going to see what we can do. Reset. I suspect... We will see reset print in a loop here. And you might be wondering why. Well, it's because we're crashing, right? We're crashing over and over and over because we didn't set up register state. And we're not resetting over and over. Um, 3688, 5334. Okay. It maybe found some like steady state or some, it's looping in an exception handler. Um, in the emulated processor. Um, oh, did we see reset print? No. No? Um. Hmm. Maybe that's literally only on a reset. I kind of would have expected that that would happen the first time as well. But we'll see. Um, uh, 
Hmm. I guess maybe they don't reset uh, on the first go. I kind of just assumed they would, but uh, I guess they don't. Right bootloader. Very small bootloader. Kernel args. Oh, it, this is for... Uh, that's the kernel loader. Shit. Whoops. Okay. Um... CPU loop, CPU arm state, arm signal. That's for Linux user. Target arm. CPU 64. Um, this is just CPU C, I think. Arm helper. Internals. M helper. Target arm CPU.C. Reset. Um, do CPU reset, arm CPU reset, uh, reset, there we go, there we go, that's gonna be right now, right, right, R right, yes, okay, we did it, um, so this is kind of setting everything up, Basically setting up these control registers, some uh, zeroing a bunch of stuff, rebuild H flags. Okay, breakpoint, update all. This, update all. Set flush to zero. That's going to set those states. Um, okay. And then this is actually setting those regs. Damn, hell yeah. Um, so, we probably want to do this at the end of this function, right here, right? So, after the reset is done, printf reset good, um, it's about to, like, rebuild and re-update those things, and let's see if that code gets hit, otherwise there's an early return, but I'm pretty sure that code will get hit. Nice. Reset. Good. Okay. So this is the point where we can set up the register state um, and see what happens. Um, do you have one of those mice with like 15 buttons on it? Yes, I do. It's actually got 20 buttons on it. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I need it for healing in, in WoW. Okay, um, envregs, let's just see if this works, um, I'm just gonna see if I can set PC, right, can I set PC, um, And I want to make sure the processor stops. Freeze CPU, yeah. Okay, info registers. Hey, leap. Okay. So, we set a register. <laughs> um... And now we just set all of them. Fuck it. Um, uh, for ii reg in uh, uh, fc dot registers uh, dot iter dot enumerate um, print uh, env regs ii is equal to uh, this the value. So now this is going to print the registers, or it's going. This is going to technically generate C code. <laughs> oh, whoops. Um, I I. Um, and we can say two on that, so it lines nicely. And this will set all of the registers. There we go. Um, but we're going to need more information than just that. <laughs> 
So that's going to set the GPRs. Um, and a PC. Which is really cool. Um, uh, we got to build it. Make... <laughs> this is going to be fancy. Uh, info registers. Okay, so all the registers are filled in. So now they're in the state that it was when we entered that ioctal, right? When or when we called fsync or whatever we replaced that shellcode in. So, right, this register state is what we just loaded. Um, okay. So now... I need to uh, restore the TTBRs. Um, let's see. How do I want to do that? Uh, to 16. So all the regs to 16. Nice. And then the TTs, we have to figure out where those are in Kimu. Um, CPU arm state. So you have the X regs. We don't care about those. PC. We don't care about that. Um, PA state. If it's in uh, Eric sixty four mode, it's not. CPSR. The the flags. So like here's where things are dangerous, right? The CPSR. These things are these are cached. Um, so it's dangerous to just go and update them willy nilly. Um. Um, the system control co code processor, CP15. So there's the scuttler. And, hmm. So are these the scuttlers for each of the different modes? This is EL0, 1, 2, and 3. Um... That's kind of what I'd guess. I'm using Rust to write C. Hell yeah, that's what we do here. I'm not gonna write that shit. Um, Scuttler E L. Okay. T T B R O E L. And I forget how E Ls work. I think it's the opposite of x86, so three, uh, three is the highest non-supervisor and supervisor, I think. Which TTBR am I reading? <laughs> I don't even know. Uh, let's go find that in the manual. Let's make a copy. TTBR is the safe way to write C. That's all you have to do. You just have to pass your, uh, you have to pass your C code through a, a Rust program that cats it out. That's all you have to do. Pretty sick views of Dragon approaching, uh, the ISS on NASA. That's awesome. I'm not gonna pull it up, though. Um. <sighs> so... For what EL is this? Are there even ELs on this processor? Um, I think the EL concept is for um, ARM64, maybe? <sighs> I don't know. I don't know. Shit. Um, so TTBR, what else do we have here? Um, so that's coprocessor 15 and that's where we get everything from, right? We're using, yeah, we're using coprocessor 15 for everything. Um, so... Cache size, Scuttler. 
Um, is this in an if def? I just need to double check. This isn't like if def arm 64, is it? I'm assuming they use the same thing for all. Um, Xrefs. Oh, there's two. Oh, that's the type def. Okay. Uh, so they use the same thing. Uh, rigs for current mode. I guess it's ARMv8 versus ARMv7 here. What's the host OS and window manager? It's Gen2 with DWM. Um. Hmm. An ARM CPU core. So basically, I have. What do I have? I have the T. Let's see if there's a, a TTBCR. And where are these used? I don't see any code that uses this. Uh, this. TTBCR. Uh, VMSA. TTBCR raw write. Well, that looks good. So this will let me write a TTB. TTBCR raw write. And that's going to go and check the ARM features value, mask it down, and then set the TCR which is here, and then update these masks. So this, these are the sorts of helper functions that I'm gonna wanna be using, right? Um, uh, print, where was I? Uh, e target arm cpu.c, reset, good. So we want to, we're gonna program the TTBCR um, with, uh, it's just zero in this case. Uh, write the TTBCR. So I guess we're going to also look for the um, TTBRO, like all of these as well. Um, and I'll see effectively if there are helpers for accessing these, and it doesn't look like it. Uh, so what we'll do is uh, env TTBRO. So that's 15.2.0 is the, I'm just making sure it's the same thing. 15.2, um, whoops, 15.2.0, uh, 15.2.0, and then access function type field offsets. Oh, here's the right FN. Um, and I need an environment and the CP reg info. Where do I get that? Ah, I see. So that's Cortex A9. So uh, that CP reg info is probably on the CPU, I would imagine. Let's see. We basically we need to define the like CPU model for that. Uh, CP reg indexes. No. Um, CI state. Do, do, do. I mean, I could search for it. CP reg info. Um, CPU state. No. I don't know where this is. Get class. Um. Coprocessor reg info. There it is, but how do I get this? Um, 
from the encoded code processor. Let's try this. Um, key is this. Register index. Yeah, this seems really tough. <laughs> um, I don't know a good way to do this. Docking isn't for another 30 minutes, damn. Coded coprocessor. So, I guess I don't know how I do that. Reset good, uh, TTBCR, raw write. And I need the coprocessor register information structure. Um, and this is the A9. 15. Reginfo Sentinel. Okay. So I don't know if that's what I want to use though. Um, all right, raw pointer, TCR. Yeah, we got some weird champ going on in chat for sure. Definitely some weird champ. <laughs> chat being fucking weird. Uh, RI field offsets. So it's an array of reg infos. So I have to find the reg info. That is the uh, TTBR, the TT bro. Um, which is here. So here's the EL1. And then here is... Um, virtual machine, is this VMSA is virtual machine something I'd imagine. So here's the TTBR zero and this is, um, for EL one opcode three, two. Yeah, that's not what we have. This is the one that we have. So we want to set this. Well, that's frustrating. Is there no good way of getting this information? I mean, the TTBCR is just zero anyway, so we're fine with that. Um, write the TTBRO, um, and I guess we want it for EL, ah, we want these. Environment, um, CP15, TTBR0, S. Does this write both? Both the S and? If it's 64-bit, extract this, raw write the value, raw read that, TLB flush. So if the ACID changes with the 64-bit write, we must flush, we must flush the TLB. Um, okay, so raw writes RI. If it's a 64-bit field, but didn't this have multiple field offsets? Bank field offsets. That's what's confusing to me. I don't know which one it is. I'm guessing it is um, the higher one, the S, the super user. <laughs> Let me see. Um, Uh, TTBROS. So those are the formats. Detecting paging is done through that. Short format, long format, blah, blah, blah. Um, TTBR0 and TTBR. Hmm. 
So, TTBR1 is not being used at all, so we only have to worry about TTBR0, and we're gonna fill in S with our value. That's what we're gonna fucking do. We're gonna call it there. That is what we're gonna do. Here we go. We're just gonna try it. We're just gonna try it. Fuck it. We'll do it live. Um, and then we actually need to program uh, this to use um, info registers. So, X10IC123, 1234. Uh, can I access anything? Yeah, I think so, because it's, yeah, this is the weird stuff that happens with QMU. Um, oh, yeah, let's do uh, XB on that. Okay, can't access that and can't access that. Perfect. That's what it, I expected, uh, because we haven't enabled paging. So to enable paging, we need to go and uh, environment... Um, we need to set up... What was it that the manual told us to do? Um, those are the TTBRs. BMSA. Okay. TTBCR we know is zero. Some thread shit, okay. We don't care about that then. Uh, we want the scuttler. The system control register. Top level control of the system, including the memory system. So we're gonna save the scuttler. That's what we need. Um, reset value of it, blah, blah, blah. And then read the scuttler into RT. Okay, so we're going to adjust this code. Uh, get SCTLR. Um, R0. MRC, this, registers, plus 4C, um, uh, const num trampoline registers, uh, U size is equal to um, 20 now. Uh, number of registers used in the trampoline. And then we just need to go to instances of 19 and change them with this. Um, that kind of has weird formatting. Okay. Um, bink, bink. Uh, print registers. Okay. Make run. This might reboot the phone. Wouldn't be too surprised if it does. Um... I think we do have some side effects to our exploit that we haven't really looked into. Um, yeah, there it's gone. Maybe, maybe. Th these lights are still on. Oh, wait. So here's the scuttler. Um, and then this, we have 19 in here. Uh, we're gonna do the same thing. Um, once again, we should turn this into a shared library soon, um, such that we don't have to keep moving these constants around. Um, but we'll start off with this. Non trampoline registers. Think. 19. Think. And then we'll set this. Uh, we'll currently just have this go through everything. And, uh, well, we never save that, but it doesn't really matter. Um, here is the scuttler. Uh,. And hopefully we can just set it. So if we do um, CP15 SCTLRS is equal to hex this. Uh, hopefully that's turned on the memory management system. But I'm like kind of X to doubting that right now. Um, info registers. PSR, so service 32 is the current mode. I think we need to probably adjust that as well. Um, help, uh, info help, help info. I think there's a way to view more register states than just that. Um, let's see, info. Registers, registers, 
uh, dash A, but that just shows it for all CPUs. Status, TPM. Latest dump status, uh, CPU info, CPU stats, maybe CPUs we could try. Um, uh, info CPUs. All right, so what we can do is just literally look. X10, XB, C123, 1234. Fuck. Um... Okay, uh, there's probably an accessor to that then. Uh, SCTLRS. Helper? Uh, SCTLR right? Oh, a lot of these bits are not implemented. Okay, read, flush, TB end. Rebuild H flags, which we do. Flushing the MMU is probably not necessary. Um, if it doesn't have an MPU, CPU value N equals that, so clear the M bit. And I think M is what we need. M, MMU enable. Um, value, clear a bunch of bits. Raw read. Skip the TLB flush if nothing changed. Linux likes to do a lot of pointless scuttler writes. Huh. Raw writes. Environments. Uh, all right, value. Okay. Hmm. 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 I don't... Unless I have the ELs wrong. Maybe it's just EL1? Maybe I want the NS variants? We'll just set those. We'll, we're gonna try it. Um... But I think the S is for supervisor, and I think we are in supervisor mode. But we might have to grab some other status bits to fill that into. Um, we're just kind of going to be in this uh, situation for a while. So we're in uh, service 32, or supervisor, service 30, I don't know what that is. X10, XBC, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4. Can't access that memory. Fuck, man! How? Um, how does it actually do an MMU walk? MMU index. Because that's how I enable it. There's got to be some other stuff I have to set then. MMU... Get TLB bits, don't care about that. Uh, translate. See if we can find, uh, do an S1 page table walk through S2. All loads done in the course of a page table walk go through here. Mm -hmm. So S1, I think that's in a hypervisor. So basically there's gonna be a lot of go code here that's gonna be hypervisor and not. Oh, here's CPSR uh, right. Um, I don't know if that's going to matter. How is this more complex than dumping the memory? Because the systems are super, super complex. Um, there's so many different things that we need to figure out to get this to work. Uh, this is load. All loads go through here during a page table walk. Okay, so if all loads during a page table walk... Okay, get fizz adder v5. Is that arm v5, v6? And this is going to be arm v7, I'm guessing. Somewhere. Okay, maybe not. Well, let's just see what it does. Um, get the table address. 
Uh, DACR. I don't know if I need that or not. Huh. I... Unfortunately, this is just really confusing. Because I, I just... I don't know... Look up the L1 descriptor. Um, so that's going to get the TTBCR from the regime TCR, which is going to get uh, the TCREL, the translation control register. Is that the TTBCR? So that gets the TCR, and that has, yes, yes, so that's the same as the TTBCR, um, and then it's going to get, uh, depending on the mask, uh, which there isn't one, so it's going to get the TTBCR PDO from the uh, CCR and that raw table, so we should hit maybe this, printf moose, um, Let's just see. I don't actually know what translation goes through uh, in GDB. And maybe we just need to let execution run uh, just to see. Um, let's just continue or run. Yeah, so registers are probably fucked now. Yep, because we went to a reset vector. Um, we didn't see that prints. Shit. Basically, it's not using the uh, MMU right now, and I don't know why. Um, let's see where this is called. Is this just get fizz address? Okay. Um, get the physical address corresponding to a virtual address. So it's going to figure out all this shit. So we should hit this. Uh, printf moose2. Um, that one I expect we will hit. Get fizz adder. Wasn't done yet. There we go. Moose two. Okay. Good. 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 Uh, so. Um. We need to effectively figure out what features are enabled. Are we hitting this? I noticed the tile manager, what flavor OS do you use? I use uh, Gen 2. Okay, so we're not hitting that, and I don't know if that's a problem. Uh, let's see if we're getting to here. Fast context switch, interesting. Doesn't exist at all in V8. Huh. Okay, we're hitting that. Uh, so what's PMSA? No MMU. Ah, okay. Definitely a real MMU, not an MPU. Okay, so... Um, this is translation disabled. So we're going to see if translation is disabled. And if it is, we're going to figure out why translation is disabled. It is. Okay, so we're hitting translation disabled. MMU is disabled. This is going to go in here and check the MPU control. Um, wait, that's on M. Um, if it's stage 2, if this, uh, scuttler and M. Printf, ASDF, uh, scuttler check. So now we're going to see if the scuttler is being checked, and if it is, then there's a chance that we have some bits there that aren't set correctly. Here we go. And, yep, we're hitting the scuttler check. Okay, so it's trying to read this. Um, what's my regime EL? Um, MMU index. Jeez. Um, I'm going to... Just do this because I'm curious what my regime EL is. Um, so this is uh, the uh, regime EL, and then we also can get the um, scuttler uh, percent %x. And I don't know if these are the right um, types. 
for those variables, and it looks like they... We need a long on the scuttler. Okay. So now we're going to get to see what the state of these things are. Now, I think the S and the, N the NS is probably incorrect here, but we're just going to see. Uh, scuttler is that. That is not what we programmed it to be. Um, but rel is equal to 3. Uh, so, yes, we do want rel 3. So here we go. Okay, now it is uh, 10C53C7D. Perfect. Um, so that is what we programmed it to be. So we got that right now. Um, okay, so translation is not disabled. Uh, printf uh, translate. Now this is going to try and translate addresses. Maybe it's just an issue with the monitor. I don't, I don't know. Um, let's see. If we're hitting translate, then it's actually going through the page tables. Translate, okay. Um, uh, shit. Info registers. Um, and let's X10I this. Yeah, that is not right. I think that's physical memory. Um, XP. Whoa. Nope, that's different. Um. Uh. Uh. X40i. Hmm, no. Um, so we shouldn't be having LPAE. We're probably in, uh, I'm guessing we're going to a V5, which is the basic table. Let's just see. Let's see where we're hitting translate. Uh, it is calling translate there, so that is the code that we're going through. So let's see. Uh, okay, we're not hitting that, so we're, we're in V6 then. Scuttler XP, whatever that is. Um, up to V6, okay. Hmm. Eh, eh, eh. Don't know what that is. Okay, we're clearly translating now. Um, so let me go into here. And get the level and table address. So printf translate uh, table adder is um, percent LX. And we can print table. I'm guessing table is the um, the physical address of the translation table. The TTBR zero would be my guess, and this is just an X. And we're gonna see how that looks. This shit is cool. I don't know what he's doing, but it's cool. Yeah, we're trying to figure out uh, how to get an Android phone uh, running in Q QEMU from an exploit. Okay, woo. Oh, did that do a walk? That's that's a physical address. Um, hmm, hmm. Get level one table address. Oh, that's getting the ta- <gasps> That's the physical address of the table. Yeah, two six six. Uh, three eight. Yeah. No, that. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Uh... So we're trying to translate foc. Okay. Uh, let's try X N I, um, P C. If I can do that, I can't. See, one, two, three, one, two, three, four. Oh, wait. Um. Wait, is it working? 
X10i, yeah, because the physical is zero at that range, but for the non-physical, um, it's, it's the, um, Let's uh, take a look. Why is it always... Why is it always the exact same data? What? Uh, translate BAC. Mm-hmm. Um, why would it be getting BAC? I feel like it might be working. Hmm. Hmm. Are we gonna have a display or just a shell? Uh, we're not gonna have any output from it. We're just gonna be able to see what it executes. <sighs> um, why would it be translating that? Oh, that's just the first level of the table? All right, let's just look at the end here. Um, we have an address. Make sure that doesn't get modified. Uh, break default fizz adder. Okay, here we go. That's the result of the actual translation. Um, LX on that. So virtual address to physical address. And we're going to see what we get. I'm kind of doubting the Q, Q EMU monitor is uh, correct here. Uh, are we hitting default? Are we faulting? Um. Are we, are we faulting and it's just printing random shit? I think so. I think this is faulting and we're just getting random shit. Uh, maybe this is the same as uh, physical zero and it's mapping to z no. I don't even know what QMU is giving me here, but it's just random shit because for some reason it's faulting during the walk. Um. <laughs> Thanks, Ge Geek Pirate. Hell yeah. Distro and OS. Noise. Noise. Um. Let's see here. How the fuck do I get that to work? Um. What's. How's it faulting? I don't. I don't know what, how, um, if it's not equal to fault none, do, f okay. Uh, now we just print debug. It's faulting and then is just displaying random shit, which is standard for QMU. I'm, like, really tempted to just write a fucking ARM emulator. Um, that's exactly what I've done before when I've had these problems. It's just so hard to hack this shit in. What? What? Is that... Is it... Is it... Is it... Why did it work for this? Okay, so we're getting there. Um, uh, 
Is it PXN? No. Um. The so type is three, okay. It's probably the um page translation faults, permission faults. I mean we can print the type. Let's do this. Print f uh, translation faults percent d fi type. Now we get to see the type of fault that's occurring. We probably just need more uh, control registers filled in. Should do that sometime? Yeah. It, yeah, like... Okay, translation fault four. Um, I mean, X10i, let's try... For... Uh, X10i, OX... This address. Come on. Come on. Translation fault four. Okay. What's four? Zero, one, two, three, four. Domain. Section or page domain fault. Um. Right? Or are they one indexed? Are they are they one indexed? Shit. Now I now I it, they're, they're definitely zero indexed. Um section or page domain faults. Okay, so we need to figure out why that's happening. I'm just going to double check that that's what we're actually hitting. Unless I don't know how CE enums work anymore and they're one indexed and maybe they are. Uh they're not. Okay, sweet. Um so, what that means is that this is happening. Domain prot is the dacker. We need to get the dacker. Uh, let's go get a daiquiri. If it's EL1, um, but we're going to be an EL3, and thus we're going to set dacker, th uh, dacker this. Okay. Okay. All right, so we're learning things. We're learning shit that we need. Um, uh, read the Dacker. Domain control. For the 16 memory domain? Yeah. 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 I, don't, I don't know. It's, it, it's been a while. Let's grab that quick. Um, get Dacker. Uh, MRC. 50. And change this to 21 uh, registers. And then um, we'll just set these pages that we defined in the middle of nowhere. But we're just going to put this to 1 meg so everything will fail and it will just run faster. Uh, 15. 15. Ah, oh, well, no duh, it's wrong. It needed to be 15. <laughs> so obvious. Um. X10i. Okay, is this it? Is it gonna work? Is this gonna be a branch if equal? Whoa! Easy! Easy shit. Fucking first try. How easy can it get? God, they make this so easy. Might as well just fucking tell me exactly what to do in the documentation, because it's that easy. Uh, oh, yeah, get diff. Uh, I just have those. Reset good. Uh, get check. Uh, get status. Get status. Get checkout helper. Make fucking easy. X and I. Uh, okay, so we should be able to look at the 18,000 now. 
this is uh, this one. No, this hundred eighty thousand. I, I don't remember where it was. Um, is it this? Where is it? Where is PC info registers? Oh, that's the we have the register dump in there, and there's the store. There's the store of PC, right? So that is, uh, or not the store of PC, that's two instructions after. If you subtract eight, here's the store of PC. So this, we are now in the context, um, what was it, uh, 54 was the start of our code. Here's where we dump all of the registers, right? So this is, this is our shell code where we dump all the registers. And now we are in virtual memory land. Um, so basically, our current execution environment, we should be able to look at the stack and stuff. Um, we might just want to attach GDB. Um, let's fucking go! And we built a kernel that's identical, so we should be able to GDB this. You, you ready to see some crazy shit, guys? Um, because we built an identi identical kernel to the uh, to the prod kernel, which means that I should be able to do this, GDB, um, uh, set arc uh, arm, um, target remote, one, two, three, four. Now we have, uh, now we're in GDB, uh, you can't see this, sorry. Um, now we can see this code, right? And let's look at the kernel. We're not going to be able to see anything. Let's look at just print uh, print k, right? If we look at print k, we're not going to be able to see um, x10i. Uh, well, that's not going to work because we don't have symbols. But OK, so this, OK, right? No symbols, nothing. We don't understand what's going on. Um, but I should be able to load a file. Uh, load uh, debug file gdb. I forget the command, um, like add file or something like that. Um, debug file directory. That's not necessarily what I want. Um, uh, uh, what, what's the... Not auto load. Hmm. Uh, GDB load symbol file. Let's see if th that works. What is the correct thing? Not. I don't want to load the fucking directory. Uh, add a symbol file. Um. Home pleb. Uh, let's just find a path. Home pleb Motorola. Uh, Android Motorola. Uh, Android Motor Motorola. This. Woo! Fuck yeah! Easy! Holy shit! Step instruction. Uh, display IPC. Now we are executing fucking code. There we go, and we just jumped into our uh, C code. So you want to see some more shit? Let's um. Whew. Well, we changed we changed thrower, um, but if we didn't uh, cargo Tommel, um, we would be able to load that as well. So we could load uh, 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 add symbol file home pleb uh, this. Uh, this is not necessarily going to line up correctly because we changed this binary. We are just assuming that these binaries are going to be similar enough that it might give some output. Um, thrower. Yeah, that's what I fucking thought. Um, okay, uh, let's do a new dump, and, uh, let's save off the thrower for it, and then we can, uh, take a look at everything. God, we're so fucking good! Woo! Easy! Uh, make run. Oh, yeah. 
just rebooted, that's fine. Clean slate. That's what I intended to do. I totally wanted that phone to reboot. Totally fine with that. That's what I wanted it to do. <laughs> Fuck yeah, dude. <laughs> Whoa! Easy! Fucking easy, dude. Fucking easy. All right. And that's why we built a binary identical kernel. This is a signed phone. This is this is official firmware that's signed. We cannot modify the code on this phone. And we just fucking lifted it into QEMU and added symbols to it so we can view what it's like to run in the kernel. God, we're so fucking good sometimes. Um, let's run this. Let's go. Let's go. I'm fucking amped. Uh, let's go get that uh, kernel code open now. Uh, Android, Motorola, kernel. Uh, so we apply this shell code and we install this over the file operations for NVOS. So tag NVOS FOPS, the file operations. So we install a file operation here and mainly what I want to do is see if F async has the same things as ioctal such that we could switch to ioctal and we could single step through ioctal. Um, uh, oh yeah, um, we gotta set this to 512 megs. Oh, we're so fucking good! Easy! This one's not a woodwick, this is a nature's wick. Not nearly as good as a woodwick, to be honest. Um, it, it just doesn't have the same flame. So I think... Um, I need to order some some more candles and that just rebooted that that's fine. That's totally intentional to, to, totally intentional XD Kappa Kappa XD Why don't use pony bug instead of default GDB because I don't give a shit about like all the fancy things people use I just want bone stock easy to use basic stuff. I Don't like customizing my environment that much Sometimes we're just the best. Um Let's go. Let's go. I love how easy we get root on this fucking phone. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> It is so good! Yeah, let's fucking go. Uh, let's see, we got the TT Bro. Alright, um, while that's snapshotting, we can go and improve this code. We can set this to 21. We can go here, set this to 16. Um, this is gonna be dump regs, and then we can say, uh, print. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm just grabbing this code that you can't see right now. This, um, print. This is equal to x semi new. And then we'll say it registers, uh, 16. We got the bro. Bro br1. Br1s. Um... Then we have the TTBCR. Um, uh, we don't know how to do that one yet. Uh, TTBCR. That's fine. It's fine. It's zeroed anyways, so we technically don't need to do that. The Scuttler and the Dacker. 18, 19, and then 20. We have the Scuttler S, 
and the Dacker S. Okay. So I don't know if we'll be able to return to user space with these, uh, with the things that we're currently snapshotting. Um, looks like that worked. Uh, ADB pull. Um, okay. TTBR0, TTBR1, Scuttler S, and Dacker S. So this is technically wrong. Registers, uh, S registers, um, FC register, FC dots, register, G. Fill to fill hold buffer. Okay, yeah, we, oh, yeah. We're, we're downloading that fault core as we speak. <laughs> Slytherin Tupac. <laughs> oh my god. If I watch him uh, anymore, I might off myself so I'm head out. I'm sorry, dude. We'll see you around. Stay safe. Pronouncing Scuttler and Ioctal sounds unreasonable, unreasonably cute. Oh, yeah, I do say I Ioctal, don't I? I didn't even know that. I, I recognized I said Scuttler, and that's kind of weird. But I Octal, I, other people don't do that, do they? Mom, am I normal? No. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> How do you pronounce muscle? I used to say musel, but it is technically muscle. It's supposed to be muscle. What about Ligma? <laughs> Oh, Tar Sarsec coming in here with the ancient memes. <laughs> Showing your age. <laughs> what is this, the 1800s? Are you going to put this on GitHub? Eventually, once, once we have it working. It's Musil. <laughs> the May Maze. We got some May Maze in here, chat. All right, all right, shit. Oh, we're at that worst time of the night to be streaming, unfortunately. U.S. is asleep. EU hasn't woken the fuck up yet. Oh man, it's rough. It's rough. All right, ADB, good job. Good job. Pro proud of you, ADB. You worked so hard. Make der snapshots. Mm, date. Ha <laughs> 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 Sometimes, sometimes, I'm just proud of myself. Ah, uh, format plus by Unix time. Unix time. Ah, uh, percent S. All right. Noise thrower into snapshot this uh All right coral I just wanted to make sure that I saved all the things together. Easy clap. Can we get some easy claps in chat for how easy this is? Um, delete these. Update the registers. Eventually, we could make QMU read a fucking file. Um, S... C T L R. Yeah, I see those easy claps. S C T L R S. Right, like in theory, in theory, Q M U. 
Quemu. Uh, okay. So we have that snapshot. Looking good. That built. Um, this will fail. Wait. I was using the wrong snapshot, too. <laughs> Whoop. Uh... Quid. Is there a way to get an absolute path in Bash? Like, where I can type out the path, and it will say, here's the abs path? Like, I could do, like, abs path on, uh, sh uh, snapshot? Is there a way to do that? There's gotta be a way to do that. There's gotta be a way, right? If there is, I haven't done it my whole life, and I've been missing out. Ooh, no. <sighs> Senpai. Ooh. Did I close the GDB window? No. It's right here. GDB. Target remote. One, two, three, four. X, ten, I. I don't know if I have to set the art. I think I do. Um, uh, target remote one two three four x ten i piece piece of shit went to the reset vector. Um, set arc arm uh, target remote one two three four x ten i pc. What? 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 Okay, yeah. What? Mom. Fifty, fifty-four hex. Uh, uh, did I, did I, did that, did I, yeah, build it? Uh, two six, Scuttler is like a ten C, Dacker. That TTPR1 doesn't look right. No, it's for... Oh, wait. What? Ooh. What? Oh, no. No, that's right. Um... What? 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 What?
But why? This worked before, right? BRO, BR1, BCR, trampoline. Oh, I'm an idiot. <laughs> I need to use the snapshot.pmem. The snapshot.pmem is what actually has the physical memory in a contiguous blob. Well, at least it was a stupid mistake and not a hard mistake. Okay, so we're basically where we just stored PC. Um, none of this stuff has executed yet. Ah, oh. Whoopsie doodles! Um, big whoops. Oh yeah, and then this, uh, oh yeah, th that's just straight shell code. Shell codey doodles. Um, so we want to add symbol file. Um, what do we want? I'm gonna try and grab these from before, wherever they were. Wherever they were. Here we go. Uh huh. Thrower. And. Quarnel. Got the quarnel here. Mm hmm. Yes. 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 X10 IPC, step instruction. Display IPC, step, 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 and here we go, ready, here we, uh, is step gonna go into it? Yes! We're in snapshot device main RS! Fuck yeah! Easy! <laughs> Easy! <laughs> Woo! Okay, um, GDBH... Oh, you. God, we're good, dude. Um. Um. Emulate dot s a uh, here thrower. Binch, binch. Okay. Um. Right, right. Uh, GDB H. Um, uh, commands from file. Uh, uh, GDB. B commands dot text um vim gdb commands dot text add symbol file throw add symbol file thrower add symbol file something else linux or something some, something i don't uh this there we go we'll grab this uh oh um target remote oh, one two three four gdb already running um Okay, did that work? Um, X10 I print K. <laughs> Easy. Easy. Okay, X10 I PC. Um, so we're gonna store some of these things. Uh, display IPC, X10 I PC, 
And then, um, this blicks are zero. Uh, we'll just do, um, int this is zero. Right? So fill that in with a nop. Uh, so basically, uh, we're going to nop that instruction. And this will allow us to continue execution. Uh, we re-enabled interrupts. Pop PC. We're now in VFS VSync range. And we can see locals. There's NVOS file ops. So we can uh, print fop, print deref fop. Yeah. Yeah, here we can see what we have. Here's fsync. There's the fsync that we installed, and here's the fa sync that got clobbered. And that might be one of the one of the one of the problems that we're having with the reliability of this exploits. Oh, ho, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mutex unlock. Do uh, vsync f put. Uh, ret syscall. Do you think we can return back to user space? F-sync, backtrace, oh, oh, oh! easy, oh my god, <laughs> Woo -hoo! nice, nice, oh man, we're in user space, we're in our process, we're in our rust, we're in our rust code right now, here we can return out of fsync, syscall ret. Uh, now we're in thrower main, x10 ips. We're in, we're in the actual R fucking code. We returned back to user space. Yes. Oh yeah. Oh fucking easy. <laughs> also rip ears. <laughs> Sorry. Oh my god, that's good. Oh. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> oh, that's so good. Let's just do some steps. Oh, do you think I can call print? Mmm, we're gonna probably hit IO here. This will probably fail. Um. <laughs> uh. I guess I didn't wanna print to standard out. There we go. So that's branching to a uh, reset vector. Um, so I think, so what is this? Um, I wonder if we, if we hit device IO. Every des desk smash brings the 4K monitor closer to doom. Yeah, I don't know uh, how teetering that is. I can move it forward a bit. Ah. There you go, chat. If you feel more comfortable. <laughs> it was fun. It, I intentionally put it there. It didn't, like, slide back organically. I put it there because uh, I knew it was stable. That's pretty good, guys. It's pretty fucking good. Oh, let's see if we can uh, track that and get back into the kernel. Okay. Um. Uh. uh okay. So, what's the better way to? Is there a way to have? Um. So I've got this shell script, right? Is there a way to have the background tasks exit when the shell script exits? 
Um, uh, kill background tasks on shell script exit. How do I kill my background jobs when it exits? To clean up some mess, trap can be used. Um, it's a built-in to help track. If you only want to kill background jobs, do this. Huh? Huh? Um... Okay. Ooh, nice. Yeah, that worked. That worked. Nice. I don't know if that kills all background tasks or just in the current thing. Um. I mean, maybe it exits? I'm not sure. We, uh, we can get rid of this and see if it exits, but I don't think it did. Yeah, it's still running, right? Okay, so, uh, kill those jobs. And then control C. Yeah. So now I can exit and that will kill that. Depends if it's no hub. All right. Well, I'm happy with that. I think, uh, I think I'm fine with uh, that script. Um... Uh, I don't need the reset good thing. Can get rid of that. And then the diff is now just those registers. That's the only modification we've made the QMU to get this to work, is we just banged in those registers. And there's probably a clean way that we could do that too. Okay, so um, that will immediately attach x10 ipc um, uh, set int uh, this to zero to knock it out. And then uh, we can step back uh, through everything x10 or display ipc step Oh, do I still have these files open or present? I don't know if I deleted the local repo. I didn't. I literally can see source information. <laughs> okay, so we're returning back to user space. And here we go. Or back in user space. Um, yeah. So back to user space. And let's see if we can make it into the kernel. So we're going to go and try and do this print. That's going to format args, which is going to be kind of expensive. But hopefully we can... Oh, TLS failed. Okay. Um... Okay. So, hmm, why would that fail? Or did it fail? No, I think it did. Um, are we running Gen 2? Hell yeah, we are. I wish I could read assembly. Oh, man. Yeah, it's definitely a skill worth learning. Thank you, Citron75, for the 10 biddies. Hell yeah. 
Alright. Alright. Um. Blix R0. See, the problem is I don't know what that value was. So we're gonna. Um. Where is our set? Um, set, 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 set. We're gonna add this to our script. Um, Android, uh, Motorola, thrower, vim, emulate, dot, uh, gdb commands, and we will automatically patch out that instruction, which will, uh, probably screw us up when we um, forget we made that change, X and IPC. So now we should be able to do a, um, I think we can break on this. <laughs> nice! I R. okay. Oh no, it is trying to branch to this. Ah! And then it's Bixlering. Oh, so this is not filled in. Whatever this is. Um, uh, coprocessor 15, CR13, CR03. Thread local storage. Um, so basically, we need to uh, restore that thread local storage register. Honestly, we should fill in the CPSR and like a bunch of different things, but um, we just kind of have another uh, thing we have to fill in here. Um, so let's look for like uh, helper uh, 13.star, 0.star3, TPI Duro, I think it's this. Uh, user read-only thread ID register. P15-0, C13-03. 15-0, R0. Uh, C13, CR03. Um, read, and then BFI. Uh, I think that's checking a bit. BIC clear and then Bixler. So, so we are here, and then MRC. Is it just working? IR, R zero loaded to zero. Okay, and then uh, this is going to be the Bixler display IPC. We return back. And then this is going to read R0, uh, which is null, which is wrong. Um, and then step, that is going to fault. And this is the fault handler. Um, and it looks like we're unable to switch maybe into kernel mode. Um, so there's a chance that we need to figure out what's going on there to uh, branch to 280 subtract LR, LR, and then store to the stack. And uh, I bet our stack is now zero. Um, I, R, S, P. Yeah, S, P is zero. Uh, so basically, we have to go grab some registers. Uh, we have to grab like the um, interrupt stack register, which I don't know what that is on ARM, but I just assume it exists. So um, I'm just gonna make a little shopping list. We want this. Uh, the thread ID register, or I could try and dump all of the CRs. Um, I'm going to grab the read-write one as well. Uh, so those are the user ones. TTBCR, we do that. So basically, there's going to be like a couple registers that we're going to need to fill in. Uh, TTBR1, we do that. VBAR... We don't do that. Um, when high exception vectors are not selected, the V bar holds the exception base address. 
So we would need that if, uh, re if it relocates the exception vectors, which it might. VMP IDR, virtualization, we definitely don't need that because we don't have virtualization running. Um, virtualization TTBR. Okay. Um, TTBR, TTBCR, bunch of those, thumb configuration register, secure, disable, the scuttler. We do the scuttler, right? Yes, we do. Um, maybe there really aren't that many control registers and we could just go through and do all of them. Secure configuration register. Um, looks like vert stuff, maybe secure state. Yeah, don't care about that. Um, revision ID, primary region remap register. Okay, performance counters. Hmm. So mainly we need to figure out the um, how exceptions work. And exception handling. Exception vectors in the base address, routing them. And we need to figure out the stack. So. Hmm. I swore I saw something about like an interrupt stack at some points. Interrupt stacks. One reference. Hmm. Where would that be? That would be. So those are the exception descriptors. Overview of exception entry. Okay. The value of the CPSR is saved into the SPSR for that mode. A link value is saved. Um, an implementation that return uh, includes security ex exceptions. Uh, CPSR is updated with the new context information. The PC is loaded with that and that. Okay. Hmm. Um, actually, maybe we just missed it. The registers are banked based on the current CPU mode in the CPSR. SP, for example, should always be banked in all modes. Fick has more than that. Determines the mode which the exception must be taken. You need to switch modes in your dumping code and save these as well. Oh, really? So CPSR, okay. Hmm. Well, that's a lot, a lot more difficult than I expected. Um... So condition flags, uh, IT, oh, that's for if then, Giselle bit, <laughs> GE, greater than equal flags, E, endianness, execution, mask, uh, basically the interrupt mask, the thumb mode, and then the mode field, the current mode of the processor. Bits four through zero, okay. I like how it's unpredictable. So how does that work? So like you set up your interrupt stack by setting the mode field 
setting SP and then unsetting the mode or then resetting the mode field. Like when you want to program interrupt uh, handling code, that's what you do. Okay. So there's no other way to access these things. That's interesting. It's exactly how you do it. Okay. And then it just uses that. Wow. So how many modes are there? Um, okay, so the privilege level, so we're running PL1, hypervisor is the only thing that's PL2, and we don't have that. This candle is burning fast, it's burning relatively fast, oh, now you can't see it, <laughs> Uh. Mode changes can be made under software control or can be caused by an in, uh, external or internal interrupt. So what is the difference between FIC and IRQ? So supervisor is the mode that I'm running in. Monitor is just like a secure mode. Um, FIC is fast interrupt. Oh, I see. So... Uh, So why didn't I need to... When it returns back to user space, it's done like a soft context switch? Or did I get lucky that... Or did I return to user space and I was using a kernel stack or something? Like, do I need to save all registers or just like SP? I guess, I mean, that comes up, that comes down to the, how the OS does it. But like, should I switch to user and save all those registers and switch to FIC and IRQ and supervisor and save them all separate? Not all regs are banked, okay. Um. Oh, they literally tell you. Um, hmm. I did not even know that about ARM. I'm kind of surprised. Use of banked registers. Here we go. Um, user or system. Uh, so what mode is the processor in? I mean, I guess I didn't actually program it. So, uh, is system the kernel? Is user, user space and system is kernel? Hype is hypervisor. What's supervisor? Or is supervisor the kernel? Because I think I'm in supervisor mode when you, when you initially boot. And that would be the initial state that I have in QMU. So I should probably store. Um, I, I definitely need to store the uh, uh, CPSR. Supervisor is the kernel, yeah. So I guess my R8, R9, R10, R12 SP, and let's verify that. Um, so when I return back to user space, um, I think what we'll find, uh, display I PC, whoa, lost power there for a second. Um, good thing I have a candle. When I return back to user space, I suspect that those registers are not going to get, um, okay. 
Okay, it's loading SP and LR there. Um, but that was a that took an SV um that took a fic, right? Would a fast is called B A F I Q? Banked core registers and special registers. So we have SPSRs, and I think SPSRs get written. Um, but yeah, I am currently in supervisor mode, if I'm not mistaken. Fick and IRQ is hardware. Okay. Then why wouldn't you just always use fast? Why would you ever use slow? <laughs> um, IR. Okay. So CPSR 10... Uh, would mean that I am where was it? Um, ten. I am in user. Oh, I just switched to user. Magic trick. Thank you so much for the Twitch Prime. Hell yeah. Um. Okay. So. Basically, I need to save all of these. So I need to save all of these registers, effectively. Uh, with the exception of hype, because I can't get into hypervisor mode, right? Um, supervisor, abort, undefined, monitor. So I, I guess uh, IRQ and FIC are external interrupts. Monitor is, I don't know, undefined is an undefined instruction. I, it fucking tells me, doesn't it? Oh, no, it doesn't. That's for the bankings. Abort our page faults. Okay. Yeah, that was going to be my guess. Um, system mode is p at PL1, has the same registers in user mode, and is not entered by any exception. Supervisor is the default uh, when you do a supervisor call. Um, it enters supervisor mode on reset, and that's where I start. Uh, abort mode for a data abort or prefetch abort. Undefined for an undefined instruction. Uh, oh, an inst instruction-related exception, including any attempt to execute. Okay. FIC and IRQ are interrupt. Hypervisor is obviously hypervisor. Monitor is for secure monitor, which we won't have, would be my guess. Um, so really... The only things I care about are user. Um, if FIC and IRC are only external interrupts, then I only care about user, supervisor, system I don't really care about, uh, abort, and undefined. So right now, I am going to the abort. Um, okay. Okay. can use the MRS, bank register, or MSR instructions to transfer between the core registers and the special registers. Um, okay. Monitor mode, MRS, and MSR. Wait. Can I just access them? Unpredictable on those. They added that? Okay. All right, let's uh, look in Equemu and see if there's anything that makes sense there. Because if we're setting them, then they need to exist. Um... Um, CPU arm state. So we can just look through. Uh, regs for the current mode. I think it's safe to say we have handled those 100%. The X regs, uh, we've ignored those. Uh, ignored those. Oh, wait, those are 64-bit registers for ARM64. So those don't matter. And PC on, X60, uh, on ARC64 gets its separate one. Thus... Uh, 
we can ignore these. So regs we have set up, 100%, done. X regs in PC are for ARX64, so we don't need those at all. Um, P state isn't an architectural register for ARMv8. It's convenient for us to assemble it into a 32-bit thing. And then ARX64, so we don't need this. This is also uh, ARM64 state flags. Um, the cached TB flag state. Um, I don't know what that is, so I'm going to make note of that. Uh, TB flags. Uh, we can do that here. To save. Dot text. Um, reg 16. Um, TB flags. Uh, cached cached as H flags um uh cpsr use cpsr uh use cpsr read slash cpsr write right because we want to use cpsr write to update that correctly um spsr um banked SPSR 8 banked, R13 8 banked, R14. Uh, so those are, um, okay. Uh, user regs 5. Um, so this is R8 through R12. Uh, FIC regs uh, R8 through R12. So this is, um, R13 is what? SP, yeah, SP, LR, um, SPSR. Um, so that's going to be the current SPSR. All the banked things. The CPSR flag cache, uh, which we're going to use write CPSR, which is going to update all of that. So if we do uh, write CPSR, um, CPSR write. We take the state, the value, the mask, and the right type. Um, and that will update everything. So if the mask is all Fs, then all of these internal flags will get updated, right? So we want to do that. Um, and that's everything, so that's done. Um, then we have the ARC64 banked uh, regs don't exist. Uh, the ELR and SPs. For ARX64, I'm guessing we don't have to fill those in at all. And then CP15, um, we could we could maybe fill in these CSSELR. Um, uh, CSSELRS. I don't know if I need the non-supervisor ones. Do you think that matters? Should I grab those? CSSELRNS, the non-supervisor ones. So I can do both. Um, uh, so CPU ID, CSSELR, S the Scuttler, CPACR, architectural feature access. Okay. C pointer, which is ARM V8. We don't need, have to worry about that. X scale, I'm guessing we don't have to care about that. Secure debug, non secure access control register. Um, do you think I need that? Um, NSACR. I'm going to guess that this is only for secure. Yeah, which I don't think I care about that. Um, obviously, the TTBR0, TTBR1. Uh, virtual translation, don't need that. MMU translation table base. So the TCR, do I care about that? Oh, that is the um, that is the uh, TCR, which is the um, uh, TT uh, BCR. When a service happens, the CPU switches to supervisor mode. I'm not sure if Linux immediately switches to sys and continues from there, um, or if it stays in supervisor. Yeah, so we'll just grab all of this stuff. MPU data cacheable bits. I don't know if I care about those. 
Uh, Dacker. We need the Dacker. Um, MPU stuff. Hypervisor, secure. Fault status registers, which I'm guessing I don't need to do. MPU base size. Cache lockdown registers. Yeah, MPU's Cortex M's. Yep, know that. Um, oh, here we go. Uh, this, which is the user read write. The secure banks don't map anywhere. Okay. Um, So are these just all in sequence? Like, can I just dump the CP uh, 15? Like, is there a way I can just enumerate everything and just fill everything in? I mean, obviously I need to figure out where it goes in these structures. Exceptions, I don't know how much I need about those. S error, VFP. Um, I could definitely have issues with the vector units uh, where I'd want to save those as well. Um, but yeah, I think we're pretty close with some of these basic ones. So um, I need the uh, URO. What is this? The... Um, context ID, I think I need that. <sighs> hmm. God, there's a lot of fucking state. <laughs> if this were x86, I just know what I need. Um, just joined. What are you trying to do right now? We're trying to, uh, move, uh, we're basically trying to take a snapshot of a real Android device and then move it into, um, QEM QEMU such that we can, uh, analyze it and step through it and stuff. That's where my arm knowledge leaves me as well. Okay. Well, the bank's register hint was massive. So thank you for that. That honestly could have taken an hour to figure out. Like... That's not even what I was expecting that I would have probably literally spun for a, a while. Um, like, that would have been really, really tough for me. Okay, so... Uh, I mean, I can just go down the list and just do everything there. Um, reg 16, okay. Let's, um, let's do this. Um, whoops. Think. Oh my God. It's always confusing of how to organize these. Ugh. I'm literally just hitting random buttons. Okay, I want this one on main. There we go. Okay, we did it. We did it. All right. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to save all of this stuff. Oh, how did that even work? I didn't even have room for these registers. What the fuck was I doing? Um. Okay, we'll just make 64 here. And then that way, uh, things don't move around. Actually, we'll just do like 256. How much do we allocate for the shell code? Oh, we allocate what we need. We literally allocate what we need. Um, and since we allocate what we need, where's that code at, right? Uh, shellcode.bin, shellcode.len. Uh, yeah, we allocate exactly as much as we need. So uh, this is gonna branch over this. And then I'm just gonna say like 1024. 
Just a big number that we're never going to exceed. We never have to worry about it. So just reserve a bunch of space. And then that means that we can hard code some addresses in here. Like when we zap this out with a NOP, um, it won't move around because we're not gonna move, we're not gonna add space here. Um, tribute to the audacious Gamozo, the legit, hell yeah, Lord Alpaca. Glad you're enjoying it. Thank you for the 100 biddies. Magic Trick subscribed with Prime. I think, I think I called that out, but if I didn't, I'm sorry. Thank you so much for that. Um, so, here are 16 registers. I'm happy with that. Next. Uh, we don't need these. They're ARC64, the 32 regs, and PC. And then P-State... Um, which is something that is made up by here, and ARC64, so we don't care about those. TB flags. So we have to go find TB flags. Okay. Um, cache TB flag state. Okay. Um, uh, TB flags. H state. There's something that like uh, flushed H state. I'm gonna go back to uh, H state printf. Where's my Where's my code? Oh, I got rid of my printf. Um. Okay, here we go, um, folk mods, uh, folk, okay, that way if I search for folk, it'll show up, nice, I use C++, C syntax is hard to understand, it's basically the same, they're pretty, they're pretty damn similar, what do you not understand about C syntax? How do I want to do this? Rebuild H flags. Rebuild H flags. Rebuild H flags A32, which is some exception shit. You think I need this? This looks awfully complex. Uh, uh, it's stuff from the Scuttler. Okay, I think I'm fine. Um, I think that is a cached thing. Um, I'm going to close a lot of these out. Make some space. Uh, target arm. Um, I'm pretty sure that's a, a, a not a real register. So cached uh, TV flags. Okay, CPSR. So we want to get the CPSR um, for the current mode and the SPSR. I use Kotlin. C++ syntax is hard to understand. I've never used Kotlin, actually. CPSR and the SPSR. So CPSR is current and SPSR is like saved or something like that would be my guess of what those mean. Um... Oh, are those banked? The SPSRs are banked. So there's one SPSR. Okay, how do I access the CPSR? MCR. Uh, actually, MRC. Um, can I regex? No. Uh, P15. So... That was Dacker. CPACR. Misses? Oh, is it, is it just a thing? Um... 
It's just a, a like single simplified instruction. How to read and set CPSR. Yeah, it's it's literally just uh, misses, and then uh, register CPSR. Okay. Um. Uh, R zero CPSR. Um, store R0 registers plus hex 40. We're just going to go down the list. Save CPSR. All right. Bad offsets. 18 uh, registers. Oh, um, that's too far away. Okay, 512. Fine. There's plenty of registers. All right. You can also access the banked regs with MRS, like R8 FIQ. So they added an ARMv7. No weird bit flipping. Oh, sweet. Um, and then, uh, can I get the uh, SPSR? What if I just type some bullshit? Okay, so I can get the uh, SPSR. Uh, to 44, right? So that's the CPSR and the SPSR. Now, we're going to get the banked SPSR. Save banked SPSRs. Um, R0. We're just going to go down the list. We're going to try and do everything. Um... Uh, here we go. Uh, wait, that wasn't the one out. Hmm. Here we go. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, um, we could just have the user SPSR. Can I just say user on that? Air flag for that. Instruction expected. Okay. So can I do uh, SPSR? Um, uh, let's just say SVC. Nice. Okay. So that's, I guess, the user SPSR, or the, it's just the SPSR. So what are these banks? Um, are these modes in order? User fic? No. These seem to be in a different order than these. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Fuck. I don't know what these are. Uh, here we go. So, is this just the user SPSR then? I guess, I don't know, because if I'm in, yeah, the SPSR is banked. Um, what's a bank? It's basically a, a different uh, register table which is used depending on the mode that you're executing in. So if we switch the execution modes, it will use uh, different register tables. Um, we call those banks. So basically if I switch modes, it will stop using a certain stack pointer and use a different stack pointer. So right now we're going through all of the banks to try to save all of the state from all of them. Um, that's basically what we're trying to do. Oh, and I'm curious, if I do sync on this phone, was, is it going to crash? ADB shell, sync. Okay. Um, so, we have the current SPSR. And then I guess we just save these. We just go down the row. Um... Can I do that? 
is that a comment? I need to make sure this isn't, um, okay, it's, it is not a comment. Um, thus, MRS R0 SPSR store R0 uh, registers plus OX44, right? So I'm guessing user sys is what they put in zero, which is kind of strange to me. Um, do they ever use that? I don't think so. Service, irk, abt, und, pick. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't think they're going to use... Hmm. I don't know. A bank is also where ARM puts the money they get from their licensees. Woo! Service. Abort. Um, oops. Eh. Alright, um, get the address of, uh, uh, registers into R1. User and system mode don't have an SPSR. Okay, so they just probably have a dummy slot in there. But the current mode has an SPSR. But I don't know what the current mode is, so I don't know where to put that in the banked SPSR, but I guess it doesn't... Mm, mm, does it matter? Basically, I have the current SPSR, and do I have to go and decode the CPSR to determine which place to fill this in in QMU? I guess that depends on QMU's implementation. But, um... Uh... Um... Can I do... Uh, how do I do the, um... Updating indices... MRS, oops. Invalid constant after fix up. Uh, wait, what is... Is that gonna give me the address of registers? I'm concerned. LDR. Mm, no, that's actually reading it. Um. I want to ADR that, right? Address of. How do I, how do I, how do I get the fucking address of registers? Or is that ARM64? Thirty-five invalid constant after fix up. Is it too far away? Because I'm pretty sure I can do ADR. Uh. Go to the address of next. Is it some range issue? Is it too far away? What? 
I I don't. It's too far away. 128 is probably good enough. Let's see if we can do 256. I just want to make enough room that I don't have to worry about it. Um, okay, 180. Yeah, I don't think we're going to have 180 registers that we store. Um, so that's going to get the address of registers. Uh, get the address of registers uh, um, uh, after the GPR bank. And then we should be able to do some, is it bang? That's gonna index it, right? That's gonna update R1, right? Register right back. The base register used to calculate the address it, uh, is updated. Yes, 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 it's all coming back. Okay, so now we can do this, save uh, CPSR, SPSR, and now we can just brrr, go through all the shit. Um, save CPSR, uh, save SPSRs. So we'll save the uh, service, um, abort. Nice. Uh, yes. Um, user service abort undefined. Um, UDF, UND. Uh, service abort undefined. Irk and Fick, I don't care about those. And then monitor, I also don't care about, right? Uh, those are external interrupts, which we won't have, a uh, hypervisor, which we don't have, and a monitor, which is for secure mode, which I won't have. Um, so I think that's fine, right? And it builds. Yay! Save banked uh, R13s. Um, MRS, um, R0. Um, R13... Uh, those are the stacks, and there's a stack for every single one. Uh, R1, bang. Oops, R13, R13. Uh, user, whoops. Aww. Uh, sys? Uh, it's not called user sys, is it? No. Eh. I guess, is that just the current mode? I think that's just the current mode. Um, oh, whoa, we don't have that. Oh, um, it's gonna be uh, SP, right? Uh, hello? Oh, MRS, Jesus. Um, okay, now let's see if there's a, a user for LR. There is. What about a sys? And they, those should be the same. Oh, nice, there isn't one. Uh, user, service, abort undefined. Save banked R14s. Um, and that's going to be, uh, it's actually SP, right? SPLR, I'm guessing. SPLR, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, CPSR, service abort undefined, user service abort undefined, user service abort undefined. Um, okay. Okay. Nice. Uh, so that's all of those, all of those, all of those. Then we have the R8 through R12. Son of a bitch. Uh, I wonder if they have aliases for these. All right, all right, all right. Oh, I actually wonder because I... 
Oh, there's no, um... Which ones have of these? Just Fick? So, uh... Basically, we have the users for these. Um... Save, uh, user bank R8 through R12. 8, 9, 10, 11. 12, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And I bet I can change these to R14 now. Because I had them, I typed MSR like an idiot. Oh. Nope. Not a thing. Okay. So here we're going to save all of the user. Uh, R8. 9, 10, 11, 12. So those are the user regs. And then we don't care about the fic regs. At least I don't think we do, because um, we're not going to have external interrupts. Then the CPSR uh, caches, which are fine. These uh, ARC64s, which we don't care about. So that should be all that initial uh, stage of registers. Looks really good. OK. Nice. Nicely done. Um, all right, so now we need to get uh, these other things. Let's get this, uh, I guess, CPU ID. Um, so this is going to be, uh, so what do we do? We got all of those, this, 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 and all of these, uh, except for the hypervisor, which we don't need, um, yeah. That's, that looks really good. Uh, good morning, uh, Alpha888. How's it going? How are you doing? Hope you're having a wonderful time. <laughs> um, okay. So we need to find the CPU ID. Ugh, I keep struggling to find the window. CPU ID. Um, so I just want to see a co-processor 15 ARM v7. I want like a summary of the registers. That would be really nice. Like, I just want, I just want a list. No. Um... Time for brec of time for breakfast and a cup of coffee enjoying stream. Hell yeah. Sounds like a good morning. Um MSR. So those are banked register accesses. 812, those ELR, uh, which I don't have. Okay, SPSR. Except for your system and user mode. Yup. Nice. So we got all of those, and then C0 CPU ID. I mean, I could try to look for where those are set. Um, target arms uh, CPU.h. CPU ID, C0 CPU ID. And I could just see where that's accessed. Uh, C0 CPU ID. Um, And we'll look at, I guess, helper. C0 CPU ID. OMAP TI config, right? All right, here we go. Pre V8 MIDR state. Need all those rights ignored. Okay, so we have a. C0 CPU ID, um, which is this MIDR. Um, and if I actually learn what this notation looks like, we could maybe figure out how to type this out. So it's coprocessor 15, register number zero. Is that this? This is the register to read it into. And then we have. I guess this, I think it's P15. I don't know what the zero is. Um, that's the register to read it into. And then the C2, so this is probably a C0, C0, opcode zero, 
right? That would be my guess. So let's look for the MIDR and just double check. And if that's the case, then we can um, main ID register. Um, oh, cool. That has, ah, nice. Haha, <laughs> the Giselle. Uh, zero RT zero zero zero. Okay. So what, what is the first zero? Opcode one. Uh, CPNE is FF. Ah, so it is just in order. Zero, zero. Uh, CRN, CRM. CPCRN, CRM, opcode one and opcode two. And the any means you can use anything to read it. Okay, cool. Makes sense. Um, zero, three. Okay, nice. So this is, um, I didn't even know Giselle was a thing. Yeah, it's crazy. It's so bad. It's so bad. Uh, I have a phone with Giselle. We actually found that out the other day. So we might do some Giselle hacking stuff just because, fuck it. Um, so this is Q-E-M-U. Uh, C0 CPU ID, right? So we're gonna try and make note of what these things are. So load that into R0, 0, 0, 0. Bam. Okay. Next, CSS ELR NS. Um, so how do I know Oh, are they banked? Secure and non-secure. Oh. Oh, trust zone. Okay, so I don't I don't give a shit. Um I only care about the uh, non-secure then. Wait, I was using the S before. That was the only way I got the other stuff working. But maybe that's because I had like CPSR in a weird mode or something. So I'm guessing I want the non-secure. Yeah? <laughs> Don't ask me shit. Well, like, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, I don't think. Um, I don't think it, CSS ELR, how do you switch between secure and non-secure modes? What, what register holds that information? If you never use trust zone, you just stay in secure, ah, I see. Okay, um, hard to say if this phone uses trust zone, I don't know. Um, so ultimately, I just am going to save one, CSS, ELR, NS. Uh, we'll just say S, right, secure. Um, so this is going to be an MRC. It's on uh, P15. The uh, OPC0 is 3. Wait, what? Oh, they changed, wait. Is this 3? Oh, no. Uh, C0 to C0. Uh. Why do they always print it in different ways? 2 C0, C0. Well, that doesn't line up. I mean, the 2 does. OPC3, the fuck is that? Uh, 
Um, so this is two zero zero zero. All right, two zero zero zero. CSS ELR. And what does that hold? Um, cache size selection. So that probably doesn't matter, but whatever. Um, two zero zero zero. All right. Two zero zero zero. Okay. Two zero zero zero. So opcode one zero zero zero. I don't know what this is. I don't know what opcode zero is. It's weird to me. I don't know what it is. I don't give a shit. We're moving on. Um, the scuttler. Let's take a look at the scuttler. So let's see if we can get this right. Um, SCTLR, um, S, and the scuttler S should be an opcode one of a zero, a CRN of a one, a CRM of a zero and a zero. Is that right? We do it later. Zero, zero, one, zero. Okay. Woo. We did it. Okay. Now we know how to read this stuff. SCTLR. Next. CPACR. Um, and do I want to use write? So we can just, huh? oops. Um, Uh, write ignore. Okay, yep. Uh, C S S E L R S, and this is C S S E L R write, and then we would pass it this thing. I don't know how to find that. So coprocessor reg info. I don't know if I want to use those write functions. Um, that does a raw write value and f. That just writes it. Okay, so if it ends up going into a raw write, then we don't care. Um, Basically, I'm trying to go through to see if there's anything that needs to be updated in other registers. Um, that's going to do a raw write and then a TLB flush and then a, a rebuild. Um, so this one is fine that we just filled that in. CSS ELR write, and that's a raw write. Um, okay, C. Oh, this is a scuttler. No, whoa, what is this? We copied this. We haven't we haven't done anything yet, right? Oh Jesus. Uh, CSS ELR. Okay, done. Scuttler. And then this this is gonna be the CPACR. Um, EL1. Architectural feature access. Let's just see if this is in here. CPACR. Coprocessor access control. I feel like I might be fine skipping this one, but maybe I won't. Might as well just not skip it. CPACR. Um, CRN1, CRM0, opcode10, uh, opcode22. Two, two. Why do they change the order of this every time? CPACR, let's just double check. 0102, 0102, okay. CPACR, and then this is um, CPACR EL1. Okay. Oh, they keep changing that shit around. Uh, CPACR writes. Value, uh, it's basically masking off things and then just uh, setting the value. Um, okay, so we shouldn't have to worry about anything there because it's just 
filling in that value. Uh, ARMv8, we're not ARMv8. We're not on an X scale um, security bug. We don't need that. Non-secure access control register. I don't think I need that either. Oh, do I need secure debug enable? No, probably not. MMU TTBR0. We're back. We're back. We got the titty burrs. Uh, store R0, R1. Um, okay, TTBR0, and then let's see. Uh, TTBR0 NS. Um, 0, 2, 0, 0. Yeah, zero two zero zero looks good. Zero two zero zero. Um, TTBR one. One, that's it. Zero two zero one. Okay. Um, the virtual we won't need. Uh, TCR, EL. Uh. And that is the TTBCR, and that is uh, two zero zero two. Okay. <laughs> we did it. TTBCR. Uh, Scuttler. That should be the same as what we did before. Then we have the Dacker, but we're not there yet. Okay. VTCR we don't need. MPU, MPU, don't need any of that. MMU, domain access control register, which they've unioned with the MPU um, write buffer thingy thing. So uh, Dacker S, these are all unioned together. And thus, uh, let's get the Dacker, which is a um, uh, 0, 0300, 0, 0. store R0, R1. I'm learning so much right now. This is so fucking cool. Um, I've never really gotten into the nitty gritty of a lot of these uh, architectural things on ARM. MPU, don't need it. MPU, don't need it. Hypervisor, don't need it. Uh, secure configuration register. Ah, ha ha. I bet that is the uh, thing that configures whether it's in secure mode or not. I'm just gonna leave that as is. Um, fault status registers, I'm guessing I don't need those. DFSR, I'm guessing I don't need that. MPUs, don't need those. Fault address registers. Um, well, let's see, DFAR. I'm guessing these are the addresses, the faulting address that caused a abort. Yeah, so these are like status registers that are filled in when an exception occurs. Uh, translation results, um, cache lockdown registers, performance monitor control registers, memory attribution things, um, vector base address. Uh, I probably should get that, the VBAR, uh, VBAR S, because this could affect uh, where the entry points are to the, um, get the VBAR, uh, get VBAR. Uh, so this is a CRN12, CRM0, 0, 0, 0. So that is the base address. Uh, I'd imagine, I'm just bullshitting. I'd imagine the VBAR is the, um, the address. Yeah, the vector base address. So the base address of where the exception handlers are, uh, 15, 0, 12, 0, 0, 15, Zero twelve zero zero. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, MV bar, the monitor V bar. We don't need that. Context ID. Ooh, what's the FCSE? Hmm, that's some fancy feature. Ah, uh, fast context switch. Um. They deprecate use of it. It's optional in ARMv7. Okay, I'm guessing they won't use it then. Uh, context ID. Oh, is this what I wanted before? VMSA, PMSA, okay. ARMv6. Where's the table for ARMv7? Context ID. 
current processor identifier um, and the ACID. Okay, that is going to be important. Um, let's check that out. Context IDR write, raw write, TLB flush. Okay. Um, uh, get uh, context IDR, MRC, P15, um, 0, R0, uh, C13, C01, store R0, R1, bang. It's the context IDR, 15, 0, 13, 0, 1. Perfect. Um, Oh yeah, and let's say uh, kimu um, ttbr zero uh, s kimu ttbr uh, one s kimu. Let's make sure I get all these right. Uh, ooh, whoop! There we go. Um, um, TTBRs, TTBR, uh, TCR, TCR, EL, um, and we're three. TCR EL. Yeah. 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 Nice. Well done. Well done. I am learning ARM. Uh, Dacker. This is going to all come in handy when we make an embedded uh, RTOS. For sure. Uh, QMU. Um, Dacker S. QMU. Uh, VBAR. VBAR S. Cortex M's are very different. Well, rip. That's fair. We won't be doing half this shit. Uh, I won't need the EL1. Just this one. Um, Kimu Context IDRS. Um, what's user? EL0? Or is it EL1? Well, we're saving that. Context IDR. Oh, this is secure, not secure. I don't think it matters. Um, context IDR. Then uh, user RW thread register. Um, so this is where I wonder if it's, yeah, because we have, I, I think we need to, I think we need to go into non-secure mode. Um, because this is a thread pointer um, ID uh, user rewritable non-secure. Or maybe user implies non-secure. So user and then privileged. So EL1 is user. P, uh, I'm guessing this is privileged. This is some weird shit. Uh, hypervisor. And then this is secure at EL3. Um, so whatever define, what controls are EL? Um, so the coprocessors, they just have MMIR regions for core configuration. Yeah, way easier. Nice. Um, 
I'm really scared. I, I think maybe I'm supposed to have the, um, I'm supposed to be in non-secure mode, I think. How do I get to non-secure mode? Um, is it the CSS ELR? No, that's cache. Fuck. If your firmware is running trust zone stuff, you already are in NS mode. But I Q, QEMU doesn't know that. I need to know what register contains the information that would let me know that. You need to pwn the TZ kernel. <laughs> I've done it. <laughs> I've done that shit. Not on this phone, but I've done that in the past. Um... Main ID, CTR, TCM, alias of the MIDR, MPU type, multiprocessor affinity, revision ID, processor feature register. I think these are read onlys. Um, CSS ELR, Scuttler, auxiliary control. Data fault status. So these are status registers. Data region base. Cache and branch predictor. Cache, 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 cache. Don't give a fuck. Perf, don't give a fuck. Context ID. These ones I care about. Is it in the SCR? Do we do that? System control register. Match case. Ah, there we go. Secure configuration register. Um, non secure bit. The bit determines the security state of the processor. Secure state. And non secure state. All modes except for monitor mode. Okay, so if you're non secure, every. If you're non secure, then everything. Wait, what? If non secure is clear, then everything is in the secure state. I'm looking for TZ, trust zone, um, anything that would indicate uh, if I'm in secure mode or not. Hey, there's the CR, nice. Um, oh, here's the memory regions, cool. Power of reason unknown. Security that. I know you can't see like some of this. I'm just mainly looking through to see if anything says uh, current mode, secure, like anything. Um, does ARM v7 unconditionally support secure mode? Like, can I just read that register? Can I just read the, uh, S, uh, the SCR? Um... Hypervisor configuration. So here's the SCR. 
I mean, we can just we can just try to read it. Um. So this is after what? We just read the Dacker. Okay, let's read the um, SCR. And if we're not in secure mode, then uh, so SCR EL3 makes sense. It's only accessible in one of the modes. Um, and then this is uh, code processor 15. Um, opcode one is a six. CRN is a one. CRM is a one. And opcode two is a zero. Okay, so that's gonna get the SCR. Then fault status registers. I'm guessing all of these are status info things that I don't care about, so we're scrolling past them. Perf stuff we don't care about. Um, I would say you can execute everything in secure mode no matter what. The only thing this bit affects are peripherals. Okay. So do I just ignore that then? Just stay in secure mode? Um, so the question is how does that affect the, um, I guess if you're in user land, it uses this EL1. So let me just see everything here. So these are unused. Basically, this, you use the same page table. Um, okay. Scuttler, NS, hypervisor, Scuttler. Okay, okay. It's all making sense now. It's, it's like really starting to click. Um, these different modes. We basically have user land, we have kernel, we have hypervisor, and we have trust zone. Um, those are the four different operating modes. Okay, um, so we basically care about the, uh, what's the FCSE? Um, that was some secure shit, wasn't it? Fast context switch, yeah, ignore that. Um, context ID, so the context IDR, we only care about the secure one because there's not a separate one for user space, and thus, we just get that one. And then we get to the user RW thread register, and then in this one, this is basically, um, so, is, so the thing is, like, I don't, this is where I'm confused, right? You might have secure mode and kernel space. I'm not sure if ARM v7 has that. So here's where I'm confused. If the kernel is storing a, a thread register, then where does it go? If we're in secure mode, then wouldn't it be in EL3 or would it be here? Are we only in EL3 if we're in monitor mode? Um... Because this is user and kernel. And basically, I need to figure out which one I need to fill in. And I don't know if I need to fill in EL3. Or if I need to fill... Like, I know I need to get the user one. But I don't know if I need to get, uh, like, this one. Let's just... Maybe it doesn't matter. Because I think this is the privileged one. Yeah, the PL1 thread ID register. Right? And then there's the user ones. And that's why I think I'm, like, I don't know if I can just, I guess... I just need to make sure I'm not in monitor mode, I think is the main thing. I think that's the concern. So I am, I'm probably in EL1. Right? Uh, if I'm in EL1, then wouldn't I be using the NS ones? But I'm setting the S ones. I'm so confused now. Um... CSS ELR. C 
CPSR. Where's the skur? It's zero. Okay. Basically, how do I how do I know if I'm in EL one, EL three, or EL zero? Like, does being in non secure mode, uh, does being in secure mode mean that the kernel is running at EL three? I don't think so. I think I'm supposed to be running at EL one. And that's really confusing to me. Um, uh, yo, um, S E E N S and C P S R. So the C P S R tells me um, there should be a secure E L one as well. Well, that's why I'm confused, right? Because there's this is non secure EL one. <laughs> Fuck. So we know that the SCE is currently zero. Oh, you say SCE? Or you mean SCR? And then CPSR. Um, V7 is a mess. Yes, it fucking is. Jesus. No wonder this shit is so cheap. <laughs> who Who would be able to sell this? Um, is it, is it basically a combination of whether you're in, um, if you're in monitor mode, if I'm not in monitor mode, am I just in non-secure? I have no idea where that opened here. Ah, okay. Oh, there we go. Nice. I love how they they made this slide at ARM, and they're like, yeah, we've made a good architecture. <laughs> a plus. <laughs> okay. Um, we are in non-secure mode. No, we're in secure mode. So we are running an EL3. Wait, what? Am I interpreting that correctly? Um, if EL3, NASA astronauts just arrived at the ISS, one of them had a baby Yoda. Oh, that's so cool. So, okay, here, here's what's confused. So, monitor is obviously EL3. Duh. Now, <laughs> the service is in both. But I'm reading this, if EL3 is 32-bit, then does that, like, <sighs> Um, 
Okay, it's basically ARM v7a compatibility here. I think it is an EL3. I think the kernel is at EL3. If EL3 is 32-bit, then these fields are present here, right? Then service and everything, right? Literally everything is in uh, EL3. So it's either EL3 or EL0. So user space is at EL0, and EL3 um, is everything else. That's my fucking verdict. And thus, I only care about TPIDR EL3 or TPID NS. I don't care about this. It doesn't exist. That's my verdict. That is my verdict. Um, I'd say so as well. Yeah. Okay. So then I do want this S variance of all of these, which also makes sense as to how things were executing. I think we have made progress. Um, so now we need the TPI, the, 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 um, NS. So this one I want the NS of. Okay. Um, context IDR. So I want the S variant here. Basically, only this and this. Only the first one and the last one will be used. It's a risk architecture. It's so simple. Yeah, bullshit. Um, what's going on looks interesting. We are uh, basically saving the state of a, an Android phone that we have on our desk um, such that we can re- load it into QMU and continue execution uh, such that we can debug it and fuzz it and do other things with it. Okay. So, we got the context IDR S. Done. Done. Get this. QMU, for QMU, this is going to be the NS variant. What's this? Where is this? The secure banks don't map anywhere. I hate this architecture. Do you understand why I do everything on MIPS and Risk Five, and not this piece of shit architecture that everyone seems to think is Risk for some fucking reason? It's a terrible architecture. Stop using ARM. It fucking sucks. Damn it. <laughs> um. So I don't even know what I'm gonna read. I don't even know how I set that register. I think I want this one then. I think this is the register that will actually be used then. When I'm when I'm in user land, I think that is what actually will get used. So, we're going to save this. Jesus. Piece of shit architecture. Coprocessor 15 CRN 13 CRM 0 opcode 10 this 2. Ah, so it's just that. Um, come on, where is it? This. I hate this shit. Why did that go into print mode? 15, 1302. 15, 1302. Okay, sweet. We did it. Um, next, we want, so the secure banks of these don't map anywhere. Okay, so we get the, this. I don't know what it is, but we're getting it. And this is the QMU. Pro abyss. Um, 
15, 13, 0, 4. Okay. And then we want the read only one. This. Let's find where this is. RO. This is the three. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so this is Uro. And this is at three. Okay. One, two, three, four. And that makes sense, right? So the read only, the read writes, and then the PRW, which is the uh, privileged read write. And I bet there are things in the kernel that do this uh, to do privileged. Uh, um, this is basically probably the, the privileged place uh, where you store your thread locals. So let's go and see if we can find thread local. Actually, Linux, I think, stores thread locals on the uh, stack. Um, let's see if we can search. Uh, program text for this. Um, uh, I forget in Ghidra how to search. I mean, I can do instruction patterns. Uh, but I think I need hex or binary data. Yeah, you can't um, you can't assemble in this. Enter bytes manually. Load from listing. Select instructions from the listing to populate the table. Okay, so let's just go find an MRS. Um, uh, uh, sorry, an M, uh, MRC. Shouldn't be too hard to find one, right? Search for a, uh, MRS, uh, MRC, whoops, MRC. Come on, Ghidra. Yeah, we'll just search for, uh, dismiss. Uh, mnemonics. I don't know why Ghidra is so slow at searching, to be honest. Not case sensitive. Fucking Java, dude. V7, V8 should both be EL3 on reset. Yeah. Taro, oh, thank you. Uh, Taro Zero, thank you so much for the Twitch Prime. Hell yeah. Glad you're enjoying the contents. Now Europe is starting to wake up, so now we're gonna have viewership on the rise. I'm fucking excited. Okay, so I've actually, I didn't know you could do this in Ghidra. I never knew that you could select something. So now we can do instruction patterns. And we can say, um, I want to find, um, oh, is it not going to let me edit that? Ah, oh, you piece of shit. All right. Well, whatever. Um, we're just going to save it. We'll, we'll store it. Uh, then we have the user read only. Um, thread register, um, which is the URO, which we have. We already have that. Uh, counter frequency, time rate control, hyper control, virtual offsets, counter, counter, decache, cache diagnostics, breakpoints, watch points, OS, lock status. Mm -mm. Uh, those are EL1s. We have an MDCR. Let's see what that is. MDCR. Dot. Doesn't do, doesn't exist. Uh, some other shit. Yeah, I think I think we have what we need. You gonna play on the new retro core servers? Uh, oh, it's Lord Report. Hey, how's it going? Um, I have no plans right now. Um, I don't know. I like I waited so long to start training. Even though training doesn't matter. Like, I recognize that training skills is fucking pointless. Um, I feel like I've waited too long. I, I, you know what I should do? I should make a war character. I've never done war in Tibia. I've always been a character lover. I've always been, like, over-invested in my skills or magic level where I can't die. Like, dying is the end of the world because I lose 24 hours of skilling. I should make a war character where I don't give a fuck... Um, 
where I just don't even care about whether or not I die. Um, I'm terrible at aiming, I'm terrible at playing, like, I've never really done war, but honestly, it would kind of be fun to play a character that I don't mind if it dies. Um, last Retro Course season, I spent all of my time reporting potters, <laughs> yeah. Sounds fun to PvP for sure. I did some PvP with Rose, um, but yeah, I don't know. It's like a skill I don't have, and I probably should learn that. I think that would be a lot of fun. So, okay. Now we're saving quite a few more registers than we saved before. Um, but nothing egregious. Like, nothing here is too crazy. And then, um... I think we can, uh... We can try this now. Let's, um... ADB reboot. I'm just gonna reboot the phone. Make sure it's nice in a in a nice clean state. There it goes. Oh, rip, rip camera. There you go. Yeah, I gotta get a new camera. Or hack this camera so that it stays on for longer. Um, do, do, do. How does that camera timeout not drive you nuts? It does, but it's also much higher quality than my webcam. Like, uh, you can't really beat this. Like, this quality is pretty fucking good. <laughs> so, I can't, I can't say I can complain when I have a setup this good. And it mounts on a tripod. Um, I'm pretty happy with this setup, so. Okay. Phone is up. Um, everything built. So hopefully nothing crashes. Are we saving the secure register? We are not. Um, CPS IE. So basically, disable interrupts, save all the registers, save all this shit. Um, we, we're saving banks. So SPSR is banked. Uh, R13 is banked. We'll get our abort here and our undefines here uh, and our service here. So we're going to get a bunch of stuff. This is going to be a big, 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 big improvement. Make run. Let's go. Big test here. You can add Amazon affiliate links. Oh yeah. Do you have Amazon links for your gear? Um, I don't. I think I bought most of the stuff off Amazon. At some point or another. <laughs> okay. Um that's not right. Fuck. Um I'm just going to ADB reboot because we have to fix some code. Do, 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 do. Control C. There we go. <laughs> it finally went. Um, I have to fix the uh, code here where the registers. Uh, it should be 180. We just basically have 180 registers used in the trampoline now. Um, and then the other thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to NOP sled, um, how close are we to 4k right now? Um, 180 times 4, 720 plus 4 plus 4, we're not even close, uh, to 4k. So what I'm going to do is I am going to, um, align this uh, to 4096. Um, basically, that'll make sure that like this saving stuff, um, I just wanna make sure that this is at a known offset such that I can patch it better. So let's see if this builds a uh, bad offset on 105. Alignment too large. Really? Okay, then I guess I won't have that, but, um, make run, 
we have the uh, trampoline registers that's now at 180. So a lot of them are just going to be zero, but that's fine. We just have a lot of space such that these snapshots are kind of more compatible. We can add registers um, as we go on. Um, <laughs> knobs. Today I knobs led from 5 p.m. to now. <laughs> Hell yeah. Okay, allocated PMEM buff. And now it's uh, doing the saving. There's the registers. So we should see a bunch more now. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. What? Trampoline eight dot dot num regs plus four. Mm, I don't like that. Um, what? What happened? What happened? We got a seven CF ADF, which is that's CPSR. I'm just going to set this to one. That's going to cause uh, this to fail. I know you kind of can't see this. You can kind of see at the end. I'm mainly just trying to see why those uh, it just crashed. Okay. Um, I think I might need to clear out that. Um, yeah, I don't know if I need the flush caches or what. Shellcode.s. So that built the shell code, uh, which is this, where we save all of that. Oh, is that not incrementing R1? The only thing I could think of is that for some reason that's not incrementing R1. Um... That's the only thing I can think of, because we got the first one. Um, cool, Rust assembly in C. Hell yeah. With bang, the target register is incremented before the operation. Uh, um, is this is that just an ARM sixty four thing? Is that not a thing in ARM v seven? Well, oh, Zaria Labs came up. Um, store pre indexed, load the value. Uh, stored into there, plus four. What? 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 <laughs> just, just, uh, 
We're just gonna... Ah, that one will give me more confidence. Fuck. I don't know. I I'm not gonna figure that out right now. Add arm one four. Okay, so store that. There we go. Okay, so I'm running it. Oh, and this will fail, but we'll get to see the registers. And, okay, yes, there we go. There we go. <laughs> yeah, so that was the problem. Um, so we store to R1, and then we add one to there. Okay, so now we have a shit ton more registers. Bunch of different configuration things. Like, that is the 15. That's our DACR. Um, there's our TTBR1, uh, TTB... Uh, CR, we've got a VBAR, uh, context IDR, we have a, um, a thread um, read-write, a thread read-only, uh, a kernel uh, read-write, maybe, I don't know what that is, a um, bunch of the uh, save banks, they're just like not being used, those might be like initial processor start states, so let's see, uh, that's PC. This is CPSR. These are the SPSRs. Um, these are the banked R13s and R14s. That's a little sus to me. That's a little sus. Hmm. Um, MIDR, uh, CSSELR, the Scuttler, uh, CPACR, TTBRs, Context IDRs. Um, what was it? The VBAR? What was the, um, did we not save the exception one? The one that determined the exception entry point? I thought we did. Um, where were they? Vector base, it was the V-bar. Um, TTBCR, Dacker, VBAR, zero. And I think that's what it is by default. Um, so I'm just really concerned about how I'm going to get a stack. Like, I don't know how I would get my stack. Like, these don't look like valid stacks. Um, like SP abort and stuff is in here. So these are the SPSRs and then these are all the stack pointers. These are all the return addresses. Then that's the user register bank. I'm kind of confused there. Um, where would you recommend starting to learn what's going on here? Uh, probably a computer architecture course. Yeah, maybe some assembly, maybe some like systems programming and OS development. Um, I don't know, like these... Unless MRS isn't working, but it is. It's returning different values for different things. SPSR, SP user. I don't know. I mean, do we just ship it and see if it works? Um, 
TT Pro. Like, we have the context and the user stuff here. But I feel like if I hit an exception right now, it's just going to die hard. Like, when we had that null deref, it just got very confused because the, the stack ended up getting fucked. And it couldn't save the context. Like, unless it uses this weird unaligned stack, but I... I don't think so. I don't know. I just don't think this is going to work. Um... And that V-bar is at zero, which is weird to me. The V-bar S. Uh, there's a monitor V-bar, unless I need to be using that. Is that what I need? Monitor V-bar? No, that would only be in monitor mode, and we're in, uh, I think we're just using VBAR S. I just don't know how this will set up the stack. How will that work? Like, unless I'm just not reading them. But I was basically get I was getting a zeroed out stack. I, I will... We'll pull it down from the phone. We'll just see what happens. Um, where's my ADB poll? Data local temp uh, snapshot dot fault core. Oh, um, yeah. 512, bad address. Yep. I just don't quite understand um, how those stacks will get set up, but uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens. We'll have to pull that down, and then we can start working on the, um, I guess, while that snapshot is running, uh, we can go and figure out these registers. So these are all the regs. And basically down here, so we print out, set all those regs, and then uh, we can split that twice, which we already have done. Um, uh, let me, um, hmm, 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 hmm. Okay, so that's saving. Yeah, it looks the same. I just don't know. I'm scared, man. Uh, for, um, or let names is equal to, uh, so this is going to be a list of all of the mappings from the register numbers, uh, or basically in order of what they need to be assigned to. So we have regs zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, blah, 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 something like that. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, uh, 15. So assign all of the registers. Then we have a, a CPSR. Okay, and we can ADB pull that. Um, CPSR. Oh, we have to do like a CPSR right. Fuck.
Um, I thought I could just do assignments on everything, but I can't. Um, I mean, these could be format strings. And this could be env this is equal to that. I don't know if Rust actually allows you to do format strings like that. I think that it has to be a constant string, right? Right? Let me try this. I, I actually don't know if Rust allows you to have a string. Ah! Uh, make uh, cargo run. Yeah, it must be a string literal. There's a craze that ports it over to runtime strings. Interesting. Um, I might just do string re replacement. Do it myself. Um, and then basically this is gonna be the code that I want to execute in C. S regs and regs G. Um, S close into a close equals XXX. Um, okay, so that's almost pulled down. Um, and then this is basically. Uh, so we want to do a CPSR write. Wherever our QME code is here. Um, let's see. CPSR write. env val mask. So we have the environment. We have the value. We have the mask, which is all Fs, indicating we want everything. And then the write type. And it's a write raw. Do not switch reg banks. Um, let's just try that. So CPSR right, and then SPSRs are just off the end. So this will be on like env, um, env, whatever the fuck, CP15. Uh, actually, is that CP0? No, that's CP15. OK. Um, CP15 dot uh, SPSR service. Yeah. Okay, I have to move this to here so I can reference it. Oh. Wait, that was not the code that I wanted. Um, this. And then we can increase the size. Okay. So we need to figure out basically how to fill all these stupid things in. Uh, regs, X regs, um, write raw. And then we have CP50. Uh, actually, these are not those. So this next one. So we did um, CPSR, gone. Then we have SPSR current, which is just uh, SPSR. Then we have banked SPSR. Um, and this is going to be, so that one's gone. And we had somewhere, here we go, bank service is it equal to XXX. Banked SPSR. Um, ABT and uh, UND. ABT, UND. Okay. Good. 
So what we're gonna do is just initially make sure this sort of stuff is working. Um, names dot when, and then this should be uh, 180. We already did that. Nice, good job. Passed me. Um, and then uh, print. Oh, we can just do um, format uh, val in uh, names dot iter dot zip uh, fc dot registers. Okay, and let's just try this uh, format replace xxx with. Uh, let's just try this for now. I think I have to maybe make it into a string. No. Okay. Um, format. Uh, we can do val dot into. Convert from u thirty two not for, okay. From u thirty two not for sure. Uh, to string. Uh, to string. And put a ref. Um, I want to hex that, so scratch that. Format uh, hex um, val. Release. Put a ref out front. Okay. It looks kind of weird. It says 32-bit register. It holds the PE flags. What do you mean the PE flags? I I, I don't I don't know um, uh, what I need the PE flags for. Um, not zero. Right raw. Oh um. CPSR right. What is what does that take? Where is that code? Here. Um, CPSR write. It's a uint32t. So we're just going to say 1234, 1234 u. Okay. Um, and I'm going to say unsigned long for all of them. Actually, it just unsigned. So all of these are unsigned values. Not that it really matters because they're hex, but whatever. Um, hey, Jason Condition, how's it going? Is that a candle? Hell yeah, it is. Got a, we got a little uh, romantic coding night here going on. All right. That looks good. Uh, Ish. Registers, 15, CPSR, SPSR, that kind of looks random, that 15, but whatever. Uh, one, two, three, four, service abort undefined, then user service abort undefined for the next ones. So this is going to be... Uh, Banked R13 uh, user uh, service aborts undefined. Mm -hmm. User service abort undefined. Okay, those are the banked R13s. Then we have the banked R14s. Um, what? Something's off here, it seems. Is that not serializing all of those registers?
Um, for Reagan registers. No, they should all be written in there. So we should have all of these. Why do I feel like I'm deserializing different day? Ah, uh, because it's an old, uh, old thing. Yeah. Okay. Um. All right. Makes sense. Let's just go back. Snapshots. There we go. Um. We can get rid of this stuff. Right. Nice. There we go. That's looking correct. Um, okay, before we do anything crazy, uh, let's make sure this code still builds. Log.txt. So we should be able to go into QMU to the CPU, Falk, search for this, uh, and we should be able to paste this in and it will build. And if it doesn't, then we need to figure that out first. Uh, make. Okay. Uh, bank user. Um, yes. See? That's why we do this shit early. Um, user sys is what that is supposed to be. Um... You know what? Um, file, uh, let mute, uh, header is equal to, I mean, yeah, we're gonna do this for now. Uh, buff writer new file create, um, registers.h, uh, write, header this question mark. So basically format that out and then this is going to make a header. Um, Log.txt vim registers.h looks good. And then we just uh, put this and include that and we should uh, not have to copy and paste stuff around which is going to be better. Include. I, yeah, I fucked that clipboard. Include um, this header uh, registers dot H. Okay. So now we can run make, and then that's going to pull in that header. Um, although that's not going to rebuild, is it? Uh, let's see. Let's see if their build system uh, automatically handles that. So that should have recreated it, which have a new modification date. Yes, it rebuilt it. Okay, so that just automatically gets pulled in. Fuck yes. Okay, nice. 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 Okay, then we have the um, uh, user regs. So we have environment user regs zero is equal to xxx one two three four um, and those should be these the user uh, bank okay and now we start getting into the fun fancy stuff so we have environments. Uh, coprocessor 15 dot C0 CPU ID is equal to XXX. And then we're going to make sure this builds. And it looks like it does. Sweet. All right. Not bad. Not bad. Um, okay. We just go down the list. Environment uh, CP15 dot... C S S E L R under S is X X X. Uh, the Scuttler uh, S C T L R S. 
then we have the um, CPACR EL1. I don't know if that's actually right. CPACR EL1. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think we even have that. Um, then we have a TTBR0S, TTBR1S. We have a, a TCR EL, TCR EL3, which technically we need to update through a different mechanism, but uh, in this case, it's fine. Um, then we have a Dacker S, uh, a VBAR S. I feel like I was just doing this for uh, XCD6. I do, I do stuff like this all the time. This is my first time doing it for ARM, and I still f am very concerned about whether or not we filled in the... Um, Two more of these. Whether or not we filled in the uh, stack pointer for when we have interrupts, but we're just gonna have to go with this and just see what happens. Okay, and then I'm just gonna do one more, uh, which is gonna zero it out at the end. So we're just gonna double check. Cat header, the last one should be a zero. Um, cat registers.h. Yes, the last one is a zero. We did consume everything. And everything looks good. That's Dacker, that's VBAR, context IBR. Okay. The RW, the ROs, those look good. Okay, now we can make this. Um, incompatible types, uh, TCREL, TCREL. Um, yes, so we want to do like set TCR or something like that, TCR. Where do they uh, set this? TCR, I want TCR EL3. Um, TTBCR raw writes. Um, that's what I want. But I don't know how to get the coprocessor register information. Like, I there, there has to be like a lookup thing for that. I'm just gonna um, skip that for now. TCR EL. We're just gonna skip that line. I'm not gonna use it. Okay, so that's gonna build it. Nice. And we should now be able to uh, emulate X10 IPC. Um, oh, and we want to change that X100 uh, uh, X IPC. Um, this Blix right there. Vim emulate, or Vim GDB commands, because we patch out that instruction. Um... So what have we done? We've disabled interrupts. Uh, I'm really tempted to save PC uh, at a later stage, um, but we're just gonna put a breakpoint on uh, this. Jimmy didn't like that. Um, Kimi, you didn't like us doing all of that stuff. Um, okay. Um, we'll just do a uh set PC is equal to this. Can I do that? IR uh PC X and I PC step step. Fuck. Um. Why? Uh, do I do the push late? Do I do the push uh, LR like really late in this code? I bet I do, like a fucking idiot. Yeah, I do. I do the push LR here. 
Ah, fuck. Um, okay. Uh, X10, uh, X100 IPC. Um... I hate how GDB page is by default. It's such a stupid default. Um, set PC is equal to this. Step instruction. There we go. Um, uh, display IPC. Step instruction. So we're gonna get back to user space and just see how much we've changed. Are you adding code around there to load the ARM register state? Yes. Yeah. What's going on here? I notify? We didn't hit this stuff before. FS notify. We didn't hit this before. Uh, wait. Involves close. Um. Why did that happen? Checking an I notify queue. LDRH Strex Um what the fuck Did it not execute that instruction, the push? Step, 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 VFS range, ret, error. We are returning an error, and that's fine. Um, mutex unlock. Uh, F sync range, do F sync, F put. That's reasonable. Why are we not returning back to user space like we were before? Do you know assembly language? Yes. Um, huh. I, I don't know, um, I'm gonna try this again. I'm very confused. Um, GDB commands, um, Set PC equal to this. Uh, display I PC. Oops. PC. That should store LR. Uh, enable interrupts. Return back. That looks good. Compare. Move equal. Sync. Mutex unlock. Okay, so we branch to that. Go into here. Store uh, LD Rex. <gasps> uh, store exclusive or S LDMEQ. Um, and that's returning back. Okay, so we mutex unlocked. That was fine. 
Branch to sync, uh, F sync range. Do F sync. Branch to put. Memory barrier. Store exclusive, DMBSY, compare. That doesn't make sense to me. It's like the ref counts is off on that. Something's off. That's writing all of memory, right? Snapshot pmem. Snapshot fault core from thrower. Did um that memory checks out. Uh remove F like we should not be hitting Envos. Like, no, 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 no. Find VMAP area, right lock. That's so weird. So what did we do before? Um. I'm going to comment out uh, SPSR and CPSR because we didn't set those before. I don't think the banks have been triggered yet. Um, I'm just like really confused. Because before we were returning back to user space. Um, is this why we're crashing? Is there... Do you have to set architecture? I, I do not, no. Um, okay, so before we set... What did we set? Scuttler, TTBR, zero, um, and Dacker. So this should be basically identical to what we did before, right? Maybe it's just this snapshot is bad. I don't I don't understand why it would be. Um Maybe the snapshot is right. Maybe it's just different. Um, let's see if we can find our way back to user space. I just don't know why it would be closing that file. Um, unless we wrongfully terminated that application during the snapshot. Or memory is fucked. Like that, that's another thing is if, if memory is just wrong, but I don't think so. It feels like this process terminated during that. Um, let's, uh, let's reboot the phone. It feels like that process is dying um and it's closing um it seems like the snapshot has that file closed for some reason um so we're gonna reboot get everything fresh um i don't know what would be causing that to be honest
CPS ID IF. Unless somehow I ran it twice. Um, and things got broken because of that. Doubt? I don't know. Hmm. Save all those registers. You got the address in R1. Save all this shit. MRC. Load fixed data. Blix R0. Push LR. CPSAE. Re enable interrupts. And get out. Okay. So this is a clean install. Everything's fresh. I mean, maybe that's why we're having crashes. Maybe for some reason, like sometimes that file is getting freed. Um, I don't know why, but let's see. Unless there's another bug here that we don't know about. Okay, here's the registers. They look about the same as what we had before. Nothing weird. Some of the addresses changed. That's good. That's what I want to see since we rebooted. And then we're saving that snapshot. Um, and then we just have to ADB pull that down. And uh, we'll see. We'll see kind of what it looks like. But I don't know what would cause that. Um, do, do, do. Come on. Why is the flash so slow on this phone? Maybe I should ship it over the network or something. I don't know. It'd maybe make it a lot faster to take this snapshot. Fuck, man. So that looks like a clean snapshot. Pulling that down. Cleanly exited. Did it cleanly exit? Print the registers. Yeah, we just uh, returned success there. I mean, we should print that it's like written out or something. But I don't know why that was broken. And I don't know if this one will be. I mean, I'm jumping to PC. Is there anything stupid here? By jumping to PC. Um. Is R1 not allowed to be clobbered? Like, maybe I'm not allowed to clob clobber R1. And maybe that is causing something to get picked up. Um, that is my uh, current hypothesis. Is that R1 is, is not supposed to be clobbered. Um... R1, pop R1 PC. Let's just see if they're, uh, this uses R1 and does not save it. So I don't think that's the case. Yeah, unfortunately, these things would be saving R1 if it's a clobber. It's not, it's an arg, it's totally fine. Hmm. Guys, I need to go, time for work, see you around. Thank you for stopping by. You were, you were here for a while. Hope you had fun. <clears throat> we're kind of in a slump right now um, until we can figure out how this is to be fixed. Um, pretty hard to debug a problem like this, uh, but that's fine. I like working in the weeds, no problem. Um, okay, this is almost pulled down. Seven, eight, nine, done. Okay, run. That's gonna regenerate the offsets for this, which we rebuild. And that's compiling, done. 
And now we can emulate x10 IPC. Step, 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 step. Okay, let's see if we make it back to user space. Yeah, uh, ooh. Okay, something's fucked. Something's really fucked. Um. Cannot load 56. Is there anything using R1 here? No. That uh, clobbered R1. So it's definitely not R1. We can rule that out. What do you think about Binary Ninja? I think it's great. Uh, it kind of depends what you're doing, but I think it's pretty good. It's pretty fast, pretty nifty. Um... Do you have a set schedule for work? I do not. Just get shit done when I'm good. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty much what I do. I mean, I could comment all these banks. Um... I think I need the Scottler. We saved that before, right? That was one of the first things we had to add. So comment out all that shit. Maybe it is one of those things is, is plumbing through in a weird way. I don't know why. Makes no sense to me. Built, run, run. Oops. Uh, 10i PC. Unless that is not having that execute ir push lr um come on irlr step instruction irlr that didn't execute that didn't execute that push didn't ha uh oh wait not lr fuck uh sp uh, 1C. Twenty. Okay, so that ran. Pop PC. Yep, and that's gone. Um. Ah, what the fuck? One eighty. All those registers that are, that are coming through just fine. Then I'm picking that back up. It's like my stack is fucked. Nice work. Uh, 4:30 a.m. here, bedtime. I'll watch you. Uh, I watch your YouTube channel tomorrow. Absolutely. Hell yeah. Fuck, man. I. What did I break? Does ARM and X6-64 have the same endiness? They, they differ. ARM can be big or little. It varies. But for the most part, yes. Typically, uh, both run a little endian. Um... I don't know what's going on.
It's like the stack is misaligned. Like, I don't know if it's this set PC bullshit. Um, that's the only thing I can think of right now that would uh, make sense as to why it would break. Let's try this. MRS, that failed. Um, so I could get SPSR, but I couldn't get the SPSR SVC. Um, do I not have permissions to do that? Am I not in service mode right now? Let's try and get everything in here again. Comment, uncomment everything. I could also try to get the, um, I could also try to get the secure mode info. No, 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 no. I'm not using an old snapshot, am I? No. Human analysis, okay. Um, why? What mode am I in? Service 32. I don't know what the S is. I don't know if that's secure or not. Um, What's wrong with that? Why can't I get that? I mean, here, I'm going to try this. Um, set PC is LR. Step. What the fuck, man? Why? That makes no fucking sense. I don't even know why I couldn't read that service register. That makes no sense. 
Um. Okay, where's the code for that in Kimia? Um. <sighs> Fucking tests, man. Um. Makes it impossible to grab for shit. Was the current processor mode? Not sure. Service 32, probably. Um, <sighs> CPSR, right. And why does this not work? DIF. If it's right raw, if it's not right raw, then check this shit. Hmm. Do not switch reg banks. I'm going to try that just to see. But I don't think that's going to fix it. Yep, done work. Um, well, I have no idea where that code is being handled. That's just capstone, MRS. Um, fuck capstone, dude. Get out of here. I can't read shit when that's here. MRS bank. Translates. Um, MRS banked. Gen this. Conditional execute. Gen helper. MRS banked. No tags. No tags for that. MRS banked. A lot of this stuff is uh, macros, so it can be tough. Here's MRS banked. Um, check the reg no. Uh, if it's SPSRs, return that bank number target no, uh, mode. Oh, so first the execution checks. OK. Raise an exception if the requested access is one of the predictable cases. Otherwise, return. Probably corresponds to the pseudocode in this. Um, get the current mode, which are the bottom bits. Yeah, 1F. And that's from uncached CPSR. And we should have that getting written in CPSR right. Um, uncached CPSR. And not mask. Wait. Wait, do I, maybe I, I am setting the mask wrong. Maybe I want all zeros instead. I don't think so. Let's try it. I don't think this is going to do it, but um, this is going to hopefully maybe change whether or not the CPSR actually gets written. Um,
But yeah, that'll update those. I, I'm pretty sure I want all Fs on that mask. Let's see. Fuck, man. Like... If the Regno is 17, it has to be Hypervisor. If the current mode is equal to the target mode... Go to Undefined. Ah. I think that's Undefined... Um... I think that's actually Undefined as is. Okay. So basically, I, I don't think you're able to do that. I don't think you can... Um, I guess it's undefined behavior. If you're to read a bank that's currently active. Um, so that... We're just kind of working with undefined behavior there. And I think QMU's just getting mad at us because of that. But I think it would basically continue... From there, um, okay, so let's try X, X to an IPC. Why don't you use ZSH rather than Bash? Uh, I, I, I have no reason. Like, I have no reason to really change my shell. It's just fine as default. Um, there's just kind of no difference in shells to me. Set um, PC to this. Steps. Okay. There we go. And eek. But we're still going to have the same issues. And there we go. R11. R11 is fucked. I don't know why. Store is your own, okay. R zeros on these, MRC. Like, MRC, read. Like, are these things triggering really bad undefined behavior? Like, are they basically breaking the processor? Um, I can get rid of those and not use those banks. 180, 40. But I don't think that's the case, Matron. I, like, like the phone itself didn't crash, so no, I don't think that's the case. That wouldn't make sense. A few registers there. Am I not setting these up correctly? SPSR, CPSR writes. But this is the same way that we initialized these before. And we're able to like read. Hmm. I have no idea. Like, I don't know how this just stops working out of nowhere. Like, 
What did what did we actually do before? Uh, we did TTBR zero, TTBR one, Scuttler and Dacker, all S variants. Okay, so we're gonna go and basically comment everything that isn't those. So uh, Dacker, TTBR zero, TTBR one, uh, and Scuttler. We don't want to apply anything else. Scuttler, TTBR0, TTBR1, and a Dacker. So let's see what this looks like. Registers, make. And we got a new snapshot. But I, yeah, I, hmm. Dacker 15, that looks good. These look good, and the Scuttler looks good. Um, so all of those look fine. Um, set PC is LR. Should be able to do that. Should be fine, but this is still going to fail in the same way. Yeah. Um, <sighs> you're still here? Is this a new session? I'm still here. We haven't really finished this up yet. Um, and now we're not making any progress because none of this makes sense. It just doesn't work, and there's really no reason why it doesn't work. There's, there's, there's nothing. There's nothing that makes sense here. Um... Registers uh, ripped 180, okay. PMM user buff. Looks good. Like, what did we change in here? 180 and 512. That's it. That's all we changed. Um, and those are correct. Should be 180 trampoline registers. Yep. Repeat 180. Well, we can pull this down and see, but I... Basically, we commented out a bunch of saving the banked registers, and we'll see if that changes anything, but I don't think so. Like, arguably, a, uh, R1, we change. We change the amount of register space that we have allocated. But we didn't change anything else, which makes no sense. Um, and then what was this historically? Oh, don't want that one. Um, I might not have history for uh, what we had. No, I don't. Um, like, is it something super stupid? Is a file name wrong? We're pulling that down to thrower snapshot.faultcore and we're overwriting the old one. And then we are loading thrower snapshot.faultcore. Um, in this case, we're gonna comment out everything uh, from here to here. We're still getting the uh, CPU ID. Okay, good. 
Um, so once that is pulled down, we'll be able to rerun this and just see. Hmm. Makes no sense. Like we switched to using R1. But nothing's using R1 on the ret path. I don't think the stack's getting misaligned because we're not touching the stack. Okay, this is gonna regenerate that output file, the snapshot.pmem. And this is going to rebuild QMU with the registers that are needed for that target. And then this is going to run it, and it's going to probably have the same issue. Okay, well, uh, there the registers are just off. Um... Did I over comment? Yes, I did. Okay. Run. Cat registers. Those look good. That looks great. Okay. So everything's synced up. Fix that. Beep. Okay. Storing all this shit. Given we can access those, we are definitely in supervisor mode. Now we're in snapshot device. Okay. And that looks good. So that's actually going to try and do a snapshot. Um, okay. So we want to skip over that. Um, GDB commands. Get rid of this uh, thing. Okay. And set uh, PC as LR. Okay, that one didn't crash. Uh, okay, then it did. <sighs> what? What? <sighs> okay, let's just go back to what we had before. I don't know if it's like, I remember adding the DACR. Um, we were just overwriting ourselves, but that was okay. So we changed it to 64. So I'm gonna leave it at 18. How many registers do we actually have? 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. Okay, I remember 21. Let's go back to here. Here's the 512 with 21. Target uh, make run. Okay, then we're gonna go back, uh, same thing here. Uh, get status, get add cargo star, get ignore uh, source, get status, get commits. Am uh, commit before undo uh, history C, and here we go. Brrrr. Look at all that hard work. Bye bye. 
Um, okay, here's the 21. I remember making that change for uh, fixing Scuttler. That was the last thing. Yep, there's the registers. Scuttler is the last thing in there. At offset there, we aren't doing TTBCR. That's fine, but we are saving it. All right. Do I have the old stuff for this? Oh, this will output the register. Sweet. So I can reconstruct the old register style. Okay. ADB pull. ADB pull uh, data local temp snapshot dot fault core to here. All right. Now we wait for that. Once that's done, we run this. Hmm. Like, unless we just got extraordinarily lucky when we did it the first time, uh, I just don't think so. Don't think all of the memory. I shouldn't have to worry about cache coherency. Shouldn't have to worry about memory barriers. Uh, maybe. Because we do alias things when we access it through the TLBs. I don't know what the rules are on ARM for that, but I don't think that's the issue. Um, we'll just see here. Oh, why is this phone so slow? I swear to God, if this works, I just will have no idea. I'll have no idea what changed. It's like, why would that stack data be wrong? We were like returning to a bad, uh, a bad pointer, which makes no sense. Okay, so that is done. Now we paste it into here. That's done, run make. Now we have our CPU. And now we hypothetically can run emulate. I didn't wanna go that far, that's fine. Uh, X and I PC. And then we can do um, set int, this is zero. So we're just gonna nop out that instruction. And we nop, go here. Why? What would cause that? What would cause that? Yeah, it's working again. Oh, that's using that fault core. Let me uh, make sure I'm using the latest one. Um. Are these different addresses? Yes. 
these are different addresses. Okay, so let's see, let's see, let's see. We technically were using the old snapshot. Um, 60 to 15, looks good. That's using snapshot.fullcore. Um, that's generated, okay, let's see what happens here. Didn't want to do that. Um, X hundred uh, X twenty IPC uh, set int this is zero step. Yeah, that works. Ah, oh, what the fuck? Okay, I'm gonna set the registers to 180, and we'll see if that breaks it. 180, 180. Make run. It's the exact same thing, except uh, we now have 180 registers worth of storage. Uh, Reboot, that's fine. Um, 180 on this, so this will not work, but, uh, okay. If this breaks, if this breaks, um, I'm removing that, I'm removing this, I'm removing this, just making sure, um, without those files, None of the shit would work, so, okay. 180 and 180. Uh, it might be just my manual is serial serialization. There's probably, like, a hard-coded thing, maybe, with the size. Um, and changing this to 180 will break stuff, maybe? I don't know. I'm just guessing at shit now. Um, num trampoline registers, 180. 180. Let's look for any 21s. No 21s, no 18s. All right. Make run. We're saving the same information. All the code is identical. We've just made a lot more space there. CPS ID. Okay. Branch. Yep. So we've changed the layout of a couple things in memory. Um, but like the, we were definitely reading the register states before. Data as pointer for the serialized bytes. Yep. Those are still at that location. Yeah, so now we have like a bunch of zeros, but that's fine. Okay. So we have 180 registers here that we're just dumping out. Then that's saving that uh, snapshot. And let's just double check nothing stupid is going on here. Uh, registers. Load a fault core. Load those registers. Uh, we read that many registers into here, fill them in, and then we process the table. Um, we're not actually using read fizz at all here. Oh, we do down here. Um, read fizz. Create pmem. Fizz adder. But if physical memory was off, like, nothing would work. So I don't think that's what it is. Data local. Here we go. How did that work in the first place? Allocating 18 but 21 regs? I just overwrote some instructions. Okay. Here we go. If this breaks, I will be very confused. But we'll see. Hey, uh, Ken Kenjin, 
How's it going? How you doing today? I've been listening to the same shitty music over and over. I need to change it up. Um, I need something completely different. Just all right. Thirty-seven percent. Oh, it's so slow. I'm gonna hit the head. I, I, I have nothing else to do. Be right back. All right, will it work? I kind of hope it doesn't, um, because it gives me something easier, like, simpler to debug, but I also think it's going to work. Um, okay. E4CB are the new ones. That is written. This will build it. Done and emulate. Nice. That catastrophically failed. One eighty three twenty. Okay. Um. Subcommands two failed. What? Thrower. Cannot access memory at address C. Maybe that's always. Uh, mm, I don't know what that is, actually. What? The fuck does that mean? What on earth? What does that mean? What? Uh, now just GDB doesn't work anymore? I can I can literally disassemble the code. Uh, is the data abort exception vector? It 
it's like Kimi just ceases to exist. What? Uh I don't know if I can step in here actually. Um That's running. Yeah, it's running. Oh no. It's it's just running. It's just running fine. Right? This is going to be in our um Yeah, that's our code, right? Um I think GDB is breaking it. Fuck off, GDB. What are you doing? Is it literally GDB's fault? Is GDB actually causing it to break? And it's just fucking working. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. GDB is the biggest piece of shit on the planet and basically never works. What do you mean can't access memory at sea? Like, what are you trying to access, GDB? What are you doing? Why would that cause a memory access problem? <laughs> Why? That makes no sense. Um... I'm at a loss. I, I have absolutely no idea what it's doing. I think GDB is just wrong. Great. Um, Okay, um... H... Uh... Grep mon... D CPU log dot text. Then log dot uh, fuck off. Um two log dot text. Okay. 
Yeah, there it's going. So it's running, and then uh, it will load into R0, the address, which is this instruction, and then it branches to that, and it continues execution just fine. OK. Um, Was I skipping over? No. It's gonna get a lot of log. Um, yeah, that's still running just fine. What is it doing? GDB. It just, it just. What's my educational back? Background high school, yeah. Um, <laughs> GDB, what the fuck are you doing? What absolute dumb shit are you just- why are you just reading random fucking memory? Like, I can read PC, I can read PC plus- I guess that makes no sense. I can read PC plus 20, I can, uh... Can I read this? I can read that. Can I set it? <sighs> I hate this fucking debugger, man. It never works. This debugger never fucking works. It's the biggest piece of shit. I don't understand how you make a debugger that works so poorly in every situation. This shit always happens. GDB always crashes, displays the wrong results, disassembles incorrectly, breaks when you try to core dump, corrupts files when you save. Like, it is notoriously broken every time you try to use it. That makes no sense. Why would you be accessing C? Ever. Like, is it trying to set a breakpoint? On the next instruction? But then why isn't that a problem other times we run it? Why is it only with this instance of the snapshot? Like, what? That makes no sense. What are you doing? How? How does stepping an instruction require you to access memory at C? Is it display? Is it display? Display IPC? Is that the problem? I bet it is. Nope. 
why would you be accessing C? <laughs> I don't even know what C would be. Like, now I'm concerned that this has been working the whole time and GDB has been, like, corrupting memory in the guest. Because I truly have no way of knowing anymore. Like, I actually can't know. Maybe it's using one of the offset uh, registers that's zeroed, but why would it be accessing a register? And why would it not happen for other snapshots? Like, it makes no sense. I, I literally think GDB is just, like, accessing fucking uninitialized memory. Um, let's see, set architecture arm. Let's see if that fixes it. Nope. <laughs> what is this piece of shit debugger doing? And I there's no way. There's no way I'm going to be able to find information on this. Um Okay, that's just someone who doesn't know how to use a debugger. That's someone who doesn't know how to use debugger. Cannot access memory at address. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's literally your shit's corrupted. Like, I think it's trying to set a breakpoint. Yeah, this is just a bunch of people who don't know how to use debuggers. Debugging pi binaries. Yup, I understand how that works too. <laughs> What's it trying to read? Or write. It's probably trying to write memory. What is happening? Is it GDB? Like, is, does this just work? <laughs> like, is GDB like, write, like reading or writing like an uninitialized stack address into the guest? And that's just, like, causing random shit to get corrupted? I can fuck up these addresses. We'll put that as 800 and this as 900. Let's see if GDB is trying to access those. I don't know why it would be. Makes no sense. That would be kind of silly. But let's see if it is. Nope. It's not those. Um, and everything else is always the same. So it has to do with the way something is in physical memory.
XXD snapshot Jim Dash. Okay, that's gonna take a while. Um, head and many Vim Dash. That looks good. Try to set the V bar to a bogus value. Um. I swear to God, dude. Nope. Um, yeah, it wouldn't make sense because this snapshot has all the same previous registers. It, it is entirely something to do um, with physical memory, right? It has to be something to do with how physical memory looks. Um, and that is throwing GDB off. I'm going to set PC to LR. I can do that. Nope. Piece of shit, dude. And this will return back to user space. Yeah. Um, wait, it's not back yet. That seems kind of stuck. Uh... 